Oh boy. Hello, and welcome to Hot D's finale episode coverage with EFAP. We're going to talk about episodes 7 and 8. Uh, House of the Dragon. Dun, 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 dun. Mentioned on streams, and I just thought I'm not going to not mention it, at least at the beginning. We did this already. Uh, unfortunately, my voice wasn't recorded, so four hours of discussion got thrown in the fucking bin. So now we're doing it again, and uh, you'll have to forgive us if there's any references to that while we uh, go through and give you a fun old experience of talking about this as, as best we can. Analysis, spontaneous breakdowns of all kinds of different things. We're also going to try and involve some of the nature of the uh, meta discussion that we're more aware of now than we would have been then. So in a way, you know, this is just going to be straight straight better. It's actually good the the four hosts got to lead, okay? Oh, yeah. Look, right, the copium is very real. <laughs> this, is one, lemonade, this is a good right? thing it that happened. It doesn't cope if it's real. Yeah. It's, it doesn't cope if it's true. It's, it's just like an acknowledgement those... of reality, which is what we do. Yeah, but you it's... could acknowledge reality while seething. You know, if that's the title. <laughs> I'm, not seething, I'm not seething. I will I'm, seethe. I'm great. It's... It just might be one of those situations where the movie goes back for a whole shit ton of reshoots, and then, then it actually turns out pretty good. Exactly. It doesn't always, but you know. This is the reshoot. It's gonna... You know, if, if this, this recording... V2. If this recording turns out better, then really you should just do it no. again, like a third time. Mm. That'd only be even better, a better product. Two to three. Take, True, right? maybe take the, the best things from the first and second recordings. Oh, could be. Diminishing oh, reality while reports. seizing. Let's to live by. <laughs> <laughs> should, should do this for every podcast now. Yeah. Just get a second take going. Fuck it. Well, uh, without delaying in any way, shape, or form, let us talk about episode seven as it came out, which begins right. with good old Rhaenyra having hunted down Sea Smoke and uh, Adam. That is, yep, uh, Adam. Gonna get Adam back to Paul. fucking mixing them up. And so, um, yeah. Wait it, till. Oh, wait till his brother comes into the mix, and you'll have to remember who's who on their. I, I, keep, I always fuck him up. Alan has this. the shaved head. This doesn't shaved help. You know? Do you understand how much that doesn't fucking help? Just call him. Just call him eight ball and fluffy. Them? You know, is Alan is Alan and Adam is Adam? Okay, You're like thank you, thank you so very much. So Adam has a D. Adam has a dragon. So that's how you can remember. Alan has well, a. They, uh, oh. Oh, Adam. Adam, Adam has the D yeah, yeah, dragon. Okay, that, oh. yeah, I can work with yeah. that. Yeah. Adam exactly. Hit. Dude, that's I, actual. You just said help. it and I've forgotten. It's okay. Alan I remember. has a dragon. Oh, Alan I got has the a dragon. Storm going. Oh no! Here's a way to remember. In Jurassic Park, when the Velociraptor says, "Alan, the a, a Velociraptor is kind of like a dragon, sort of." So just remember it that way. And Adam the Velociraptor the says, "Alan." One. God damn it! <laughs> 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 Well, we tried. Never mind. Throw it out. Scrap it. <laughs> so, Alan Grant tells the raptor he's salt and sea. Let's begin with discussing uh, how that how that interaction would have gone. Right, she's flying out on Cyrax, comes across Sea Smoke, with him riding it. How, how do they, how do they agree to settle down and have a discussion? Fly next to each other and yell, no, "Hey, they, land!" They do the they do the thing where she like points down, like down she points down like you she points at you and then she points down you down and well, she then, has a big white know. flag like let us chat yeah. i i just imagine that adam is like here we go just another black man getting pulled over by the cops just because he has a nice dragon i agree Black well, people I mean, drive nice dragons. I feel like the yeah, biggest you're concern on a... would be the dragon relationships in this regard. Like, well, what, yeah, does cause... Sea, what does Sea Smoke think of Cyrax? Is Sea Smoke concerned? Ad be... Adam being loyal to Rhaenyra doesn't even factor in if they don't really know what's going on here, right? Like, if if Sea Smoke mm -hmm. is just slightly aggressive, the uh, Sea Smoke and Cyrax could get into a fight. It's curious. I think they skipped over it because it's a little. It, it, there's ways to do it, but it's a little difficult, right? To... It would be it's pretty. Like... It, it could be pretty wonky if you like tried to actually display that on screen. Yeah, it, it might like, depend on. It might depend on how much control Adam has over Sea Smoke at this time too. Because if it were me and I was, it was my first time riding a dragon, and I saw the Queen's dragon coming at me, I might just put it down on a beach and be like, "Okay, let's show her that we're not, we're not." There is that. Engage in battle. Yeah, because you'd recognize it's her dragon. Pretty reasonable. Yeah. And, assume you'd recognize you're, you're Cyrax. Over there and if you're to him, find and someone you, who you can talk to. And if you want to be super loyal to her and be like a good, super dutiful, like yeah, then I, you'd be like, oh shit, she's pro she's probably coming to talk. I would imagine we wouldn't get. In, she and then he's come um, out here personally to get into a scrape with me. The scene does seem to portray. Sea Smoke seems ready to kill if that's the desire from Adam, which it isn't. So, like, it does seem like Sea Smoke's not just chill because he's, it, like, waiting. 
Side they they both seem like very with Rhaenyra. Yeah, they both seem like very protective dogs, right? Like yeah. of their owners. And it's an interesting dynamic because like the dragons themselves do have a history. You know, Cyrax and Sea Smoke probably spent a lot of time together when mm -hmm. Lenor and Rhaenyra yeah. were were married, right? And I think that we can all kind of go with the assumption that the reason that Sea Smoke chose Adam is because he reminded him so much of Lenor and he's like missing Lenor and that's why he actually hunted this motherfucker down like Same for father. this reason. That black guy looks gay. I'm gonna go fly to that dude. Which he does looks like he could be Lenor's half brother. Which which does help the idea that this was coincidental slash convenient for Rhaenyra. There is reason that it would go for him more so than it would for uh, any other given person in the world. So. Do dragons are they like aggressive and fight each other in the wild or naturally, or are they just kind of like chill? Do we know much about how? I think they... there's so Why few of them that it's does? not going to be a regular thing. They don't fight very often, like at all. Um, they they typically do just kind of coexist. Um, they're never usually necessarily turned on one another. At least they haven't been in the era of Westeros. Yeah, because the only people that have had dragons have been Targaryens or wild, I guess. Which again, they. Because there's a lot of wild uh, dragons at Dragonstone, which is the home, like the seat of the Targaryens beyond King's Landing, right? There is specifically one uh, one dragon known as the Cannibal, uh, who I don't ha, know if I we're going to... say his name on the last one. Yeah, I don't know if we're going to get to see him or not. It, like, I don't know if we're going to get to see him in the series or not, but he has been kind of known to attack dragons before, but that's like one wild dragon. And he's well, like a he's a he's an outlier of the rest. I know it's been said that George plans to explain more and more about dragons with time that goes on, right? I don't know what books exactly will be uh, letting us know more, but they won't. <laughs> never <finishing> the <laughs> They'll never right? arrive. Oh yeah, I want to explain all of this stuff about the dragons. <laughs> Meanwhile, like his main series is just drowning. <laughs> oh yeah, it would be and, that. And you, and you know that new that new HBO <laughs> series uh, uh, with Duncan Egg. That one is also an unfinished series. There's still more books to be written in yeah. that one as well. So you know, the he's last, very relatable. Um, Only he's like you know a huge author. And the thing I think to I, I, I mean, out, if they ever. If they ever do the Doom of Valyria movie, that'll probably be where we get a lot of dragon stuff because there'd be multiple dragon houses there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, the, the future dragon of this apartments. universe could be enormous for all we know. I think they're going to want to dragon duplex. Expand. Um, yeah, the only other thing would be why did Sea Smoke choose a rider now? And I think one could argue it's because one was attempted to be forced on him slash suggested through Stefan Darkland, and maybe that tips Sea Smoke over the edge of like, fuck this, I actually want to get a rider. I don't want to be alone anymore. They they did kind of try to push that toward us as an idea in the season. And mm -hmm. there is still a lot of mystery as to whether like what's up with Lenor. We've we've never had a dragon rider abandon their dragon before in like the known history. Um so I don't know exactly how a dragon would react to that or did it happen at this moment because finally somewhere across the narrow sea in some like gay bathhouse, like Lenord got assassinated or something. Maybe. You know what I mean? Maybe, maybe now he's dead. We don't know. I'd be surprised they never answer really? that, but they could choose not to. They could just leave it, it up. It could be a normal bathhouse where he gets killed. <laughs> He'd be in a gay one. You could, you just because gay things happen at a bathhouse, there's no reason to paint the entire bathhouse as a gay one. Would that be the ultimate irony if the gay bathhouse is full, so he goes to the straight one and, and then dies. gets killed there? <laughs> he is killed by a woman, and he's as he's clutching the dagger, and he's like, "I knew I was right oh, this whole all time. along." I it's actually Mysteria. That's what happened. Oh, uh. oh God! <laughs> You're doing great. You're doing great, Lenor. That's a great job, dying. So. Uh, next scene we have good old Allison blackpilling. She's on her journey with that. She's with um. Oh yeah, I guess to summarize, in case I didn't say it, uh, Adam was like, "Hey, I'll serve you." And Sea Smoke is chill, and Rhaenyra obviously realizes from this that it's not only possible her plan, but that it'll be incredibly useful if she manages to uh, get it the way that she wants, which is that probably was... going to be her goals in this episode. There was the slight, I guess, haggle with the scene of Adam making very clear that his father's parent, or like his parentage through his father, is absolutely of note by suspiciously saying, "My father is of no importance." Which you would have found out pretty quickly. It is. So I wonder if she would yeah. have anything to say to him. Like, why did you lie about that? I mean, yeah. I, if I were him, I would have just said it. But also, I think he should have kneeled way faster if he wasn't planning to be a threat. 
melt he they're standing staring each other down for for a good few seconds before he announces himself as a like potential well but it's more tension for the audience mark and And i don't know they are a ways away i don't know if there's like a general (laughs) he kneels down then he he shuffles forward like i'm kneeling by the way i don't know if you can see it's like it says the whole thing rhaenyra can't hear what was that It's like in real life when you want to hold the door open for someone, but like they're 50 feet away and you know they're coming into the gas station. So you just hold the door open and you just wait for them mm-hmm. as they have to make mm-hmm. the trip. It's awkward. Your heart's in the right place, but it's awkward. Just go in, let them take care of the door. It's the same. They can take care of it. Yeah, well, because you don't want to be in a position where away, you don't awkward. keep the door open and they look at you like you didn't keep the door open. And you're like, I didn't. Yeah, I guess so. Well. Oh, we always Plus, hold the then door Rhaenyra open. would have to say, you can stand up. Well, but and she does being... say you you stand before the queen of the seven kingdoms, and he doesn't react by immediately kneeling. And I was like, well, I think I mean call. to an extent, this scene doesn't make it clear. He's fucking confused. He doesn't know what's going on. Yeah, he he doesn't know what's going on. I do think Shut that up. him refusing to you know say that Corliss is his father. I think we get a little more context for that in episode eight as well. You know, with kind of fi- finally Alan telling the backstory of how their childhood was growing up. Oh. Um. I, I can understand the decision. It's just the way in which he gets that inf- or like gets that decision across is incredibly suspicious in such a way that Rhaenyra should immediately be inquiring. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like it could have easy answers. It's just something that if I were here, I'd be like, you uh, you try to keep. First of all, you try to keep that a secret. Secondly, do you really think I wouldn't find out? <laughs> He's my hand. And I do to kind of your point about how her, her idea did work. And it's in such a strange way that no one's ever heard of before of a dragon, like kind of claiming someone else and going to someone else, especially of mm-hmm. like lo- such low birth. This is like that thing that like clicks in Rhaenyra's mind where she now thinks that this is like predestined, that this is ordained by the gods. Masaria certainly uh, doesn't help dissuade that from yeah. her in their future conversations. But this is like that moment for her where the she realizes that, try. like, oh, like, holy shit, um, I meant to do this. Which is probably not going to be a great thing going forward. He says, "We are so back. We are, we are peak fire. We are peak fire." So, <laughs> so yes. Uh, moving forward, Allison's getting her wound cleared up by Master Maester all while, and he's uh, he's just trying to keep everyone chill. He always is. He's kind of an unsung hero in uh, King's Landing, just trying to trying to make things work, kind help of. people out. You know, yeah. He's, he's pretty chill, and she says, keep it all together." That essentially all of her life everything she's done and it all didn't matter she's cast aside or even hated and uh even king's landing nothing is clean here she's done a they've done a lot in her uh, storyline for um, uh, symbolism of like feeling dirty wanting to be clean that sort of shit so she's uh yeah she's just feeling generally awful and considering we know where this is going to end up it's hard to um compliment these scenes as to their build up because it's not the direction i was hoping they were going in I would have hoped that they were going to get Allison into a particular low that she would want to take some interesting and, and very character fueled action. I'm sure the writers would say that that's what she did, ends up doing, but we'll get there eventually. She's just feeling pretty bad. She wants to go outside with uh, her uh, King's God, who does not seem very happy about it. She wants to go camping. I can appreciate that. Yeah. She really doesn't tell him a whole lot about it either. No, poor guy. It was like, yep, no handmaidens, just me and you were going outside, and then when you want to go back, she's like, I don't know. I don't know if I even do, she says. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, so so maybe I should have packed a little heavier. And I do think (laughs) that like when she's sitting there floating, like I I feel like she came out there to like die, like legitimately just kill herself. I think I was thinking she might with that like her in the lake and everything. I'm like, oh man, is she gonna like kill herself? She uh, I think they said something like that, that she was pulled back from seeing the bird that reminds her of the dragon, that reminds her of Rhaenyra. That, that, that was like the thought process, and she decided, wait, there's some action I can take. Which to me would be really interesting if the action weren't what it was. That's not, a, that's not even how I took that, though. I guess that's skipping ahead a bit, so I'll hold that. I mean, it's alright. We've mostly covered already enough, everything in like, that scene, so if you want to go ahead. I, I've, I've I always like... seen uh, birds, to me, especially in contexts like this, they've always been sort of like a symbol of freedom, and that was sort of what was going through her mind in my eyes at that point. I can't remember if I, what I was reading was a Twitter user's perspective or if it was a quote from the writers. Uh, so, mm-hmm. but, I think but I'm with you. Been, 
I think it may have been a Ryan Condal thing. I don't, I don't, I'm like you, I don't kind of remember where I saw it, but I thought it was either Ryan Condal interview or maybe an after the show thing where he said that she was out there like contemplating suicide mm-hmm. and she saw the bird and it reminded her of a dragon or some, some dumb shit. I, I <laughs> guess I didn't read it like that just because I figured, especially after what Gawain tells her about um, Daron, Daron, right? The D? Yeah, 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 Daron. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like, uh, like he, she's got one son that like actually turned out to at least apparently be a pretty good guy, and I, I feel like she wouldn't want to kill herself at the, at the very least to just. Well, to know, be I, fair. I actually, I actually think the opposite. Yeah, like, I was gonna now say. that you bring that up, she, what she finds out is that Daron, while being away from you his entire life, oh yeah, is, is like has <laughs> grown up to be like <laughs> remarkable and incredible I'm and brave and awesome because he wasn't so with you. Yeah, the, the one you never interacted with, he turned out great. Yeah, I, so I could buy she me. wanted to kill herself for sure. Just, uh, it was the bird, visual, clean, freedom, blah, 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 gonna make, gonna make a move. I guess that's what to take from it, but... Uh, it's cited as one of the most pointless scenes in the entire series. What do you guys think about that? The, uh, the water one. I think it's really interesting stuff, personally, but with the way it goes, that taste has soured a bit. I don't yeah. know. With your yeah, it's just like seeing Olivia Cook chew the scenery, I guess, you know? I think it's That's important really to show that because too. it shows that she's tormented and she wants escape from everything that's mm-hmm. weighing on her mind. Like, it's important to show the cost of what she's going through. And in, in a way, even though shows like maybe Ahsoka does it poorly, um, but scenes of characters being contemplative and thinking and the, giving us the impression that they have a lot weighing on their minds or their conscien- consciences... It is important, and that stuff does add up, and it does create a sort of mood for a scene. It's a foggy day. She's out there and quiet, and she's been through a lot. What is she thinking? It does help us to connect with a character, because if you take all of those things out, then the things that characters can do can seem very sudden, like they come out of nowhere. Um, And it leads us to have to extrapolate oftentimes where that probably wouldn't have uh, been a good idea. I, I thought it was interesting in that it conveyed a sort of like serenity in the isolation that she's been really, really terrified of basically this whole season because she's getting, been getting marginalized further and further and further. And then here she is like more or less completely alone. And it's a very peaceful thing to her, even if she's not completely at peace. And, yeah. and the fact that it takes place far away from the palace, this is mm-hmm. out in nature. She's, She's not a queen in a sense. She's just herself out here. She's away from all of the, 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 the backstabbing and the family stuff and the war and all of the, you know, the scheming and everything that's going on. So that plays into it as well. Yeah, I think part of it's just letting go of all control. I mean, her authority has been usurped, obviously, but like she's, she still holds the title of queen. And then just to let herself float and let the water carry her for a second and she's not doing anything with her body she's just floating it's like being in an isolation tank where you just you can completely let go you not be clouded by anything in your in your mind for as was mentioned if it led to something different i probably would maintain all of this for the scene but knowing where they think this is supposed to be going is like oh that's a shame yeah yeah um it's a completely different spin on it that seems to waste everything that was going on here yeah, like a, a lot of this entire season has really just been Allison falling further and further and further into despair and losing everything around her, mm-hmm. right? Um, from, like, not obviously she loses Viserys at the end of season one and she thinks she's doing the right thing. Uh, but then she realizes that, wow, this is a mistake to put Aegon on the throne. She loses influence over him. She loses influence over Aemond. She loses Aegon essentially entirely because now he's a dude who she doesn't think will ever walk anymore. Uh, her son's a raving lunatic. Uh, Helena's had to go through all this pain. Even Kristen Cole, who she found comfort in, now feels like is just completely out of her reach as well. So she's just kind of sitting there and with nothing left. Her father, too, uh, at one point yeah. they were almost competing, but now sees the loss of him as loss of protection for her, which is true to an extent. He would have, you know, as much as he may have disagreed with her on certain things, he would have been helpful for her at court. Lost it all, darn it. Hey, he needs we'll to rack up again. some serious W's. True. <laughs> so, uh, over to Jasper Wild, the Iron Rod. He's asking what uh, is the fate of the King's Guard that failed over at, uh, well, previous episode with the, when Allison actually got 
cut. And uh, it's just an interesting observation there. So out of the three uh, Aegon friend King's Guard, one of them died in that whole like riot, and two of them are being said to be like the cause of it through their uh, well incompetence essentially. It's an opportunity for Aemon to get rid of them through pretty strong reason, but also just to secure himself maybe more loyal King's Guard. Uh, certainly get rid of people who are loyal to uh, Aegon anyway. They're off to the wall, which is always probably the better option than. Um, Death, I would say. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd rather go if I'd, uh, you know, choose. I can make some friends up there and some cool views. And, you know, it's, it's a life. You're doing something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an important and it's an important gig. Like your life's Great over. View. Yeah, go down and molds down and break true, your vows. Very true. You know? Yeah, view. just a little bit yeah. of vow breaking. Pee Why off not? the wall. Um, yeah, and you get a sort of more overt first step from uh, Laris into his position on Aemond, right? So, like, uh, Jasper's got some info, being that Sea Smoke has been picked up by a new rider, and, uh, you know, since it's a whisper from someone to someone to someone to someone, he's asking Laris' advice on how to deliver information like that, considering it's, one, unreliable, two, bad news, even if it's reliable, and three, uh, Aemond is kind of... Uh, he's not a no... He's a bit of a chaotic entity uh, to, the, to the council. They're not exactly sure how to provide information like this, and Laris opts immediately for just don't tell him. Uh, Which, of course, you know, given that he got rebuked pretty uh, uh, clearly in the last episode by Aemond, I think it's pretty clear at this point he realizes, oh, there's no avenue for me here, so, you know, I don't, I don't need to, like, share this information with him, you know, I don't, I don't need to go out of my way to help him or anything. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's not interested in trying to make inroads anymore, so this is now an advantage of any kind that he can hold in some way. Yeah, for him, is he'll only provide information that can benefit him ultimately in some workaround way. But uh, yeah, I mean, if Aemond had been nicer to him, maybe he would be, uh, you know, obsessively... If Aemond had been nicer to I him... I suppose in a people. sense it was a, uh, it was a bit of a blunder on his part, right? He, you know, if he was a... Uh a little less arrogant, he might have realized, you know, I, could, way, I yeah. could still make it where, like, he never gains any power, but I still well, keep him on side. Now, he's, he's, like, closed that avenue. Yeah, we can jump ahead a little bit and say that the consequences of Aemond just annihilating Laris, despite how entertaining it is, uh, it's now cost him his access to Aegon, like, entirely. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it does yeah. feel like, especially with a couple of the things that we've seen happen in the last few episodes and will happen in coming episodes that Laris has been much more focused on this plan of escape with Aegon than he has in his role as master of whispers. Mm -hmm. Like with all the plotting that's been going on with all the, you know, the dragon seeds that end up getting taken and, you know, go to Dragonstone and all this stuff. Those are things that you would feel like Laris normally would be like trying to, to stay ahead of, but instead he's just been focused on this Aegon thing. It's worked out, at least in terms of they do have some success with the plan, but it just makes you wonder, had Eamon said strategically, of course you can become my hand. Like, knowing what kind of man Laris is, it might have been a way to puppet him, right? Like, it could have been a 4D chess type thing. Yeah, and it been Laris curious, is an incredibly valuable asset. I'd have been curious to know what, uh, how the events would have gone forward, because he, with that kind of raise in position, he may have uh, advised Eamon to kill Aegon. Who knows? His loyalty to Aegon is, is going to be complex because I think a lot of people argue over whether or not it's pragmatic versus very character-driven. Uh, I think it's a combination of both, but still. Yeah, Interesting thing we about. haven't yet got the information to determine which it is, and I wonder if we will see that at some point where he will be presented with a choice of like aiding Aegon that will cost him in some personal way versus you know his own advancement, and that would be the definitive moment that sort of contextualizes how he feels about this, even though both things are probably in there. Yeah, that, that's how I feel like both things are a factor in, in what's going on with Aegon. But I personally, based on what we've seen, I feel like if it were, hey, you actually get more power and you sacrifice Aegon or stand by this disfigured dude, I think he's going to choose influence and power in a heartbeat over Aegon. Probably, yeah. Probably. He's, uh, he's obviously yeah, given he's up on Alison. He, she was a stepping stone for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she doesn't have any power, so what's the point in being in good terms with her, really? Mm -hmm. Just, uh... Yeah. Well, he's backed into a corner and he also knows he has an inroad with Egan that no one else that of that station would have like being a cripple himself that has some experience and things that he could tell him about it. Things like well, he actually it, mentioned to him in this. Sorry. I was just gonna say Egon has huge potential. Oh. It's up to 
Laris somewhat to help him realize it because he is the king. Yeah. yeah. Especially well, yeah, how I know, depressed Aegon is. I'm saying that he ha he has valuable advice that he specifically can give Aegon. Well, like about things like changing his gait, the way he walks, so sure, that he yeah. can actually manage better. So he can inspire him. I, I think like as well, he's seen this as like, oh, no life. one's in a better position to utilize this this inroad than I am. Um, and you know what? Having Laris discussing shit with uh, Jasper, it feels like you could say it's a bit of a Green Council scene, which means we're uh, you got to pay the piper every time you get a Green Council scene. You know, you got to got to get over to a Black Council scene. Pay the piper? What do you? Oh. <laughs> I was saying, now, I was like, are we taking a shot or? That's like, not to up? say that I hate Black Council scenes, but this Black Council scene is an excellent summary of why Black Council scenes suffer in this season. Yeah. So. Everyone's here, all of her advisors, including her hand of the king. And her, I mean, Rhaenyra. Yo! Scene starts up, and it's like, so, what's going on? It's like, don't worry, the queen is fine. It's like, that's that's really good, but what about that's the rider? Sad. Like, well, the rider is, uh, uh, with Bartimus, he says, you know, gotta be, we can't have uh, lowborn stealing dragons, we're gonna secure that thief. Like no no the, 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 he's gonna be a guest and they're gonna be instructed in the way of dragon riding and high Valyrian and uh, Bartimus says we know nothing about this guy save that he's lowborn what what, what do you think Lord Hand and then Corlys is like um we'll wait for the queen and then Bartimus sighs and fucking drinks his wine and I can't help but feel like he's the only reasonable person <laughs> on this council <laughs> yeah well, this is this is a big right deal. There. This is something Chase we is should be very concerned with. Mm. This has the potential Jay be, to be catastrophic for us. I think yes. Jace is reasonably concerned. He he does not seem happy. Well, to be this. fair, they all like... are. It's just the uh, Bottomus gets uh, shafted quite a bit by the Hot D fan base. People think he's an asshole. Uh, we'll go over a bit of that. Actually, well, I think we did right because the this is post. Um, Episode slap. five or six is the slap, right? Yeah, a lot of people felt like the slap was so well deserved, and it's like, eh, I don't know, like it's it's not quite I mean, how I would have done it if it's, I was. It's kind of like the perspective of it, it, he's not wrong with like a ton of his concerns, but it's sometimes the way he presents it in front of people. And I also do think if this if this situation, if Renera were a dude, if she were a king, he probably wouldn't say that. But the fact is, she's a woman, she's a queen, she's not doing a very good job. Uh, and he's trying to tell her that, and yeah. she sometimes refuses to listen. Well, I think, I think that anyone who king, honestly to my queen should be slapped. So I think he, I, uh, I I think he might have said that to run to I would Viserys, want, for example. I would want advisors to be willing to be this aggressive. I think that there are times where you absolutely need to stand in line. I get that, but at the same time, this is a unique circumstance that is Rhaenyra is making a very bad decision by not going immediately to all of her advisors to say, by the way, the war might just have been won. We don't even know yet. You know, that's the kind of news we need to actually yeah. discuss. And, um, but unfortunately, we're not allowed to have any like of these council scenes where she actually participates in the council. And they can't even like develop their perspectives either because Corliss is just like, let's just wait and see what she says as if yeah. no one else in the room has opinions that are relevant or worth exploring because of the way they might interface that's... with whatever. Are we just going to sit here silently until she gets here? Yeah, like, what, that's what's the true. plan when the camera goes to a different scene? <laughs> But like at this point, we almost get to a writing issue because you're right; they can't really build upon it until they get the information of what actually fucking took place. And it's like, so maybe but they should, should have that information that. so that we can have that. that discussion. Why would her first stop when she gets off Cyrax oh. not be the small council? I d there's no because reason whatsoever. You it's, know why? It's her hand yeah, of the fucking king. It's his first it. day, and it's it's insane that <laughs> nobody knows what the fuck's going on. No, she she's just like, well, I have a second hand. I don't need to be here. She, she, had, to uh, You're the she had to. You're the only one I can trust. Her, she had to finish up her business with Masaria. Uh, of they course. got left off in episode 100%. six. Um, um, where she's discussing what she should be discussing in the small council well, chamber at that moment. It feels to me like, it, you know, so we're not going to know now until season three, but Bartimus, especially, he's kind of like um, a broom. Where it feels as though the show might be building up uh, a bit of, bit of turn cloakiness in them as a result of these scenes. Which uh, does bug me because I feel like that shouldn't necessarily be the conclusion. It should actually be that their concerns are taken seriously, but uh, they've accidentally maybe made Rhaenyra a bit too retarded in uh, the stuff to do with Masaria. Masaria is a black hole of, of bad writing. She'll like hurt anybody she's near. Yeah, everything around her is you know, sucked in. So, um, you know, Rhaenyra's been taking some 
uh, extra meta damage in a way from just being in the same room as a uh, Masaria. And yeah, you know, so to me, it's like having an effect of uh, I hope we don't have to deal with someone like a Bottomus being so angry that he fucking quits or betrays or whatever the fuck just because of scenes like this where she should be in the fucking scene talking to him. I'm I'm more than on board, by the way, with him coming up with like some objections that are kind of wonky. For example, if he said how disgusting to have a lowborn on a dragon, something like that, you could have and interesting maybe back Corliss and forth. Corliss would yeah. hear that too and yeah. be like, "Well, I mean, let's not uh, let's not be so quick to judge." You know, I've seen to the character of these so-called lowborns myself, yeah. and they've you know haven't let me down. That would yeah, honestly Corliss that would be better than what we right got. And say, yeah, it's my well, yeah, okay. <laughs> One of my and, bastards, Rainy's the dead. I'm sorry, I loved her, but hey, I have I have two bastards. I got stuff to do. <laughs> One of them is riding a dragon now. Deal with it. I have two bastards, we but they're cool. Them. Don't worry, I swear, <laughs> they're cool. And you well, know, Bartimus I mean, like, Eltigard too. He, from the perspective of like his kind of structure and power role. House Keltigar is one of the three Valyrian houses that came over that still like exists, right? You have the Valarians, you have the Targaryens, and you have the Keltigars. The Keltigars, nowhere near the status of those guys. So Bartimus probably feels like this role is like super important to him, um, which is probably one of the reasons he's getting so frustrated with it in general. I know well, I would Which be. is why I think, I think the Hand of the King saying, look, he's my bastard. <laughs> we can probably trust them. I have a direct blood connection to him and I'm the hand of the queen. I don't know if I don't know if at this moment Corliss knows in this scene. I mean, yeah, I guess that's possible. probably oh, well, doesn't. He knows he knows who they if, are, so if he saw him, he would know. If he saw him, yeah. It just adds on yeah. top though, doesn't it? That like even the hand of the king doesn't know what the hell is going on. It's just like, come on, well, guys, chill. Like, I know this is one of the most significant developments in the state of this entire war and really the history of this world. Um, and the massive, and like the distribution of power to a, a completely unknown entity that could uh, be turned against us. But chill, she got to talk to Masaria. <laughs> well, they should honestly thank be fuck. banging on the fucking door. Like, <laughs> yeah, thank fuck I mean, they don't know how she's actually spending her time because that would make them even more fucking angry. Like, well, yeah, it's like, oh, she's talking to the person who not like two, three weeks ago was actually instrumental in putting Aegon. On the throne. On the throne. Just talking with her <laughs> on her Got own. His coronation. Uh huh. Okay. Well, but I, I like thinking about it now. Though I think the plan should have been get off the dragons immediately. Call for Corliss to come meet them. Introduce him to Corliss. Corliss would say, "Okay, yeah, I know this guy. We can probably trust him if he's sworn fealty to you already." And then she says, "Why?" And he'll say, "He's my well, bastard." And you know like, if, that could have been a pretty quick thing to do, and then immediately in the small you can council, consolidate all of this into one black council scene. You just put it all yeah. in there. Well, consider also, from but having Adam's hand... perspective, like if if you got into this position and your father is the hand of the king, I would immediately and, say that. <laughs> and then, well, it, what if he heard Corliss did you know not mentioning it? What if he heard Corliss even here, even now, being like, no, that's. You know, I just, oh, look who this guy is. What do you know? He's a cool dude, and he doesn't say it. Like, that would probably have some pretty big character repercussions. Yeah. To yeah, be that's kind of denied and yeah. spurned in a way. Well, and I think introducing... Any scene at all would have been better than the scene that we got. If, um, if we cut out the Masaria scene and instead have her enter the Black Council Chamber with Masaria... That could even create some interesting tension. People would be this? like, wait, who is that? And you'd be like, well, I want her here for this announcement. And then, you She's know, as friend. the scene progresses, people would be like, why, why did you go to her and then come here? Well, who is this? And you'd be like, it doesn't matter. The point is the blah, 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 you know, and generate that. But then also have the Corliss um, Adam stuff. And then you also have Bartimus and uh, maybe Corliss having tension over the nature of lowborns and stuff like that. Obviously, you have Jace sneering throughout the whole thing of his POV. There's so much you could do and there's plenty of space to make it happen because the Masaria scene is not fucking short. Anyway, Ooh. next, the Masaria scene. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, yes, we've already got over how miserable it is as a choice. I've got her in my notes as snake retard, so it's like... A snake retard. <laughs> kind of sums up my position on it. She, um... We've gone over it in prior streams, uh, slash recordings but she's uh her only role seems to be to tell Rhaenyra that she's doing everything correctly as long as she does she take her suggestions here and there as well like for, for as long as she's raising in power in status and developing her network and Rhaenyra's agreeing with everything she says she will in turn tell Rhaenyra she's 
she's godlike. She's doing everything perfectly. And, and uh, I think also add on that, top, yeah. Hmm? yeah, add on top that she also seems to be a sort of an insert for the writers. Whatever that, whatever Masaria says should probably be considered to be like the writer's perspective in a sense on uh, so whether Rhaenyra is making the right or wrong choices, which is generally pretty annoying, uh, yeah. especially. It's, Especially when they are not making the right choices. That it's are. also so funny when she's so perfectly presented as this character who is acting sycophantically for ulterior motives. Like, if yeah. the writing acknowledged that, she would be, like, perfectly sliding into that sort of role. Because all yeah. she does is try and ingratiate herself. She doesn't provide anything useful, really, in that regard. Yeah, she's like a non-self-aware I... little finger or something. Yeah. I think that there are times when it's like that, when it is kind of the writers saying that, hey, what she's doing is okay. But I, I also do think that a big theme of the the next couple seasons and the build up towards the end of this season, that Renera truly does think that she's destined to do this, that the gods are are willing this to happen and all this bullshit. It's it's not true. And a lot of the thing, decisions she's making right now because she thinks that and like Masaria is telling her that, they're going to blow up in her face in a big way. I can get that. Well, and, and I think that's not going to help that much in retrospect with these scenes. What will help is if Masaria is a bad guy. It would, it that would make would, more sense. Yeah. It would all kind of tie everything up pretty neatly at the end. It's like, oh, yeah, it, in that context, <laughs> everything makes more sense. She's doing you, all if, of the things that you would do if you were actually that character. If Masaria actually turned out her motivation was, I was hoping to build you up enough that you can be enough of a power that you would wipe out the Targaryens in the Civil War, and that was my only goal because I fucking hate all of you. That would be pretty neat too. It, yeah, that, that's an interesting. That's an interesting perspective. Literally, just trying to get the most damage possible in this war. Yeah, <laughs> like to wipe all the Targaryens off the planet. I mean, I would, I, mean... <laughs> I would be curious though. That being said, if because Masaria, I, I think the show, I think forgets it. There is this element of Masaria that's supposed to be she speaks up for the little guy. Mm -hmm. She's the person who's supposed to be, you know, I, I watch out for the people. I do what's best for the people. Would wanting to facilitate or accelerate the destruction of Targaryens or anything like that, would that be good from that perspective? Well, you'd say it's a bit of a wonky... That's going to be really bad for the realm. Well, you'd have, Ceres, make her, you know, you'd have to make not, her narrow-minded. She would have to She'd have to admit that, like, yes, it'll, it'll be a big amount of suffering in the now, but in the future the Targaryens will be gone, and that's going to be peace for everybody because the dragons are a nightmare. And, you know, she could argue that instead of... 50 pain for the every day for the rest of the year will have 100 pain for a few weeks and then back down to a nice steady 10 for for the rest of humanity like she could argue yeah. it that way she's not the only if this if this like theoretical thing that we're talking about were to happen she wouldn't be the only one there's this whole thing like in the books within the books that the maesters actually have this gigantic plot to you know get rid of the targaryens because they didn't like the way they came in they don't like the way they rule they don't like the fact that they see themselves as higher than everything um, and their brand of magic and all of these types of stuff. So they wouldn't be the only ones that think the Targaryens are not the rightful rulers or the ones that should be in control of Westeros. Unlike the, you would there's... think that all of the years of peace that Viserys gave would mean something to Missaria. Um, Well, we're, we're speculating on the thing that's not uh, even happening. So it's, it's yeah, really that's true, yeah, it's true. It's of objecting on principle, right? Of like, oh, so just because you guys got dragons, like that means you get to be in charge forever, regardless of whether you're even fit to rule. Like the the existence of the dragons eliminates the capacity for like meritocracy in a sense. There, are, yeah, you I could argue I, the series' reign would... might have encouraged uh, that perspective because who's taken over for him now is uh, a bunch of idiot, horrible people who probably shouldn't be on the throne. You know, yeah, like Sarah is just... great, but all of these people. You know? <laughs> I think if someone could could organize the destruction of all nuclear weapons, that that would be something they would try. Well, Even and bear in mind, it's not just the destruction of nuclear the weapons, term. the destruction of the capacity to create more as well. Yeah. Like that whole type of warfare wiped from the planet and everything now needing to be settled by sea and land battles. Oh, it's, I, I think you're right. It's super tempting, I think, for any character to think if we can wipe out the dragons and stop them from creating more eggs, that's it. They're gone. Like Maybe the, uh, they could no tie this power, directly yeah. back to episode four. You know, now that we've seen what dragons can kind of do... And now that that news is going around, 
maybe that sort of gets a lot of people to go, oh shit, yeah, dragons really suck, don't they? Jeez. However, we do get a one-two punch of retardation in this scene. First is that, uh, of course, yeah, Rhaenyra is kind of spiraling as to exactly how this happened. What, what does it mean going forward? We have to check the books for more blood lines to figure out who we can get, this, that, and the other thing. And then Messiah is like, ah, Rhaenyra, here's the, here's the actual plan that you should consider. We should, uh, if you didn't know, there's actually Targaryen bastards all over King's Landing and Dragonstone. And of them... Uh, one could say that, you know, there's going to be plenty that are going to be loyal to you, uh, maybe even more loyal than Highborns, because you probably didn't know this either, but Highborn people, including, <laughs> you know, your family members, aren't actually super reliable for loyalty to you. If, if you weren't aware, Aegon, the current sitting king, is actually uh, uh, aggressively oh, trying to kill you. So <laughs> technically, Highborn is actually not the key to all of this, and Rhaenyra finds this all very fascinating and interesting when she knows all of it. Well, <laughs> did you know that rich people and kings and nobles can be bad? The exact people you are politicking against right now? Yeah, and I, the delivery is a little kind of stupid from her in this scene, and like the the way she's saying it, like uh, she's the only person in the world that knows this. But in reality, what have we seen from Game of Thrones and this? People do look at people like the the lower class. They look at them differently. They don't fucking matter. They, they don't care about them. Like, the idea that R what renera has been doing to try to find potential dragon riders is literally looking through, like, the history books of the noble families and see where Targaryens may have married into and who might have blood. Um, so the idea that no one... I mean, look at the way that her council reacts and the dragon tamers and everybody react to the idea of her putting lowborn bastards on the throne. Kind of a common thing. Thing, that's, uh, in the world that would make more sense though if the conversation were a matter of um whether or not that's suitable that's the right etiquette that's the correct thing to do according to the histories is one thing but the way this scene is framed it seems as though it's information to Rhaenyra that there are bastards running around all over the place yeah, like, and, and then to add on top of that like hey you know like you, you really shouldn't be quick to judge because there are there are these people who who hate you that are noble. So you know, like you ever think about that? It's like, what do you think about it? Like that's it's like hmm. that's just reality. Like, well, and, and they she want... use herself as an example. Masaria. Yeah, I'm like, see, I'm not like a highborn person or noble birth or anything, and I'm, I'm loyal pretty to you. cool to you. I'm loyal to you. I'm really helpful. And you're great and everything. Maybe you can get me a dragon. <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if she was fucking seconds away from asking oh, for that. But Jesus. yeah, this is supposed yeah. to be a fuck yeah scene because it ends with her saying, let us raise an army of bastards. And it's like, why was it those lines from Masaria that even convinced you that this was a thing? Would have been way better, again, to cut that whole thing and have it be the Council of the Blacks, have a bunch of arguments from legacy and history of why we don't do this, and then a bunch of arguments that are more pragmatic. And fuck it, let... Masaria be introduced to the council in a really awkward way and she can make some good arguments for why we should do it and then Rhaenyra can say I'm going to over overrule this we're doing it you know and it could be seen as a controversial decision it would be an interesting opportunity to get a bunch of character going but nope and we have the Adam Corliss scene right that could have been incorporated into the Black Council scene as well we don't need to have these separated out into their own moments we can bring it all together as a big good old fashioned oh. character scene I would have loved to see like Renera bring in Adam, like there he is, Adam of Hall, and like watch Corliss's reaction, see Adam's reaction, see how they try to stumble yeah. through it without revealing to anybody that they're actually related before they have a private conversation. That would have been really good to see. And it's it's awkward because you don't like Corliss can't know whether or not he's told her that yet, and Adam doesn't know whether or not he would openly announce that yet. So what he said, he's not. You know what I mean? Like there's. He's admitted his father's of no consequence and he's walking into a room where he's right fucking there. It's like, oh shit. Yeah. Like when he, he says something good about his, you know, son's qualities, but he's but like, how did you know this? He's like, oh shit. I was like, oh, because he works over at the docks uh, stuff, doing the boat stuff where I am. And they, he, he trums up with alternative reasons to know these things and instead of the real. Yeah, and it creates reason. a bit of a payoff when Not you finally lying, find out but... that he knew. You'll be like, we should be like, why didn't you just tell me straight away? You'll be like, I didn't pause. wasn't wasn't sure. <laughs> like you, you know, you could create some uh, interesting tension there as well. But I had only suspected. I didn't know yet. Yeah, uh, I would have told you if I was sure. You know, put him in kind of on the spot. Because yeah, you do get the callous Adam scene after it, and he, and it's like a nice one. Anyway, bye. Like, uh, yeah, Corliss is not. It does not know how to deal with uh, his bastard sons, which we get a. Big old payoff of that later on, episode eight. Yes, we do. 
I mean, kind of think of it, you probably think it would be worthwhile saying that you're a shipwright and you work under Corliss. Yeah. Like you're one of the guys who helps build his ships. I mean, like, uh, I like all of these developments. I just don't think they took as much advantage of uh, what they're dealing with for the characters here as they could have. So anyway, we're over to Harren Hall. Yeah. Hooray! Woo! Yeah, so it seems like we're in the minority know, when, it, when it cuts over to Harren Hall and there's excitement. You well, know? It's just, yeah, they're, they're like 11 out of 10 right. scenes every time. So, uh, you know. They're so good. Unpopular yeah. opinion. Yeah, the amount of, of the arguments people... I've had about this show involve Harren Hall. Yeah. It, the amount of people online who are like critical, and I, this season certainly wasn't as good as the first season at all, but. Um, the amount of people who are like, nothing happened this season. No, there was nothing of value. Uh, it's like, bro, I, I, I think we got a lot of decent to great character arcs from different people or interactions. And the entire Damon Heron Hall thing, I think, was one of the best things about this season uh, for both for both the kind of casual viewer that's tuning in and also people who love little shit from the books or tie ins to weirwood magic and all these different things. Yeah. Um, so scene begins of course this is post finding out that Grover has died which means uh, Oscar is now going to be in charge Damon coming to terms with all the stuff that he's seen he's finally going to be able to make some progress Oscar arrives and he says uh, in such a way of in such a Damon way of trying to move this along as fast as possible because this uh, we, we've had conversations about this on Nidrotic stream but the comedy of House of the Dragon is very specific and subtle a lot of the time. They squeeze it in where they can. It's not like Game of Thrones is a much funnier show because they had much funnier characters, but that this is a little bit more subtle. And so you have an example like um, him delivering in a very dull way. He's like, My condolences on the passing of your grandsire, but the crown con congratulates you on your ascension to the head of your house and Lord Paramount in the Riverlands. Truly glorious. Well done. <laughs> just... Yeah, like we're, the last scene we saw this, Damon's like, like, your grandfather's a yeah, useless piece just, of shit who yeah. can't even hold in his diarrhea. You can suffocate like, him with the pillow, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, but, but I love my grandson. He raised me. Oh, uh, so funny. And, uh... I think the, uh... There, there is just, uh... You, you carry on, it'll come up later. I'll come up. Well, yeah, because uh, there's, there's so much to discuss. This is a, a really fucking great set of... I was about to say set of scenes. It's the inside and outside of Harren Hall. You had, um, back to backs, really good shit. The... The nature of Oscar becomes more obvious as the time goes on, and the actor does a fucking excellent job. He made an impression on everybody in terms of playing the timid, I don't know what's going on character who can be manipulated by everything, all the way up to being kind of an incredibly important force that's likely learned a hell of a lot in the short life that he's lived compared to a lot of the lords and ladies of the of the Riverlands. Um, to the point where he impresses his own men, let alone Damon. Yeah, he he literally rope a dopes Damon. Mm -hmm. Like the setup before where they're having the private meeting uh, to when they get out by there. He, some, he, he literally does. He rope a dopes him like Muhammad Ali style. Mm -hmm. um, verbally. Verbally rope a dopes him. And I, I do like just the random aside because a lot of the Tullys in this are named after Muppet characters or like yeah. Sesame Street characters. Oscar Tully, he even delivers a line I'm green in these type of matters. <laughs> um, a little, a little meme for oh, George Martin. Okay. I didn't catch that. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. he does say it. That was good. I can't wait for Statler and Waldorf to show up in season three of Game of Thrones. Wait till you see Snuffleupagus uh, Baratheon. <laughs> yeah. So, great. yeah, the uh, I really like the way they write this. So it's uh, at first, he's, Damon's just bulldozing. He's like, right, we're ready to go then. Get everybody on board. This is it. We've done everything right. And Oscar's like, Ooh, it does seem you've made somewhat of a mess here. And it's such a like, um, okay, you know, like, what do you, we go with this? And, We're going to uh, have to figure some stuff out, man. Yeah, and he says, uh, whose side are you on? Like, why would it, why would it matter? You just do what I, do what I tell you to do. That is uh, it's not that simple at all. And um, he says, uh, though as it is yet to be seen whether they'll heed my authority as young as it is, there's another problem. They all hate you. And uh, David is not <laughs> taking this information. I think the, the position David's in is just like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah, like he doesn't even process that as being an issue. No. Like it's, it's, never, it's never mattered. Do what I fucking say. I've got a dragon. I've got this bloodline. I'm the 
you know, husband of the queen in whatever capacity he sees himself at this moment. You know, what that means. He's never had to deal with this shit before. Just do it. And yeah, it's definitely a uh, Oscar's figuring out how to approach with him because he's uh, he's off to go and see the lords that Simon's bringing him to. And this is this is the scene that's probably one of the better ones of the episode. Honestly, this one it's got shit tons in it that's worthwhile in terms of uh, subtleties and how the scene's progressing. How Damon thinks it's one thing and it flips to something completely fucking different. Every last shot of Simon is glorious. <laughs> yeah. There is so. this correlation of Heron Hall scenes and Simon are very mm. <laughs> strong. So it's one it's just one of the many reasons why the Heron Hall plot line is so good. Simon, my beloved. Best character? I think you can make a case. You can make a case. Certainly of the Apex, secondaries. Apex tier character, S plus. And so like everyone's Oh wait, go ahead. I was just gonna say it's it's yet another scene that's taking place in front of the Weirwood tree, which mm. I have no idea if they're going to end up tying that into something, but it, it's been noticeable through the first two seasons of how many very important sequences or dialogue between characters is taking like place right in front of the weirwoods. I mean, yeah. with the it's like in the background, it's right there. Like, remember where all this stuff is happening? You're in Heron Hall. You're in these, you know, this part of the world. Things are a little bit different here. You've got that thing looming in the background. Quiet. It's silent. Doesn't make any noise. But, you know, visually, it's very important for... Sort yeah, they're like little nexus points. Story. So it yeah. makes you wonder and what that might mean. Season season four, episode 10 is just... The end is going to be Bran, like, like coming out of a dream where he actually just witnessed all this, and we're all going to hate it. Well, that's what's um, funny about that. They gain nothing from doing that. We would just be upset. <laughs> like, don't yeah, we, like, do that shit. If that's what it was. Um... So yeah, the scene opens with Damon, of course, thinking he's in charge, and he's just said, like, all right, so Rivermen honor the old ways and bide by tradition. Well then, Grover Tully's dead, Oscar is in his place, and he has sworn his bannerman to, to me, essentially. So there we go. Good. All done. And then it's like, hmm. And it's what's interesting about it is you can tell Oscar is like, Ugh, this is going to be difficult because he's balancing... Damon, but he's also going to try and win respect from the Rivermen as well. Mm -hmm. So he starts uh, trying to explain to them. Oh, oh so they, they open with saying, like, why would we follow a boy younger than our own sons? Uh, especially when you align with someone who would desecrate the innocent to reach his aims. Which I think you get a shot of Damon just being like, whatever. But, um... You know, Oscar's not going to have much uh, clout, so to speak, uh, YouTube clout, if he's not going to be able to earn some respect from these people. So he's going to have to try and sort it out. But Willem Blackwood is also here, being a douche. He's like, hey, I did what I was supposed to do, and I've got the traitors here, the Brackens. And uh, so you've got that element, Damon, the, the, the River Lords, and then, of course, what Oscar's going to do. Uh, this, like I said, it's why he's like impressed everybody, I think. The uh, the character and the actors, he's barely in the show, but he, he does a really good job here. He says... Um, yeah, he's a big impression. He says he's young, and he's even like sort of stuttering at first. And he says, uh, you know, got no love for Damon Targaryen. He's dishonored himself and, his, and the crown with his comportment here. And there's this... Little moment when he says that, where Simon looks at David and he, you yeah, know, they're, they're, they're like, like, wait a oh minute, God. <laughs> because he just Damon might kill us all right now. Well, that's the thing, right? Simon, as we find out, is not sure of David, especially after that fucking scene where he put a knife to his throat. I have to imagine he considers <laughs> yeah, him a this bit guy's chaotic. A psycho, <laughs> like what the fuck? So uh, it's just a really great moment of like, good God, is this going to turn into everybody killing each other? I really fucking hope yeah. not. And um, a reasonable possibility of that happening. You got that, but you've also got, I think Damon's given a look to Simon because there's a sense of, did you know about this? Did you know that Oscar is clearly smarter and more aggressive than he ever let on? Because he just said, I dishonored the crown to me. I'm his fucking king. Like, what the hell? You can't just say that. And, um, you know, he's getting madder and madder sort of thing. And uh, keeps pushing on, slowly revealing his power level. And he says... Uh, he, I think he says, uh, I see no reason to cast aside loyalty, no matter how loathsome I may find the queen's representative, the prince, which is a change from that referring is, uh, to him as king. A very deliberate yeah. change as well, right in front of everybody. And it, Damon, it shows, yeah, it's make it, it makes it very clear he's putting, he is very specifically putting Damon and his authority below the queen. He wants to affix himself to his loyalty to the queen, so he does not want to put Damon on the same pedestal. He wants to distance 
in a way, Damon from Rhaenyra. And there's this moment where uh, Damon's clearly fucking mad now. He's not handling the insults very well. Nor would he, not that we'd ever expect him to. So he says, King, mind your tongue, boy. And the, the camera makes sure to show us the River Lads people did not like that at all. And there's, there's, there's just already, this uneasy you know? sense, like one of them has their hand on their sword. It's like, hmm. Maybe calm down. And uh, Oscar recognizes that. Simon recognizes that. And so Oscar squares up to him and says, will you have our army or not? Which is a really fucking clever line to deliver uh, from a mm -hmm. character perspective, because if the Riverland people hear that, it sounds like a, you know, you better heal sort of thing. Like, what I'm saying here is true, and we're not just going to hand ourselves over to you. But the way I would cycle it over to how Damon hears it from him is, listen, I know this is not going to be fun for you, but this is necessary. You have to go through this process if you want to get what you want. It's not going to be that you kill a bunch of women and children. It's not going to be that you breathe fire on a bunch of people. It's going to be that you have to experience some humiliation because you made some mistakes. Like, yeah, the alternative is he burns literally everyone present. That is the only yeah. other way he would get what he needs. And I think Damon picks that up, and it's annoying, but if it means we can get this done in the next ten minutes, you know, if I just say a particular set of things, like, fuck it, whatever, you know, fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Oscar traps him. Right. He knows that he needs like that. He has what he needs. He has control of this army that Damon needs. And the only thing Damon needs to do to get it is swallow his pride. Um, that's basically his only option. And he's forced into it. Unfortunately, yeah. it's one of the most difficult things for him to do. Uh, he, it, it really is kind of the overarching theme of Harren Hall is like tearing him down and and having and, and like digging into his core. Because, I mean, this this is he does not want to be a subordinate. He doesn't like that. But unfortunately, he's been outmaneuvered here, so yes. he has to accept it. And well, uh, partly because it is, of his it mistakes pretty... too, which he's starting to realize. Well, yeah, exactly. It's well, that's that's another thing that's also been interesting as well is that a lot of um, it feels like it's mainly been through Damon. I kind of wish it was being more so reflected in a lot of the other interactions between like Targaryens and people of. You gotta, like, play the game, my dude. Like, you don't get to just come along and be like, well, I have a dragon, so, you know, you'll do whatever I want, as has been yeah. illustrated no before, right? When those guys you. just totally walked, a they turned their back on them and left because they didn't give a shit. It's like, it, it's, it's like you have to meet with the realities of the world, and the realities of the world is there are other people who have different ways of living and who don't necessarily like you and don't necessarily hold you in particularly high regard, that you have to actually do something for them if you want them to help you. You can't just expect it because you you declare that you're the king. Um, like I said, I wish I got more of it in the rest of the show, but, I'm, but I mean, it's one of the reasons why the uh, Harren Hall uh, Damon stuff is so cool. It's, well, I'd imagine it's people feel angle. somewhat emboldened by the fact that there's a civil war running too. It's like, as opposed to three enormous, gigantic gargantuan dragons all together coming over and basically saying heal to the entire kingdom this time it's a handful of them versus a handful of them and they're vying for power from everybody and they can't afford to lose you like and also damon can't Damon's afford to burn everybody in the riverlands well, that's not going to be a good result a hearts and minds it, it, is an important part of warfare like it, it's not enough to just burn everyone you have to get people that are in the place that you have conflict with to get onto your side if you want to ever have like a resolution to the conflict that'll last I and mean, after all it was mussolini he was killed by his own people. There was an uprising. All and, of that, all the stuff he wanted to do and the allies that he had and well, the people hated him, so they killed him. And that was and that was that. That piss off enough Italians and it's not good. Exactly. Hey. On on using the Heron Hall arc to advance the character, I mean there's not many ways to advance this character other than scaring the shit out of him. Because you can't, you can't do it with combat. I mean, this is a guy who like in season one, he went to yeah, evil evil crab man's place and just like owned everybody. Like co like combat is not going to shape this guy into anything different. Like he loves fighting, so you need to scare him with something like this, uh, something that takes a psychological route. So and th he undergoes a significant transformation here. So like the the idea, like anybody saying at all like this is <laughs> like a waste of time or whatever, it's just ridiculous yeah damon seeks out combat and conflict specifically to avoid having to deal with all the things he was forced to deal with this season mm -hmm. and like yeah. a lifetime of doing that finally came around to him and he was forced to confront all of that 
in, in these several Heron Hall episodes. I wanted to uh, uh, highlight Oscar says, I am in the end a river man and the word of my house stands, even if certain people are unworthy of it. David is distinctly unimpressed with that line. We get a shot of Simon <laughs> looking like that. I was like, oh, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> He's just like, oh, we're going to die in this neighborhood. <laughs> Please calm down. <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry about it. Poor guy. Restful, all right? He's just trying to keep everything chill. Um, But yes, uh, Damon makes the right shot here. He's like, okay, maybe you're not wrong. Maybe I was a touch enthusiastic in pursuing my aims, which is a really funny way to put what he did. Enthusiastic, um, yeah. And he says, but don't allow my failings to keep you from supporting an upright man. And uh, what I like here is a sort of twist on the scene is Damon's essentially saying, fine, the old ways are great. Look at him go. Let's do it. The old ways. So that means your men are sworn to me, right? The old ways. And then... Uh, the Riverlands people are like, well, if it's the old ways, what the fuck is the justice to be done with what happened to the Brackens? And it's like, well, I, 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 what, what justice need be done? And you have this uh, really great interaction of Willem Blackwood being like, all right, I am your vassal, uh, Lord Oscar. I serve you. Everything's great. And I did only what I was told. Happy, happy, happy. And uh, it's another kind of challenge for Oscar, right, to get this correct. So he says, you know, I accept you as my vassal. It's all good. Everything's great. But there's like this fun little gap they have. Oh, I was like, oh, yeah. oh, God, where's this going? And he said, there's only one answer for the crimes that you visited on your neighbors. And as if he wasn't based enough, he climbs the ladder because uh, Willem tries again. He's like, I only did what Damon told me to do. And then he says, yeah, but you still chose to do it. You wanted to you do still it. Still did it. There is exactly. You, you like, could have said not, no. Let's not bullshit here. You wanted to. This was he your also choice. He also implies that Damon made no indication of how far he is to go, so as far as he went was his choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, and they're all aware. They know about the conflict, they know the the man somewhat, and he was just waiting for an excuse. So it's this none of this, I quite like it as a judgment on his soul as opposed to uh, the action in isolation, right? Like, or with command. It's a, it's a really cool little moment. He's like, nah, you're not getting away with this. And, um... What I really like as well in the scene is the shots keep cutting back over to Damon, and uh, he's not looking strong. He's looking quite worried, actually. And the sense... It's, a, it's an interesting expression. It's a really kind of fascinating, like, it's, uh, he's quite still, but there's a lot going on in his mind, clearly. Yeah, there's, there's a is lot there a... of different observations one could make. Um, I remember originally, Theo, you're the one that suggested he saw himself in Willem. Yeah. Yeah, he essentially had to, like, kill an older version of himself here. One that was uh, chaotic, ruining shit, doing whatever he wanted, just angry, vengeful, wants to cause pain, and the re repercussions of that are just, your head fucking comes off. A very literal rogue prince in that sense, yeah. Which maybe he could see as, like, foretelling his own future down that path. Like, maybe the next overstep with Rhaenyra is too much. Or with mm -hmm. whatever other powers that be uh, at that point. You even get a Simon Strong cut where he just goes, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Class act, that man. Uh, but yeah, it's, you get like the screaming, you know, whispering through the, the wind sort of thing, the camera just tightening up while you hear like, no, it should have, blah, 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 and everyone like wrestling over getting in place. And the suggestion that it should be Damon to uh, bring the king's, the crown's justice upon this uh, failure which again feels very much a good choice from Oscar, not only to prove that Damon is listening, that he's willing like to take actions that are important, but it's also really important to do this in front of all the River Lords. It's a really, yeah. well, because there's something that's super impressive about the scene. It's one of the reasons why Oscar, considering how little screen time he gets, is a super fascinating uh, supporting character. Is, you know, at the beginning of the scene, all of the other, like, Lords are just sort of looking like, hey, look, you're, you're young, you're inexperienced, like, what... Why should we even listen to you? And then by the end of this scene, it's only like five minutes long. They're all on his side. Like he by the managed end of that to scene, win them I all over. To vote for and the it's... guy. I'm just like, yeah, River Lords, right on, Tully. It's in a way good for Damon too, because it allows him to disown that atrocity. Exactly. In some and also, it's just it's a power move, right? It's like you got to do what I'm telling you, buddy. <laughs> like, it's less sorry. he who passes the sentence swings the sword, and more Oscar's sentence to Damon was to swing the sword. He's like, now this is what yeah. you have to do to prove it to everybody. Well, mm -hmm. this... And I mean, Damon's okay with that. 
I think it's reasonable to assume there's a little bit of an angle of Damon being like, fuck, this guy, I'm killing this guy even though he did everything I told him to do, essentially. Like, I... Mm -hmm. That feels odd, too. Mm -hmm. Just, well, it's uh... the element of consequences. Yeah. 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 It's and like, it's... now, th this is what you've done, now swing the sword. Yeah, and, like, that... Like, that... That feeling there is literally about to pay off in the next sequence. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, when we... He gets another visit from his from his brother. Yeah, I mean, in closing, I'll just yeah. say that the scene sits on Damon's face after he chops off his head for a while. He did not enjoy this whole sequence. He got completely fucking undercut, confused, uh, annoyed because he understands perfectly from Oscar exactly what point is being made here, how things are properly done, but it makes him feel somewhat powerless, confused, and do you even want this job? Is this, uh, is this strictly something you want to be engaging with on the regular? You can't just burst in, action-packed, and fire up everybody, do whatever you want. You actually have to deal with all these very long histories, all the rules, to get exactly what you want. And yeah, we see Viserys at his, uh, the end of his rope, so to speak, with what damage the crown had done to him. Or at least that's the point of the scene, right? Like the, uh... Offering the crown well, to Damon. Physical damage, right? It's the psychological damage, the weight, the 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 cost, the toll of being king, which feels like an important thing for Damon to start to reconcile. Because from the outside looking in, I think it's safe to say that he always viewed it as, well, yeah, you're the king, and and you you're in charge, and you get to tell everybody what to do, and not understanding that that's not really the nature of what it means to be a king at all. You've got a lot of responsibilities and difficulties and challenges. In many ways, you don't have a whole lot of control over what's going on because you have to try and uh, keep everything together and navigate everybody's differing interests. It's something that, you know, Viserys has talked about before, right, in season one. He knew that people were trying to get shit out of him. He knew that people yeah. were playing the game and trying to uh, lever uh, to, like, climb the ladder and get more power, and that was something he had to deal with. And it, it's, yeah, particularly important as an ending here of, hey, buddy. Do you want to be king now? Like, it's, uh, it's great. Yeah. It's all about perspective for Damon, because we know that he saw Viserys as a weak king or a weak man, and regardless of whether or not he's right, he has perspective now. He, he knows a bit better the sort of thing that Viserys was dealing with. He understands that it's not as simple as hopping on your dragon and ruling with an iron fist. Yep, that's right. It's just, there um, just there's so much... Realities. So much intense level of purpose for all these scenes, beginning with the his understanding and impact on Rhaenyra and his family, where he went wrong, all of his choices, moving up to the series, reflecting in himself the damage he's done by creating someone almost, or at least seeing himself in Aemon. Each of these visions, right, they have like a very specific and mm -hmm. and heavy point. And the one we got before this was him finally coming to terms with how he should have supported his brother. And now this scene that's non-confrontational at all, it's just completely honest of is this what you want? Like, ultimately, you come to understand a lot about your your position in this family, and the the choice is coming. You will be able to subvert Rhaenyra if you want to and take full control. Do you want it? And we we don't actually get an answer in this episode. No, no, we don't. I don't. But we I'm, don't get an answer like until the very end of the arc. I, I would yeah, say. Even with Broom, he doesn't give an answer. Air. It's still up in the air by then. It's just that yeah. he's very much at a point where, at the beginning of the season, if he had the army and he didn't have any of the spooky Harren Hall visions, he probably would have taken it. Harren Hall. Just 11 out of 10, just saying. It is. Harren it's actually really good. It's, um, it's really, really, really disappointing that um, so many people seem to think that it's pointless and stupid. You should reconsider your position on Harren Hall if you think he didn't like it. Watch well, and to be game. fair, we've delivered a shit ton of criticism to this episode, but the Harren Hall, as you can see, it's almost glowing praise. That it is a great, the, uh, great moment. Some might even call it the the savior of a lot of this season, some might say. Well, you um, know, I wouldn't want to undermine Green Council is always top-notch as well. Yes, uh, that is true. There's, there's Harren Hall is... Green it's, Council or Harren Hall, you're probably fine. You're probably safe, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's the best, like, black side stuff. Yes. I think I Beyond would say even just the... the best stuff. I I like it the most of all the stuff in the season. Whenever we go to Heron Hall, I am, like, locked in, total, full attention. I gotta see what happens. I want to see Simon talking and walking around, and I want to see what's going on with this Alice and the, the, the magic, and I want to see how Damon, you know, deals with it and what's his position. It is... 
I it, it's my favorite part of season uh two. Um, beyond just the plot benefits of it, it's nice to have to give um Matt Smith another avenue to show off. Yeah, like his acting ability because we don't we we never see him like worried or scared or in distress in any other scene except in Harrenhal because he always has to put up a tough sort of cocksure front. Um, well, even in the hallucinations, he gets to access uh, emotions that he himself would not want people to see him with. Like when he's trapped yeah. in his own head in a room with Viserys, he knows it's not real, so to speak. So he can like it, it further express himself. Whereas if he comes out of it, you see him right, just trying to clarify, "Am I fucking back in the real world now? What have you done, Simon?" What's his yeah. What's his calm down? He's like, "Right, anyway, yeah, I'm fine." I'm great. This and is obviously... the perfect place to put him. There's a spooky castle where he has to confront supernatural and psychological dangers rather than physical dangers, because we've seen that he's much more comfortable just going into an actual battle than to yeah. the battle of his own psyche, you know? Actual and battles are simple and you know straightforward. There is a very clear goal. He doesn't have to battle with himself at all. There's a sort of simplicity to it, and then he's in his element. He can, it's, it's, it is an avenue for all of his, you know, internal cruelty and being able to project his strength. And, and for yeah, all of them, it obviously go is a spook, it obviously is a spooky place, which would explain why he looks so spooked in all his like visions. But I think it's also telling of what he's actually feeling, even in all the scenes where like he's putting on a tough front. I think he like very often is quite like scared and insecure and unsure, but he can't. He can't make that visible to anybody around him. Yeah, now like now go recontextualize that scene in episode eight um, when he sees Viserys in bed, like sick and dying. And instead of like, you know, comforting him as a brother would, instead he kind of chokes on his words a little bit, but gets straight down to business about what's going on with Driftmark and the secession and everything that needs to happen. Um, and I will also say for a lot of the criticism criticism that's been out there about the writers of this show uh, deviating from some of the things and the way they happen in the book, which I think some is valid and some is not. This entire Heron Hall plot is all made up by the writers for this show. Um, in the book, he goes to Heron Hall, takes Heron Hall, and he basically just fucks off there for half of the war. Um, so this, this is all created by them, so I think it is... Uh, you know, kudos to them for this portion of what they made up. Careful. Praising the writers is not a popular thing to do these days. Uh, well, the argument the that I've... <laughs> the argument Gotta do it when I've they deserve it. They did a lot of good stuff. Yeah, they for oh, all their I agree. faults, they have also done some really good stuff. And they've done... We'll, we'll talk about the episodes. Hmm. We'll talk about the episodes. We'll do that. The argument I've heard against it, though, is that people think it was the writers trying to sideline uh, um, Damon and make you like him less, which I, I really less. don't agree with that argument. Uh, less. They have failed in that ambition. <laughs> yes. But I hope I they try mean, and make I me... <laughs> I hope they try to make me hate every character, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there are I people... I hope they stop I... trying to make me like characters, honestly. Uh, yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we, we saw a lot of this for season one and season two, like the kind of fan cam stan type of accounts a lot of those people just love Damon. and I, I mean i love damon in season one as well but you have to acknowledge that he's super flawed you know and he like oh, yeah. he does a lot of fucked up things but he's still an awesome character and maybe those people feel like this takes some of the edge away from him i i, I think it i think it yeah, really builds yeah. out him as a character uh as opposed to just oh look at how edgy he is he was a good character a good in this of him i I have heard the argument that Damon being the person is he he is is like somewhat out of character with his willingness to like tolerate things the things that sort of happen to him and are said to him in Harrenhal. Hmm. Uh, the best I could say is like I think some affordance should be given because of the the stuff that he's been seeing there. It's definitely putting him off guard. I think. Well, kind of as we discussed before, a lot of this is literally him. Literally, yeah. Ta him talking to himself, in a sense. He understands... Of, it, it does, it, it's not obvious at first, but he does come to realize that a lot of this is like, oh, am I, you know, is, am I talking to me? Is there is some um, part of myself that's talking to me? His tolerance so does seem explains. to generally increase anyway because uh, this is... It becomes so standard almost. Um, 
not only the hallucinations, not only the fact that he's dealing with things about himself that are kind of intense, but also the shenanigans from someone like a Simon. You know, the when he gets woken up, I think in the prior episode he said is uh, is, is 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 the dessert ready now or some shit. Like like he's so used to being interrupted by him or crazy events taking place or seeing people that should be dead. Uh, or, or ghosts, spooky spirits, a bunch of whispers on the air. He's, he's, it seems to me, uh, remember with Broom, where he's like, did you hear that? And then he goes, yeah, this place will have you barking at the moon. He's like, come <laughs> yeah. to terms with it. It's something that's become a bit more normal to him. Which, uh, yeah, he does say to Alice, right? He doesn't make fun of it anymore, the nature of Supernatural. Yeah, if Damon, obviously it's the next episode, but if Damon had experienced that vision that he had in episode eight when he first got to Hall. He would not have given a shit. It wouldn't have mm -hmm. affected him. Um, but now being through everything he's witnessed, going along with the real life stuff that he's having to learn about and kind of act, like act differently than he would have normally in order to get what he wants, that's what makes him more receptive to that. Because he would have just dismissed it immediately. They did a lot of work and effort into getting me to believe as an audience member that even someone like Damon can be changed by events. Uh, he can be... Um, he can be altered and his character can progress in ways. They've done the work for it. I totally buy into it and believe it. And I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, and as was said, this was the way to do it as opposed to a series of battles or even having a limb cut off. These aren't the ways that you change a character like this necessarily compared to forcing him in a room to deal with the repercussions of his actions of history in the form of his brother just sitting there crying. He's it's like, deal with that. And he's like, no, don't want to. Get me out of here. Don't let me fucking deal with this. Don't want to deal with this. And so uh, Heron Hall was like a, a cage, but simultaneously a lot of really good therapy. It's yeah. a cage to set him free. I feel like uh, Heron Hall's a good guy, you know? He's, he's trying. Uh, the, the castle Yeah. <laughs> so, the next scene we see uh, Laris is desperately trying to get Aegon on uh, physical therapy through the maester. He's... Um, struggling in agony his little walking stick breaks this, this, this just seems horrible uh with every scene that passes with Aegon I'm probably gonna throw out a Tom Glynn Carney does an excellent job and he's taken Aegon up everyone's ladder for a character you're interested in his performance yeah, is top notch mm -hmm. it, it's kind of wild the amount of sympathy we do actually feel for this dude who for so much has just been shown mm -hmm. to be a massive is an evil shit. bastard <laughs> exactly um and we, you really do, as much as you know the things that he's done, you feel sympathy for him in the situation. Makes you think they maybe regret the, um, the bastard children pit fights, uh, thing. Mm, I, I mean, mean I, I think that's part of it. Like, yeah. I, I, I think that, that is part of this, this kind of world and what they're doing with House of the Dragon in general is like these, these characters who have motivations that you find, you know, disgusting or whatever, they experience something and whether it's of their own volition that they change or that's just like the thing that they've been through, it does make you see them and realize, God, this is all really complex. It's, it's not all black and white all the time. And uh, even people that have done evil things you can feel for. Well, I guess especially on the scale of people having served their time, what what is a worse thing that could have happened to Aegon? Especially when you find like, out the extent of his symptoms. It's like I could have been right, blind. I mean, not only I getting suppose, burned, could always get worse like that. I mean, could always get worse. Sure, but, but like I mean, he's he's not the same person anymore. Like he he's he's a fundamentally different being with a different set of motivations. Because I mean, you know, not having a dong will do that to you. Get, getting like not only burned like that, but also surviving that and well, having and, to and deal with that for the rest of your life is one of the most horrific things and is bound mm -hmm. to There's so much to list. Is the fact of who did it to him, the fact of what his standing is now, post all of this, what everything meant at the time, and how much, what his life means going forward. And, you know, we talk about losing particular parts of your body. Uh, it's bad in our universe. It's really bad in theirs because they derive a lot of their meaning from their ears in this world. The physicality, yeah their yes. individual actions and their individual accomplishments and he doesn't have a male heir nope. yeah exactly we saw the male heir get his head chopped off you know several episodes ago uh, that's a big part of it too and you know ultimately as well what we, we realize about his upbringing doesn't make it right or any of the things he did not evil and fucked up 
But at the same time, he had a father who never really cared about him or taught him the things he was going to need to know to be a king. He had a mother who, as we've seen with what Alicent and kind of the blame that's been placed on Alice about how fucked up all her children ended up being. Uh, he didn't necessarily, even though he grew up the most privileged person in the world, it doesn't mean it was the most healthy way for him to grow up. The impression I always got from season one was he grew up with like the weight of the world on his shoulders almost, and it broke him and then everyone gave up on him. See, I, the the way the way I look at Aegon is because he was never named heir, he didn't have any weight on his shoulders. You know, he got to have all this privilege. He got to get everything he wanted whenever he wanted, but he was never expected to become king. He just thought he was going to be able to fuck, drink, eat whatever he wanted for oh, the rest you mean, of his life. Because Alice, Allison did impress that on him, but he never took it seriously, you mean? Yeah. Because the expectation would be there would be Rhaenyra the whole time, at least maybe from his perspective. We never really got to know that from him. That's the thing, season one only mm -hmm. gave you a bit of Aegon near the more weighted to the end. You do get pieces of him, but it's not as, uh, I guess, as, as you don't feel you have to know him as well as you do someone like Aemond. No. Um, I mean, really, it seemed like the noteworthy thing in terms of a shift was when he actually got crowned. Yeah. That that was kind of like a, hmm, sort of moment though obviously what we saw was that he was very ill prepared for it and was kind of just interested in the notion of being like in charge but not the task of doing it and now obviously the new transformation is well he's been horribly maimed by his own brother i think there's an element of him where he realizes oh like being loved and respected is actually really i really like this yeah um and of course where he is now the idea of being loved and respected seems like it's just not possible. How could someone ever, you know, have that opinion of me? And how can I facilitate myself such that it would want people to do that? Um, which is something that obviously we'll have to see how that plays out. Because, um, at least so far, his story is definitely not done. And what we you see that moment in episode nine where he he's so reluctant and he doesn't want this at all right until he gets the crown until he lifts up Blackfire and the entire crowd goes crazy for him and he's like holy shit this is really cool and then we see him through the first couple episodes of this season he like he desperately wants to be loved to the point where Otto's pissed off because he's telling the small folk he'll give them anything and everything yeah. they want just to make them happy and Otto's like uh you know we can't really do that we can't afford that you can't do all he can't make all these promises but Aegon really wants to be loved by everybody hashtag because he never got it going up mm. yes anyway uh the yeah the broad strokes of that scene i suppose is saying that uh laris is desperately trying to get Aegon back up and running for what purpose we can discuss slash speculate later for now going back to the old uh the docks on, I assume, Driftmark. Did we ever confirm exactly where these docks were? Anyone know? I think, this is, I think it's Driftmark, because as there are some docks, and they're in, in the book, they're supposed to be an actual, like, small little town on Dragonstone, but that's not really the way they've done it in yeah. the on-screen Game so. of Thrones world. Um, they are close but, by, uh, I think least, this, is, so. this is Driftmark, though. Yeah. So on there, uh, we're, we're further conducting the Dragon Seed plan. It's just sort of plot things, moving things forward. But we also get uh, Alan is asked about his potential considering the brother for claiming a dragon. And he says that he's uh, not interested. He's salt and sea. Which I think is an interesting reflection of the scene with Baylor where she says the reason why she wouldn't be Corliss's heir to Driftmark is because she's not salt and sea. It's uh, definitely going to be something that is on. I think Corliss's that's got to be an intentional parallel. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Yeah. So, when cause, I mean, Corliss now doesn't have an heir, right? I, like that's that's just mm -hmm. a reality. Um, now there is still um, Joffrey. You know, little Joffrey could potentially be that because everyone is pretending like he's an actual son of Lenor. Yeah. But uh, but Corliss doesn't really with everything he's lost. Right? He's lost everything. He's lost. He's, in, he's lost his wife, he's lost both of his kids. So now he actually does want someone who's his blood to take the to to take over for when he's gone. And he knows that person is Alan. And so actually. that leads us to our very first Raina running scene. Feels almost Raina running. Yeah. <laughs> There's only one or two, right? Where oh, just where were you where were you guys when you first 
when, when you saw your first Rain of Running scene? Because everyone remembers <laughs> where everyone they remembers were this, yeah, quite... when they I was sitting right yeah. here, yeah, so, three weeks ago or something. Uh, the way we did it last time, and we'll do it this way probably, is there's going to be about seven of these. We're just going to skip over the future ones because we'll instead discuss the plot of the whole thing here, right? So I don't know how they will run this in season three exactly. We all are cynical enough to guess that she gets to have the dragon and she gets to join the fight on the dragon, whatever. It would seem they want to try and justify that through saying she's gone through intense hardship and that is through the days and nights of walking desperately to find the dragon because the dragon, as she's grown up, is is like a sign of meaning in her life. It gives her purpose compared to the yeah. the, the boring notion of taking care of people. There is what we could call uh. writing there... There are, however, a significant amount of problems. Uh, I'll leave it open if anyone wants to go first on that one. I'll also add on to that a little bit. Like, not only is it important to have a dragon, but you kind of see what happens when you don't have a dragon and how she really is just kind of, like, she feels like an afterthought in a way. And she ends up kind of getting this task, which is an important one for Renera, but certainly it doesn't feel as important as some of the other things that are going on. You saw how Eamon felt in season one and how kind of shameful he was that he didn't have a dragon yet and what made him do that dangerous thing to try to claim Vagar the way that he did. Yeah. What, what I think would be, uh, one, hilarious, but two, um, actually interesting, was if she's gone through all this and she finds the dragon who's stealing the sheep who shall be remain nameless, <laughs> um, that if she gets rejected by a sheep stealer, I guess it won't remain won't remain nameless if she does all this and still doesn't get the dragon so I, it was that a big chance discussion. not 10 percent hey, fingers crossed well and, and and it's more than just a meme i think it would be much more meaningful to do it that way it's it, it actually it has a lot more standing in the story i think in a, in a world filled with people who are obsessed with dragons because of the power they represent a girl who's been given entrusted with more incredible weight. potential and incredible privilege yeah, and, she, and she's got a job to do that she doesn't recognize the importance of. She's, she finds yeah. it boring. Like, I get that. I understand why she feels that way. But at the same time, for her to then say, fuck it. And by the way, I don't know if the show is going to recognize this. We'll find out in season three. What she did was incredibly reckless and irresponsible to abandon her family without telling them where or what the fuck she's doing. And that's going to cause immense problems politically with the Eerie versus Dragonstone. Rhaenyra is going to be beyond upset if it was actually found out, considering the days that pass. Where the hell did she go? Lady Aaron is not going to fucking know what the hell is going on. Where did she go? Her men had she might to even be... get blamed for it. Well, it she it, should be blamed for it. it, it no, this doesn't make be, sense. Yeah. Like, what? It, how it, could it, her men not have been able to catch her? Without uh, spoiling anything that will happen in the future, like the the kids that that Rain is supposed to be watching are going to become extremely important in like a major confrontation that'll happen early in season three. It's not so like, like it, it wouldn't be a stretch a to say thing. they are incredibly important because of the, the future generation. They're going to be, they, they are inevitably important, but they're also her family, right? I'm trying to argue from a sense of uh, she should care about them. She clearly cares about herself. Like that's what the show is portrayed. And so she should be treated uh, consequently that way. Which means if the dragon were to eat her, it would be such a great commentary on like the failings of losing your way, not understanding the importance in the world of like certain roles and everything. Uh, yeah, something that makes you great isn't necessarily incredible power, the form of a dragon in this context, but the way that you treat your status in life, following through on your duties, your loyalty to your family and your support of them, knowing that very important things aren't necessarily seemingly glorious but they're very, very important nonetheless. You have a role to play, and, you know, you should, you know, honor your, you know, your parents if they're good, and all that stuff's being thrown by the wayside because it's all about just, like, wouldn't it be cool to have a dragon? And I, I want to see her punished for that, in a sense. I suppose it isn't interesting when you say all that, right? Because, like, really the whole point of Damon's arc is 
you have a role to play and you should be comfortable with that. But in her, in uh, this case, it's like, no, nice. get your bag, you know, get yeah. your dragon. Like, yeah, it, you know, you're yeah, right. Look, that would look at you know, it clash horribly. It's like orange juice and toothpaste with, well, uh, yeah, Eamon going and getting the dragon now at this point, I think it's safe to say is viewed broadly as a story of like, man, that was a bad thing, huh? Eamon has <laughs> made a series of horrible decisions with the strict goal of gaining everything he believes he deserves. Yeah. He believes he has uh, done all the work for. He's going to destroy his own house with some of the shit that he's doing. Like, and that, yeah, it's, that's it's interesting. All, you know, the pride cometh before the fall, pretty straightforward. But in this case, it's like, no, nah, you know, go get your dragon. Yeah, this, this feels what is like... It, <laughs> what is it, yeah, what does it mean to the story compared to the other people if she does get one? Because we don't even know, why does she, why does she want one? It seems to be that the reason she wants them is, it's not in service of some greater goal or some or some ability it's, to, it's to get power essentially she wants to have the same kind of power that everybody who has power a consideration yeah have. it's status it, it, yeah it, it, i would it, see i would say status more so than necessarily like power for reyna you can even go back to the conversations we saw with uh with lena back in pentos in episode one even like even child reyna is talking about that and how it kind of um like she feels unwanted because the, the people in Pentos are really obsessed with keeping Damon and Lena and Bela there because Bela has a dragon that will eventually grow up and they don't give a fuck about Reyna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's, she's trying her, to get her dragon to hatch and she, it's not happening. I mean, wouldn't want... you think that, wouldn't it be more interesting if, if you're being discarded or not treated seriously because you don't have a dragon so you Any find alternative you ways? Know? Yeah. Yeah, you find Make alternative ways to be super important. But no, Her. just go get that dragon. Uh, go yeah. run out into the wilderness and get it. I fucking hope she gets eaten messily. Messily also, devoured, yeah, as Calvin would yeah. say. It's been mentioned, it's just that it's such a such a wrong decision, and she's probably not even going to get chewed out for it um, if she gets that no. dragon. I hope she does no get way. chewed out. <laughs> that no, She will not be chewed out. No, th no, there will be no punishment. There will be no... It will all pan out. It'll all be great. Oh, you were so to brave dragon. to go out and do this, and da 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 And she comes back like, triumphantly. <laughs> Another dragon rider for my cause, blah blah blah. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, she'll be congratulated for it, if anything. Yep. Her want for a dragon strikes me as like her basically just wanting a cool toy. And <laughs> so, like, if she, yeah, if yeah, if, if she gets Which is it, exactly it's just like, congratulations, you got it. Like, I feel like if maybe she got like hideously burned or something, and then she came back to the dragon anyway with a newfound sense of like these things are creatures; they're a force of nature. And there's like a newfound respect. No time for that. Before. Maybe that could be redeemable. But if she just gets the dragon, I mean, if if What's her if her long <laughs> trek across you know the land and getting thirsty for a scene and having to sleep mm. like you know sleep she, outside she, she one night is is supposed to be justification for like wow she like worked so hard to get this she deserves it like I'm sorry the I don't power do that. Her will yeah <laughs> that's yeah. it she's so. Look at her guy, so brave going out there and doing that, bending our responsibilities. And as as we see later this episode, uh, well, and even a little bit in last episode, there's like all dragons are kind of different, and there's different ways that dragons feel uh, attached to people or like they should be ridden by this person. I don't know if Sheep Stealer is going to um, embrace Reyna or not. I hope not. Yeah, I um, hope not. I, I, I it put would it legitimately be better if she got just eaten, d devoured messily. I, I don't think that that's going to happen, uh, but I put it at like 15% that she doesn't claim. Um, and if that's the case, it could lead to something that's really actually compelling and interesting to have to deal with in the aftermath. Um, if she just claims it, I think it's going to be kind of stupid. Yeah, I mean, what if uh, the people people go out looking for her and they find her with the dragon and because they went to look for her and she's by the dragon the dragon ends up killing some of them and so she's brought upon in some way the deaths of deaths of people that she watched because yeah. this is what she went for like there's stuff we can do but obviously we've made no secret as to what we want and it would be uh it would be better in terms of the writing and the thematics and it wouldn't clash with what we're establishing with the other characters we wouldn't be wasting so much time and character. Because right now that's what her screen time represents. It's just wasted. 
doesn't do anything. They have made the same point with her almost every single scene she's in. It feels a little uh, amateurish for them. No, yeah. The last episode it. in particular it's is like uh, almost to the point of comedy. It's like Nori in Rings of Power. That whole first episode with her, it's just everyone telling her her own traits over and over and over every scene constantly. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, you guys suck. Well, it's just made more bizarre here when, you know, Oscar only got, what, like 10 minutes total screen time? Maybe, maybe 10? And look maybe, at how interesting maybe. that character ended up being. Yeah. Like, it's really not a matter of a lack of screen, uh, a lack of screen time or, well, there's so many characters that you can't make them all interesting. No, no, you, no, <laughs> I don't accept that. I don't accept that. Yeah, it's, it's like arguments from genre or something like that. It's like, well, it's a horror movie. It's a comedy. It's a da da da. We can't have, it can't be good because it's a this. It's like, no, come on. Don't give up. You're giving up before you even started. Well, I believe in you, you know? Yeah, I believe you in you. I, I believe Enough with this cuck energy. Character than this. The and irony like, still being, though, if she gets eaten, I'm okay with all of her scenes. Like, uh, yeah, like yeah. oh, there you go. Yeah, that fixes it. Yeah. It's so crazy because the character without a dragon surrounded by dragon riders feels like it should be such a layup yeah. in terms of like creating yeah. interesting thought processes and perspectives, but there's just nothing to really do here, I guess. Which I think the rider of Chief Sealer being Damon's daughter would also cause a big problem for a side plot. They'd have to make a massive change from the book. Um, so we got some some classism happening. Jace is like, what's with these mongrels, mother? Was this Lady Messaria's idea? Which is like the first inkling that, that you could have like, a, oh, can people shit on her who are in universe, please? Yeah, like we do? Do it. Come on. Just shit on her, Jace. Just, do, just do that. <laughs> every, every time. And uh, Rhaenyra describes them as courageous. And he's not taking it very well. And I think a lot of people would maybe edge toward being like, oh no, why is Jace being such a meanie? But it does make a lot of sense and makes for, honestly, a, one of the strongest scenes of the episode, I think. He yep. explains totally. that from his point of view, thanks to his hair slash heritage, uh, his dragon gives him a lot more legitimacy as a Targaryen. Whereas if we start tossing them to absolute randoms, it doesn't mean much of anything, actually. And it almost puts into question, once again, where it wasn't his legitimacy as heir to the throne. Which is a, a very valid point. It yes. completely undermines him. Um, and, 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 and of he, course... He really does throw it back at Rhaenyra a lot, too. Like, you, you, you did this. You're the one that made this decision and made me... Obviously, like, if he... If he didn't have sex with uh, with Strong, he wouldn't have been here anyway. But you know what I mean. If right. you hadn't have done these things, it wouldn't be in question. But I've had to deal with it all my entire life because of the things that you did. So this is actually, um, and it's going to come up later, uh, certainly the end of episode eight. This I like because it's reminding everybody of season one, where a lot of the issues in season two all stem from Rhaenyra's incredible fuck-ups. Uh, the, the, so including but not limited to having sex continuously with Harwin Strong and having three fucking children by him which meant it was going to cause insane strife for the entire kingdom uh, best exemplified by the Age of Driftmark the best episode of the series it's a serious fucking thing that ended with people dying because of the fact that the, their bloodlines are all fucked up uh, thanks mm -hmm. to her decisions now the defense of course a lot of people have is well Lado couldn't get it up for it. It's like, okay, find a fucking uh, solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, well, it's just the perspective is like, I don't care. Uh, people's life, the whole kingdom's at stake. Fucking do it. Yeah, at least cheat on a black guy. Come on. Let's just make it easy. Get, get a, get, draw whatever you need. So you can put that in front. Get a bag. Yeah. You know, just do whatever you need put to do. Put a little picture on the back of her head of some dude. Exactly. I don't know. So, yeah, you have all that, and, and it is nice to hear him directly call her out for those mistakes in season one, because um, you know not enough people do anymore. It's not recognized much. Not anymore. enough people do. That's right. Um, Don't forget the whole reason we're in this mess, essentially, to a great portion of it. Well, but, isn't it kind of funny that everybody remembers? It's like, ah, yes, Allison. She was like, ah, oh, you gotta Judy, and you gotta be. You gotta be upstanding, and now look at her. What a bitch. Everybody remembers <laughs> Allison's hypocrisy <laughs> and her mistakes, but nobody remembers any of Rhaenyra's bad choices. Rhaenyra can do anything she wants, so people just won't care. Um, and to be fair to Rhaenyra, she does highlight, we've not really got a choice on this one. 
Yeah, uh, which is Vagar is that's you know valid. They have way less dragons. Getting a bunch of dragon riders on their side, even if they're you know like even if they're not part of the uh, the noble houses or anything like that, it just completely turns the tides of the war. Yeah. And this whole thing was Jace's idea, if you remember, like back from episode yeah. six or whatever that was. It was like he's was. the one who wanted them, but once it becomes not noble houses, once it becomes bastards, he's a self hating bastard. Yeah, uh, because he knows what all of, what that all means to him. Now he's got a massive problem with it, and he's he's right. Like he has a, he he's bringing up a lot of good points that we may see in the future. I mean, the fact that you said, did it not cross your mind, like, what would happen by taking Harwin to bed, sort of thing, it, it, it's a hear from her own son with Harwin, the, like, what the fuck were you thinking doing this that? This is what you get for fucking my dad. Pretty much, which is uh, almost yeah. bizarre, but simultaneously <laughs> true. And, uh, yeah, it makes a really good scene. He's the actor, we've had nothing but praise for him throughout the whole season, he's done a really good job. Yeah, he's been very good. Um, I... I think he's um he's just one of those he's just a well a very well rounded part of the the not cast in terms of actors though he is but I mean in terms of all of the characters in this story he is one of those who is unlike anyone else really uh, and the way that he feels is easily informed um by his uh, very specific past um mm -hmm. you just you get a lot of variety uh here with with different characters so we got the, uh, Messaria gives the note to Alan, who gives the note to, well, it's just engaging Project Dragon Seed is beginning. We're getting all the, uh, information is getting out to everybody, and we got a scene of, uh, Ulf just hanging out in the old bar while, uh, people who are collectively deciding to start up some propaganda, like, you know, just, just trying to make it seem casual, being like, man, don't the throne people suck, and they're not taking care of us, and... Gosh, uh, we, we oh wait, sorry, that was that was already set. The the new thing is uh, collect, getting everyone information that they're looking for the dragon seeds. Sorry, so everyone needs to collect up. And be, sorry, what happens with Ulf is that he needs to uh, be convinced by his friends to yeah, the person who's been <laughs> bragging about being a Targaryen yeah. bastard to get free drinks for yeah. who knows how long is finally hey. You're one of these guys, right? Look at this. You can go claim a dragon. They're asking for people like you. Isn't that awesome? And he's like, uh. Yeah, that's so cool. But you know, my back is really hurting me, and uh, it's kind of a long trip, and I don't know. I'm trying to make every excuse in the world because he is a coward. It does if feel this funny. Pub gives free drinks I... to Targaryen bastards. They might go out of business. It feels funny that they would also... uh, uh, be peer pressured into going to try and claim a dragon. It's just like well, that's how he kind of ends that up. That is it. that is kind of a fun element because that would be something that uh, would happen to a real person. They'd be like, oh, uh, uh, okay, yeah. They kind of get. You know, pressured into it, and then you know. It's I also think though he's real realizing argument. that this is the point of no return for his tall tales. It's like, well, I mean, I, I'm if I just say, hey, like it's not true. I, I was lying that whole time. I can never come back here, and this is where I spend most of my time. Well, if he, if he, de either way, if he declines the opportunity to actually use what he's been bragging about, then, then if he keeps bragging about it then that'll just look bad because they'll say, well, mm -hmm. you had the opportunity to go get a dragon and you didn't do it, Mr. I'm a Targaryen. Yeah. So either way, Ulf is like, shit, it's, it's time to pay the piper. And maybe you could look at like a... his whole tailor and everyone just tells him fuck off whenever he says any like, big stories he has or whatever. There may be a sense of fuck it as well. Like, let's go see what this is all about. We're going to go to Dragonstone and apparently there's a chance I can get a dragon. Which uh, I think your average guy just drinking a pub could feel in a moment that that's an awesome thing without properly recognizing what that might mean. Yeah, that's true, too. And then we get cut, so we get a scene for old Hugh, who explains his backstory finally, who, which is that there was, you have Jaehaerys, Jaehaerys' daughter, one of his daughters, it was like Sarah a, is, yeah, a bit of a yeah. bit of a crazy one, bit of a nutcase, did, did, it, wacky. It, it, this is kind of a wild, like this was a wild reveal, like for the show to do for book readers, um, because uh, yeah, Sarah Targaryen was one of the I think ten children of Jaehaerys, mm -hmm. and she like notoriously she kept fucking around, she kept fucking people. They tried to they tried to like lock her away for a while to keep her out of it. Eventually she escaped and she went across the narrow sea and she was like rumored to just be in uh in whorehouses and stuff like that. 
and so and, had a kid hey. who said no, looked no different than Viserys or Damon. Whoa. Yeah, like you, you look exact. She she says something like, "You remind me so much of my brother's children," um, which and that and that's the way people were able to put together that it's actually Sarah Targaryen. Yeah, he said he's just kept it to himself because he was kind of ashamed of it. But now this could be really important. He said, "If I get a dragon, you could be made a lady." And uh, his wife's like, I don't give a fuck. I don't want to be a widow, which is possibly the most rational thing. <laughs> like, yeah, in terms of, you understand what happens if you get a fucking dragon, or if you try to claim one. But uh, you can tell, uh, because of what's happened with Hugh's daughter, who is now dead. I, I think this is the scene where you find that out. Yes. It's, uh, so sad, I, I suppose, no. yeah, I suppose it's, she died shortly after they tried to leave the city. They well, yeah, get and, and unfortunately, just before they got that bit of uh, food, I'd imagine. I assume she died of the sickness, not of starvation. Um, uh, I, I guess it's, we can't know for sure because uh, they did seem to imply they had like nothing, and the, the, the uh, I always I was under the impression that she would have likely been strong enough to survive the illness had they had food. Yeah, maybe. Uh, certainly didn't help. Which. Yes, uh, just puts forward that we got Ulf and Hugh are on the way. Um, what, Ryan, would be your take on what Laris's involvement is in all of this? Do you think he knew about the Dragon Seed stuff, or do you think he just let this sort of slide, or do you think he's not really doing much of a good job as Master of Whispers because he's busy? It, that's kind of that. The latter one is kind of where I'm at with this, with a lot of these things. It feels like Laris has become so preoccupied with his plan, because obviously it's more to the plan than just getting him to walk. As we see in the next episode, mm. they, they probably had a lot of things set up for him to escape. Um, I think he's much more concerned with that than actually doing his role, his job as Master of Whispers. Um, but certainly there's no definitive anything in here. You would imagine with, I mean, I would how, agree. with how we saw Laris, Laris be able to find out about so many things through season one and a lot of this season as well, that if all this stuff was going down, um, especially with the propaganda they've already been like subject to, I would imagine he would have known about this if he was, you know, doing his normal job. Yeah. The fact the show doesn't really say anything about it only really leads me to believe that he just didn't know um, he was doing other stuff and we've seen kind of what he's focused on. Mm -hmm. And I also wonder if you're Laris, what advantage do you get by facilitating the other side getting way more dragons and you being an active participant helping them do that? Um, is if, if the idea here is that I'm Laris, I'm cool, I helped you out with this, wink, wink, don't forget that I'm the one who helped you get all these, you know, this, this extra dragon power, then that would be something the show would have to say that, this is something that he would want to message them about or let them know. But without anything there, I cannot by any means reasonably extrapolate that that's what's happening. Which pushes us along to the big old dragon seed stuff, which is where it's all building up. Uh, which opens with the dragon keepers essentially saying, we're done with this crazy shit. We don't like what you're up to, Rhaenyra, and what happened before was fucked up, but this is even more fucked up. We're done. We're out. We're not playing this game. Which was, um, I guess, an GG. interesting consequence. That they... I think so, too. Had this reaction. Before this, I yeah. don't think they've really been... They've never really had much of a perspective. They haven't... Uh, they've kind of just been taking care of the dragons, working with the crown and the dragon rider people. They haven't really been, like, characters... I guess that's uh, so the nature of it, though, right? The the their lack of perspective is their perspective. It's like we don't this we don't like this politics shit. We don't like that you're involving the dragons in this. They're above this. Fuck you. Yeah, true. It's, yeah, uh, they said stop making dragons political. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, they, that, that is a, they, they care about the dragons I mean, and they care yeah. about the history and the legacy and like all of these things. Um, well, yeah, we have got a little bit of insight into the 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 dragon keepers. Including the in the last episode, which was we got the reveal that they all carry dragon glass daggers on them in case they get yeah. caught on fire so they can kill themselves, which is wild. Mm -hmm. um, but the, an interesting little note. One of the things I noticed was uh that the lesser skilled or the newer ones, the ones that were in training, they had much longer sticks, much longer sticks to use, so that there was more distance between them and the dragons. 
um, probably because they wouldn't be as good as the more elder dragon keepers. So little things like that where you could sort of just pick up on like, oh, hey, there's probably like a whole story. This is I can believe that this is an old organization that's revered and respected and they take their job seriously. And there's more beneath the surface than what we get. Here also, Rhaenyra appeals to like, oh, we're favored by the gods. That's how all these people are here. The dragon rider guy in High Valyrian just says, you brought these people here. Mm. You favor yourself. Yeah, and that is, again, I think that's one of the seeds that they're kind of planting moving forward, including even the title of the last episode, or of the of the final episode, the queen who ever was. This Thinking that it's her fucking destiny and prophecy to be doing this. Yeah, she's yeah, definitely buying the- into it. The dragon keeper's upset at Rhaenyra, and he's like, look, all these people you brought here, they haven't even run around in the wilderness for two days. They haven't done that a <laughs> single time yet. They can't be worthy of a dragon. And so, uh, not going to have their help. Not that it would make necessarily much of a difference, considering what we saw last time with uh, what happens when they get declined. So, they're out. I wonder if there'll be more on that uh, as the season as season three happens like i wonder if the dragon keepers are gone entirely which would probably be bad for the overall sort of care of the dragons in general especially with all the information they take with them right all of their knowledge and experience yeah, how to train them the 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 knowledge of the language how to handle dragons the 99.9 percent of the time you're not using the dragon it needs to be you know it needs to be fed it needs to be taken of, care yeah. of mm-hmm. yeah it needs to not um, be pissed off yeah, that too. Um, she gives a huge speech involved in it. Is basically like this could kill you, uh, but the ultimately, you know, when it comes to starvation, war, and everything you could imagine, we're aiming to end that. If we can create a big enough side with more powers, including these dragons, then we can we can just stomp the enemy, and it's going to be over. That'll be great. First dragon is Vimithor. He's pretty big. And uh, we're going to go to him right now. It's very... Uh, the thing I was struck oh. by, of course, was like, whoa. Okay. We, fast. Yeah, like, it feels feel like, like we need to do a hell of a lot more. You gotta, you no, gotta, there's no uh, training uh, camp. There's no, like, like there's no like, seminar. You, also need to, you need to vet whether or not any of these people would be on your side or if they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll help you. And then as soon as they get the dragon, they're like, bye. Fuck <laughs> you. I'm living on this. <laughs> and then it flies away with it. Exactly. Which is like... Which is kind of what a lot of people have been telling Rhaenyra this entire time. Um, and b- before they do walk in there, she gives some speech to like convince them to fight for her, basically by saying that, you know, I, I, th- that she cares about like their families and that she really does like it matters to her. Basically, her just telling lies about the small folk mattering to her when Damn. she's the one that's been setting this blockade. She's the one that's been doing all of these things to make things worse for them. Yeah, she sees them as 50 dice rolls. It's just like, well, let's see what we get. Let's hope for the best, because it's, uh, as much as she's telling them they're all a part of a bigger thing, it's going to be super important. She wants to skip to collecting the dragons and then solve the problems that would come later, because first and foremost, we need to know who you're loyal to, and we need to know whether or not you understand the situation. Like, you need to make very, very clear to these people, you are very, like, 90-plus percent chance of dying here. We have no reason to think otherwise. Are you ready for that? And the thing is, if they're not, they should probably be disqualified anyway, because that's almost what will get you killed straight away, is fearing death. Exactly. And as was mentioned the last time, they're going to harm the chances of the potential successful ones by pissing a dragon off. Exactly. The loyalty and, uh, I guess, zeal, we need to sort both of those out. They should be both two huge filters. And then just generally have a chat with them. Imagine you come across a guy who's just like, I just want to do some killing. Just love me some killing. He'd be like, oh. oh yeah, or he's a guy from, uh, forget about the badge. When do we get the freaking guns? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably don't want that guy having a dragon, maybe. I'm so. added up the hill with ya, Rowells. <laughs> <laughs> of which there should be many for this sort of circumstance. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if it's a miss on the writers or if the writers are trying to tell us is not interested in any of that. She wants to get those dragons uh, claimed as soon as possible. The sooner the better, yeah. Because, uh... A lot of yeah, I I think that this plan, the the way that this whole plan is sort of presented in the show, it makes it really difficult for me to still be thinking Rhaenyra is like a serious character. 
Um, it's just, I think it's just damage. It's too it quick. It is goofy it's and too foolishly done. Goofy is a way to describe it, yeah. Recovering from it would have to have involved, and I think the perfect character, of course, would be Corliss, saying, What the fuck was that? Like, what? What did you do? You just killed all of these people. And then she could say, you know, it was necessary. That's what the the gods have decided that this is this is the way that you know blah blah blah. And you should be like, no, you killed them all. And you didn't have to, because uh, as was mentioned, right? You might have conducted this if you were doing it. If you were Rhaenyra, you clear them all through those filters, and then you go, right? Who wants to go first? And then you send them through. You don't have them all go through because um, Hugh and o Ulf being the two. Flamers here both nearly die uh, when Vermithor kills exactly. the first guy. The way that it was done Basically was incredibly luck. incompetent. It was um, like lucky they were alive to then, you know, essentially demonstrate their worth to those dragons because they could have easily been blasted by the like the big flame. Yeah, mm. it was luck that they lived essentially. And when I saw luck, everyone getting, yeah. you know, going out there to the platform like this and just one big clump, I'm like, what? This isn't how you would do it. Why it would wouldn't be, it be one at a time? One at a time in a more controlled and chill environment, not, hey, dragon, here's a whole bunch of people. Don't freak it, out or anything. It, it, it's like she was hoping that it would happen the same way it happened to, uh, not Lenor, uh, to Adam, right? That the dragon would see all these people and just choose one of them. Choose one that works. I'll take that one. He looks and nice. And it ends up being a disaster. <laughs> he looks gay. Well, because the thing about that is uh, I would believe that that's what Rhaenyra thought was going to happen more if she didn't say who's first. You know, like as if the claiming yeah. was on the people themselves to go and give it a shot when she knows that you can give it a shot and end up with a fucking blast of dragonfire. So maybe, you know, it doesn't look great on, on Rhaenyra's character and she's going to receive nothing but like essentially praise for having made this bold decision. I know that uh, the internet fucking adores this sequence as well as, like, there's things I really like about it, but of course, in relation to her character, like, what a bold move that worked out really well. Good stuff. Queen of the Dragons, well, you know? Well, well, you see, like, Masaria looks very disturbed by what's happening at some point. They don't bank on that. But, but then she doesn't say anything on the, in the next one. I don't um, think anything you're... comes of it. Yeah. Well, it, it, not, not in the next episode. Um, and then Hugh, like, honestly, when Hugh claims Vermithor, like, he looks up at Renera, who's up on top, who's just, like, staring down at this pile of burning and dead bodies, like, this terrible thing that's just gone on, and she looks, like, extremely happy. Yeah. Right? And you feel like that he might have some sense of what this means going forward. Um, and that doesn't necessarily get addressed in the next episode, but certainly the confrontation they have at the dinner table in the next episode with Jace and Renera and them talking about it, kind of does seem to give them both a little bit of pause. Him and Ulf. Well, and the, flip... You mentioned the, the, the part where Masari is looking out over this and she looks uneasy and that just doesn't lead anywhere. It's so bizarre because of how I mentioned before, she's supposed to be like, yeah, I want what's best for the little guy and Rhaenyra's what's best for the little guy, so I'll be with her in whatever mm. way that still exists in the story or whatever her character is or isn't. It seems like that's an element of who she is in her backstory that's been completely dropped. Because you would think that this would this would revolt Masaria watching all of this happen. Like, oh shit, like look at all of these, you know, people just getting barbecued. Like, fuck me. Did I am I did I did I just sign with a, a different flavor of tyrannical crazy person? But yeah, it doesn't she, go anywhere. It uh, just uh, doesn't happen. Then then becomes of it. Even if her conclusion was, no, she's good, we should have that question you know that should be there should be a scene for it surely yeah yeah she goes to Rhaenyra and be like well was it worth it or something like that and they they have a discussion on the the price of what it costs and if you're willing to do it once what's to stop you from doing something like this again if the if your cold calculus means that oh some people have got to burn or whatever how many times will that you know math have to happen and they could have a whole discussion, and there would be no yeah. kissing at all, and it would be interesting. Not to mention, but, uh, she well, could just happen. criticize her outright for being like, "Did you just, did you just feed your dragon? Like, what was that, is that what that was? Like, what? Why did you do it that way? You didn't have to do it that way, but you did. It seems uh, you kind of fucking hated them somewhat. But um, to flip from criticism to praise, while uh, I don't know how much longer you've got, Ryan, but I was going to talk about um, Vermithor is fucking badass in this scene, uh, to say the least. Oh, cool. God, he looks yeah, amazing. Cool dragon. Uh, he is that is, imposing. And like, there, 
Dude, nothing but praise for the the way that all the different dragons have been depicted, both looks wise, personality wise, the sounds that they make, they're all so distinct. Mm-hmm. And it, even like you very much get the uh, get the vibe in, in that they're going for in this scene, the difference between how Vermithor responds to Hugh versus how Silverwing responds to Ulf and the different things that dragons uh, uh, you know care about. Um, when they're looking for somebody to that they feel is a per- person worthy of riding them, and to see Hugh, you know, at the end of the day, just be like the bravery and the willingness to fucking die and stand his ground and sit there and scream at the dragon, come on, really gains Vermithor's respect. Um, and he just looks scary as fuck. He's like a big old dinosaur, um, and he's awesome. I can't wait to see him in action. Oh yeah. <clears throat> the bronze fury um before you go then if uh if you want since we we would have done this at the end but you've got to head out what uh do you have any comments on hot d season two overall and its reception yeah so i think that overall as a season i still think it was a a, a good season in totality um certainly some disappointing things and a very blue balls ending some things that have come out in the aftermath uh, maybe make that make a little more sense. Certainly no excuse, but uh, they they were filming this thing. This is one of the only things that got filmed during the strikes when the, the writers and actors strikes were going on. But since they were UK actors, they could still they could still act. But uh, they couldn't write while they were filming this entire thing. And during the filming, it, like as they started filming is when HBO came down and said, hey, we don't have the budget to put what is in all likelihood going to be one of the most badass battles we've ever seen into season two. You'll have to save that for season three because it was supposed to be 10 episodes and uh, they ended up cutting it down to eight. Um, So maybe that is why this feels like the eighth episode of a 10 episode season, but all we can do is judge what we have, not what could have been step down from season one. I still think there's a lot of good in house of the dragon season two and to see people online that are so brain dead and brain rotted that are trying to compare this to the acolyte or trying to compare this <laughs> to Ugh, game of thrones season eight I, I think those people are truly insane, insane. or retarded that's, or yeah, both. that's nuts seek help but it, it is it's just something i've it's an overreaction from everybody involved i think um definitely could have been better the ending certainly could have been better one bad scene as well at the very end that left, leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. Overall, I think when people see the trailer for season three, uh, they're probably going to get hyped again to come back in and watch House of the Dragon. So, I guess, yeah, those are my thoughts, I guess. I think that's fair. And uh, thank you for joining us. And, well, I'll see yeah, you around, nice wherever it may be. Talking to you, Ryan. No problem. Sorry I have to bounce, but uh, good hanging with you guys as always. I'll see you later. See you, dude. See you, see you later. Later. Bye, bye. See ya. Adios. Well, now we can have real discussions now that he's gone. So, uh, yeah, the scene is so cool because it's like a horror scene with a dragon. You got about 50 fucking people who are just running, screaming, burning while he's very casually and almost happily just picking away at them like Happy Meals. It's just like there's some fries, some chicken nuggets. Yum. This is neat. <laughs> and, well, it's uh, like uh, you if you've played Minecraft, if... Uh, if you if you light if you light a chicken on fire it'll run around until it burns to death and when it dies it drops cooked chicken instead of Jesus. raw chicken oh. and that's what's happening yeah, here. That's what they're supposed to do. he's, he's just playing minecraft too. with all these nice people well, there'd, there'd be a lot of pickups down there after this oh yeah week. oh yeah i can picture him doing like a hoover maneuver just... <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, this arguably backfires, though I think Rhaenyra treats it almost as a, well, this is happening and this was always what was going to happen, and that's... Which is a massive cope. Yes. Uh, you could have done a better massive job cope. than this. Yeah, um, you could have done a whole lot, but you could have had him sign waivers, done a seminar, had a little lesson in Dragon 101. You could have had a little sock puppet of Vermithorn been like, rawr, yeah. rawr, rawr, and then... Yeah, like, I want you to... You got, like, the little Thanos head cut out, and it's... 30 feet off the ground is like, okay, like, you know, now practice. What are you going to do? And da, 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 you know, Maybe or, or tell people this Ohiris. or tell them what to, what is a dragon looking for? What, what, how yeah. should you behave? Fearlessness what seems to be the do? number one trait. Yeah. Instead of just uh, figure it out. 
And and Don't honestly, die. yeah, you. I wouldn't have minded having Corliss test them all out himself, as in like scaring the shit out of them with a, some kind of speech about whether or not they're ready. And you know, we could have yeah, a montage and that of it. Out yeah, instantly a whole bunch of. Oh, that would have been that could have been a that could have been Game of Thrones humor too. That would have been an appropriate way to have that Game of Thrones style humor, where I guess House sorry House of the Dragon style humor, where you get their reactions to what he's saying. <laughs> And it's edited in a way where it's like this person, then this person, this person. And some of them go through, some of them pack up and leave, you know, that kind of thing. And it would have made me believe that, oh, they are taking this seriously. It's not just rolling the dice. It is more like educated rolling the dice. They're preparing these people. When you have like a fat people. one who says, is there bed and breakfast while we're here? And Corliss is like, ugh. And he just gives them the look and then it cuts yeah. to the next person. <laughs> just um, stuff like that. But yeah, it does damage to Rhaenyra because like, She's she's taking this seriously, but she's not doing it in a serious way. So that creates this weird, like, uh, in my head. Do you want this to work or not, woman? Well, you get first guy's scared, and then the result of that is the dragon uses fire, and then everyone gets scared, and the dragon's like, well, fuck all of you, I guess. Boom. <laughs> I'm eating you all. You're all, you're all scared little humans, you know? Uh, it, it's something to um, have drawn now from all the different examples of dragon claiming they've had. That dragons have feelings, and I think that when you're terrified in front of them, they see that almost as an insult somewhat. Like, you're not, you're treating me like a horrifying animal, not as a respectable creature that with, you know, our combined might we can rule the skies, some kind of Darth Vader speech. Instead, it's like, eh, you're kind of, actually, you're kind of embarrassing. I want to eat you, because you suck. You're not, like, interesting to me, and you yeah. kind of, being scared of me doesn't impress me. It's kind of actually lame. It smells like bitch in here. Exactly. And uh, we've seen that pretty consistent. I think uh, the first one being Aemond claiming Vega was, in retrospect, it's just a cooler scene the more time goes on, knowing how difficult this is and how daunting. Because Aemond would have been more than familiar with how many people have died doing this, but he still oh, yeah. did it. Uh, Vega testing the hell out of him. And then, of course, you get the, um, the way that Sea Smoke chose Adam, and then we have the Stefan Darklin you know, trying to come through for his queen, but ultimately his fear got the better of him sort of thing. And now this is happening. And they show us uh, a moment here where Hugh is desperately just trying to survive um, and has an opportunity to like hide behind a rock and then try to escape with uh, some lady. But Vimithor spots him, goes to eat them, and he pushes her away while essentially leaping to the side himself, saving them both. And by the time he brings himself back together as he gets back up. He spots that she's about to die. Vimithor's gonna chow down, possibly burn her, and he's like, you know what? Fuck this. No. And he gives a, not necessarily a speech, but essentially a pitch. Like, I, this, this is insane. Stop. Let's, let's, let's fucking go. Let's do this. All right? Fuck it. I'm ready. Let's go. Because, uh, I think they've given us enough backstory for him that he's so desperately interested in actually making a change in his life for the better, and that gradually over this scene possibly recognizing what needs to be done with this creature especially if this is a possibility to claim a dragon this is what maybe needs to be required and so it shows arguably more than any other one we've seen before a very desperate bit of courage it's a very and, yeah uh, it's a very ag aggressive desperate kind of but earnest display mm -hmm. um it's, it's got that that tinge that, that that bit of heroism where he went out there to save the lady and then he was willing to basically double down and do it again. Um, two big risks back to back. He's not running away. He's facing it. And um, it's very, it's really neat to see. Very fantasy. In, in, this yeah, it is. in this confrontation, the dragon is now sure that, that him out of everyone that's there is the person to go with and is a worthy investment. Because yeah. I would think the dragons, they, they want to go out there. Whenever they go out flying, they're... They're probably out there to fight, and so and they probably like fighting to a degree, and they want their rider to not be afraid to go into any fights. Like they don't want conflicting orders. Like if you know if they see the dragon sees something like like they can do a dragon they can fight or an army they can take down. They don't want their rider pussing out saying turn around no land <laughs> like like that would just be annoying it's to dangerous. the dragon. The dragon would probably eat them, like well, I think find they, somewhere to land and just get rid of them. There's some kind of magic to it. It, it. it seems they appreciate the actual connection, the relationship with the dragons. They like having a rider, it seems. Yeah. But it has to be the right kind of it's rider. It's like a, 
They're like they're like realistic Pokemon. <laughs> and in this case, it's just yeah, what he saw there was like, man, that was pretty. That was pretty based. Not gonna lie, just sort of going <laughs> out and saving that lady. Uh, and and also the the really cool thing with the the uh the shot, it it feels like it hangs on it for long enough that you're you're still like kind of in suspense and wondering was this actually enough, especially when it zooms in. Uh, on Hugh, and you can't see Vermithor anymore, and you're like, "Oh shit, what's uh, what's?" It really plays on the on the the nature of how suspenseful this is. That it's like a full blown minute there that he's sort of that they're going, "Hmm, do I like you? Yeah, I think I like you. Yeah, I like you. Come on, buddy, <laughs> let's let's go and take the world on together." Right. They can and they can play with that tension because they've done that before and gone the other direction. Exactly. Like the, the first batch of people. Where it's like it lingers way too long, and you're just like, "This isn't gonna go well, is it?" And then they all get heated. Ryan mentioned before that uh, the the way that they managed to it's it's one thing that they all have really distinctive, unique designs. That's one thing, but it is also the way in which they've imbued them with personality. Because I definitely get the sense Vermithor kind of has like a shit eating grin to me. He kind of looks a bit cheeky almost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like that's the impression I get about his personality. <laughs> Um, and, and it's, it's cool that that's able to be conveyed. So instead of them just coming across as like kind of mindless monsters, that's absolutely not the case at all. They have a temperament. Um, they, yeah, they, they, they yeah. feel like living beings that have a perspective in the way that, you know, in the way that animals do in a, in their own kind of way, a perspective on how the world is and how they want to interact with it and what kind of interactions they want to have with people. Uh, it's 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 really impressive work that they've done. When it feels it feels like a delivery on the promise of what the show is about, right? Of it's House of the Dragon. I know the meme for Game of Thrones was about when were the dragons going to show up and whatever. Um, definitely <laughs> feels like here it, when they get here. here. Yes, there will be dragons. Then. There will be a lot of them, and they will be really cool and unique. And you'll remember their names and what they look like. And the CG is fabulous. It oh yeah. looks really. It looks really good. Um, just the design of it, the the way that it's just all composed together, the way that the actors kind of it, it's sort of the unspoken part of having it be convincing is the way that the actors will act in in opposition to it. Um, how it's treated in the world as being serious. Um, so totally well, buy into it one hundred percent. They can sort of oscillate between having them feel like really tangible parts of the world and then um. To jump ahead a little bit, the the reveal of Silverwing, it almost feels like it's, it's like it's, it's it, grand. I don't know if grand is the right word I'm looking for, but definitely uh, the whole awe inspiring very much feels like beyond the scope of reality. Uh, you know, like to to bounce between that right, the awe inspiring nature of them, and hey, they're they're like real and tangible, and and they feel like they exist. Yeah, a really this, interesting this sh- variable for the universe because they're well integrated. This show came out at a good time alongside the development of Unreal Engine 5, which is just so sophisticated now. What they do with the volume. Is that what they use? Everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, it's well. hey. crazy what indie developers are doing that with some of the first person shooters that are being made with UE5 yeah. now, too. It's yeah, Having a game that looks incredible is not something you need a $200 million budget for anymore. Mm hmm. And, really um, I am, uh, appreciate the shot with Silverwing as well when he enters the room. That I think if you you might just miss, he blends style. in a little bit. Yeah, blends in. Actually, in consideration cool. of how much the show uses Unreal Engine as well, it's I think it deserves props for how good the lighting in the show is. Because when yes, you're, when it's so the lighting. effects heavy, it's e- it's easy to fuck up the lighting and make it look unnatural. Yeah, um, uh, if you don't. They, if you don't give they stuff the proper it. lighting, it doesn't, it stands, like, you know, you, I mean, you know this, uh, a lot of people who, if you're familiar with video games, a lot of the times, if the lighting isn't done quite right, it's easy to pick out, like, characters or, or things in the environment because they have a bit of extra gleam or shine or something to them, Absolutely. and they stand out, so. Well, yeah, it's the reason yeah. why lighting, lighting is, like, super underrated. Um, the reality is, like, when people look at video games and say they're photorealistic, it's like, they're not even, like, close, really, to what you can achieve with, like, pre-rendered visual effects and stuff like that. Uh, but the lighting can really go a long way. Um, you look mm-hmm. at something like Dead Space, right? 
the lighting oh, is, like, is, uh, is phenomenal and it really does a lot of work like the reflections and ambient occlusion uh stuff like that is a uh, is like super important in terms of selling it in in the case here a lot of it is just some really inspired cinematography like mm -hmm. this shot of um of the, of silverwing the reveal it's like this is this is a beautiful shot it looks like a painting yeah and yeah, sometimes shot... great great lighting in this show is the lack of lighting i mean this is a show yes. that is not afraid to have people in silhouette which right. is like the opposite of a show like Rings of Power, which has lighting that is absolute dog shit. And it looks like everybody look, is being lit from just off like camera by TV. like a fluorescent lamp. CSI yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It looks so flat. Um, Ulf's success with Silver Wings is actually pretty welcome, I would say, in terms of a change. It's uh, at this point, you wouldn't necessarily want to have another character that goes, I'm here and I'm going to claim you, dragon, because I'm not afraid. It'd be like, it would be fine in terms of continuity, but it's just like, it would be cool to see a different way of something like this happening. And what they show us here is that Ulf has been terrified by Vermithor and then stumbles his way into another dragon's cave and before even turning around has realized the situation he's in. And the way that they portray it, both the actor and just the tone of the scene, is very much like a, well, I'm dead. That's that. It's over. Yeah. And uh, he's uh, not... Sort of acceptance. Yeah, he's not doing the usual sort of like, oh my god, run away, like terrified sort of thing. He's also just, well, that's it then. And uh, it looks like that impresses Silverwing, or at least uh, gives a pause for thought. It's like, what are you, uh, like what's this guy? What's he doing? I like that Silverwing nudges him like three times, like, hey, you, you gonna do something? <laughs> huh? You wanna claim yeah. me? Bet you do. <laughs> yeah, but it's the, almost um... like the, the nudging prompts no running away or anything, just him to lay down that he goes, yeah, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> this is fine. We can both have a little lie down for a minute. How about that? And uh, yeah, it just feels like a dynamic way of a claim to take place that doesn't breach anything I think that we've come to understand about them. It's uh. It's a, it's a really neat way to give as well, uh, you know, especially considering the scene that's about to come up. Feels like the village drunk just got access to an AC-130. It's insane. It, uh, <laughs> yeah, there is an element of, we'd mentioned it before, like how interesting would it be if as a result of Rhaenyra's, uh, we'll, we'll call it a gambit here, um, if it produced this super wild card of the guy who claimed the dragon is just sort of, who knows what he's up to? Who knows what he wants? Is he in it for himself? Is he in it for... I don't know. So that is going to be something going forward that I think we... I don't even know what to expect, but that's kind of what I really enjoy about that dynamic. Mm -hmm. It's like classism in a way that we don't even have in our own real life, because you'd have your lower, middle, and upper classes, and then there's the dragon rider class above those, and where Ulf's just gone from basically bottom rung to the very top rung. Instantly, yeah. Mm. And so, uh, we cut over to the old, another uh, wonderful, oh, just for the record, I know it's been mentioned, but Silverwing looks fucking amazing, just, uh, just saying. Yes. Yeah, one of my favorite designs, I think. Which feels like it's hard to say because there's so many cool ones, but I really Those like horns. Silverwing. They yeah. look, the dragons look very dragony, but not in the basic bitch generic kind of way. I think even the more generic design, one could say like more familiar take Sea Smoke, for example, still looks fucking badass, even though it's much more recognizable as a dragon design. Um, someone like a Silverwing feels like a variation that just. They nail the... It's so imposing. Um, and a lifelong live sort of thing. There's so much to say about all of them for the, the design efforts they did, yeah, and I'm very glad they did it. Yeah, it's the silhouette and the profile. I think in particular you have... Uh, Damon's dragon's name is Cyrax? Caraxes. 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 Has that like serpenty kind of look with uh, wings on the on its back feet, and the way that it moves through the air is like a, it, it's it's a it's serpentine in that kind of a way, and it has this very unique appearance and profile and way of is moving. Serpentine. Just... Wait, sorry, is serpentine descriptive of a way that something looks? Or I thought serpentine was the movement, like a I... serpent. I so think it, could it, be would, both. it would apply to I both. think Serpentine maybe, maybe is, is both like a serpent. Uh, I uh is... my understanding was in Archer when um when when he was on top of the train and uh he had his babu, the ocelot, and he told him to serpentine, yeah. which is 
moving it's, left and right, like to avoid being hit. You know, kind of like how everyone was shouting it's at Rickon in the Battle so. of the Bastards. Okay. Yeah. Like Rickon, okay. run Serpentine. Yeah, if only You'd he still did. still be alive. You learn something new. Every serpentine day. describes that style of movement, and then describing something as Serpentine describes All one right. of a bunch of different collection of qualities you might describe to something that is snake like. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, um, Cyrax is probably, funnily enough, the least favorite, but still a favorite. They're all favorites. It's just uh, if there was a leaderboard, Cyrax okay. would probably on the bottom of it. I even cool think... if there's one friendly looking one, like Dragonite from Pokemon. Or like... <laughs> like a chill chill. Yeah, hey, Dragonite. Bar yeah, yeah, we yeah. got the feeling. Barney, <laughs> Barney the dinosaur, like where she's well. like very, looks very like soft round human. edges. Yeah. Big eyes. <laughs> I'm a dragon, technically. Makes like rubber ducky sounds. He flies. <laughs> I love you. He, he doesn't shoot fire. He shoots like rainbows and stuff. Yeah, the flames heal. Yeah, the flames heal you. Yeah, it's like yeah, a healing good mist. Dragon. Okay, <laughs> I'm just trying to help our rather negative <laughs> reputations. Um, Can I have the friendly one? No, you got to pick one of the mean ones. Sorry. So we cut over I really to... want the friendly one, though. I'm everyone's <laughs> friend. We're already friends. And maybe that's the cannibal and nobody just talks to him, you know? Who knows? Oh, they that could would make him really creepy. One. Yeah, if the one that was supposed to be really friendly and approachable was actually the cannibal. Oh, that's... I oh, I like that. I like that dynamic. <laughs> uh, we'll over on the Green Council meeting, ever. we have... Uh, the the declaration that Lord Ormond Hightower is making slow progress because he's been threatened on two fronts by armies allied with House Beesbury, which I think is probably the line to inform us of um, uh, at least strong speculation on what happened to Otto. Um, a lot of people are assuming Otto is with the Beesbury's as opposed to Laris, as opposed to anybody else necessarily. That seems to be a likely guess. Um, in happier tidings, Prince Daeron's dragon Tessarion has last taken to wing and uh, is expected to join the fight, which is, is I guess, news of, uh, you know, the Greens need some wins. They need to stack up a, a win or two because they're, they're going to be losing out in a, in a, what's very obviously in a second. Because, um, well, while um, this before is... You go on, how long does that take? Have I, I've, I may have asked this before, but how, about how long does it take for a dragon to hatch? to be like flying fighting age it is inconsistent okay all right i don't know if it's supposed to be inconsistent or not as in different dragons take longer to grow but um drogon grew real fucking quick the um explanation ryan gave on when we were talking about it on uh, nerdrotic's channel was that the more that they are flying around doing action-packed things the faster and bigger they'll grow and that's why Drogon was big and fast because oh he was constantly Oh my god, they are like use. Pokemon, holy shit. But that doesn't line <laughs> up fully. Up rack up experience. That doesn't line up fully Give with a lot of A bunch of, of rare what, candies. Uh, we know about a bunch of different dragons. For example, Sheep Stealer has been fully wild for as far as I'm aware, its whole existence. And it's not bigger than several dragons. I think would even be younger than it. So it, it really does feel like the show writers, they pick and choose what they want the sizes to be at what times. It's probably okay. going to be writing related, as in like what they want for the story at the time, because um, Vermax, hmm. Arax, and Tessarion should all be, I would have thought, bigger uh, for all of their ages, but they decided to not do it. I know that a lot of people online complain that Cyrax is way smaller than she should be. Um, can't speak to that myself. Obviously, all of us are very happy with the size of Vagar. There's no real worries there in terms of what you'd expect, but simultaneously I think even she's supposed to be bigger uh, going by the source. So it's hard to say. All I can conclude is that the, the, they're not fully consistent on it or that it's supposed to just be not consistent. And it, I wonder it, if considerations of like aerodynamism or like realistic capability to fry, or at least vaguely believable capability to fly is anything that they're thinking about when they design the dragons and think about their sizes for this show. Maybe. You know, you say that you say that right as I was kind of muddling it over in my head, but I'm thinking if Vagar was bigger, I'm already kind of I we're we're at that borderline of believability for the size of it and being aerodynamic and able to fly. I feel like if we make that dragon bigger, my brain's gonna be like, mm, 
I'm okay. of the opposite perspective. I think they're too big already, so even bigger doesn't really bother me. At this point, they are fantasy creatures that are probably using magic to fly. That's the only way my brain can satisfy creatures like this being able to stay in the sky, because there's no fucking way they could. A lot of them, uh, anyway. Um, yeah. Balerion is going to be bigger than Vagar if they ever show a Egg on the Conqueror TV show, so... And significantly, I think. Like, there's, there's a noticeable increase in size again, and I'm more than willing especially like you see it in artwork, to see that creature in a live-action setting, I'm not going to accept pretty much ever, as I never have. Like, dragons, because of just physics, they're, they're so difficult for them to exist. Even the smaller ones, like Vermax and Arax, I don't think their wings are big enough to account for their bodies. Um, I could, Part of that, you can sort of, um, at least the way that my mind works with, like, how, well, you know, how much do they eat? What's their musculature? What's their... You know, the the internal stuff, you know, the bones and everything. How does that all work out? And da da da. And they can breathe fire. So they, they got some organ stuff going on there. So who really knows? And they're clearly special in the world. But um, I guess it's just kind of where your line is and how your brain sort of looks at that and, you know, works with it. Anyway, they uh, are talking a bit more. And we start to hear noises outside. Oh, my goodness. There's, they're saying, open the gates. Oh, my God. This is good. We got... There's people coming, there's a dragon, ah, and it's like, wait, what's going on here? And you get a little look for uh, Iron Rod and Laris, thinking about uh, Sea Smoke having been claimed, wondering if this is what's happening, and I think even the audience doesn't exactly know which dragon this is going to be, but it turns out to be Ulf riding Silverwing, and my god, Silverwing looks gorgeous. The uh, pristine wings, the level of detail on just the, the scales, the skin, and just the way that it, the... The physics of it flying, they've done a really good job of making it feel like it is a part of the world. Like, it's got weight. Yeah, yeah. it's, uh, with Caraxes, they did, that's, Caraxes? Yep. Uh, they did this as well, where you notice that the front half with the big wings moves semi-independently than the back half, because it has that serpentine quality. It, 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 it doesn't all move together like a, like a bad video game animation it's almost like <laughs> the the weight of the the back wings just kind of they move differently than the front half and how it kind of makes its you know how it traverses through the air there's a very believe there, there's a lot of believability in the way that they move like they have heft and they have weight they have momentum they can't just turn on a dime um even the way a lot of the times when they show the riders on the back when it turns or moves, they have to like hold on to it because you know they're attached to it and they have to, you know, have a have a firm grip. Although or it'll go off. A lot of a lot of details go into making me believe this, where a lot of other you know shows and stuff along those nature uh, along those lines, they, they don't go to that work. You see a couple of missed scorpion shots as well, which I do appreciate because this is absolutely not a friendly dragon and they could fire at any moment. However, at the same time, I wonder if they have orders not to fire until the dragon themselves fires in case you start something that wasn't necessarily going to start, but it looks like they do try to take it down. Um, like I said, most likely because if they do have all the dragons on the books, then I suppose they'd know this one is Silverwing. Yeah, but I, if the you fact... see a strange dragon coming to the city... Then, yeah, my assumption is they didn't yeah. know, and they were just like, "It's we can't take the risk. They're on top of the city. Kill them now. Bring them down." And, yeah, um, and plus, it's just the guys who are at that ballista. They see a dragon. It's like, yeah, I, shoot, shoot, kill it, kill it, kill it. <laughs> and uh, Amond immediately gets on uh, down to the bottom of the castle. The courtyard gets to a horse. Gets to Vega, who, like the wonderful granny <laughs> she is, is, having a little sleep. She's like, "What's up, Amond? How you doing, sweetheart? What's oh, what's up, Amond? How are you doing <laughs> today?" <laughs> It's oh, 4 p.m. I'm sleeping. <laughs> Are we going on an adventure? <laughs> Are we going to Waffle House? I hope so. And, uh, starts up his chase and reasonably speaking would have chased Silverwing over to Dragonstone. And uh, that's where you get this sense of, oh shit, the power has completely changed. We have three. The shot is pretty cool. But I think we're supposed to imagine that Aemond, despite being incredibly far away, realizes that he's probably not going to win the fight if he tries to pursue it with uh, this new dragon, plus at least Cyrax, who he does know exists and is on Dragonstone. But of course, there's even more than that on Dragonstone right now. Uh, Vega seems to be r r good to go. Just like, let's fuck, it all, let's fuck them all up. I can do this. And uh, Aemon has to actually order Ooh, her away blood. quite aggressively. Yeah, she's an aggressive grandma. 
And so, I like an aggressive grandma. Um, yeah, well, and, and it's just this... It's the first time, I think, that he's just fleed out of fear for his life, probably in a long time, from anything. Yeah. And uh, we get this glorious shot of Vermithor, Cyrax, and Silverwing all behind Rhaenyra as she's essentially making it clear the power has shifted. Team Black is now ahead, where they were trailing behind a little bit there for a bit. Pretty substantially ahead. Be. Oh, how the turntables. People have speculated that that would actually have made for a less destructive, possibly more satisfying end of the season. That scene, if we uh, move some things around, was something that I think we discussed originally, so we may as well have that discussion now as well. That is a final yeah. scene versus the... Um, you know, the A War Is Coming montage. What do you guys mm. think? Uh, the problem is that I guess uh, I, would, I would be saying you got to push the Harren Hall stuff to have its... Like, the Harren... I don't know. That's... Uh, it feels like you choose something that might it be, could. like, a better place to end, but you lose the only major arc of the season that I believe has a conclusion, no, no. which is the Harren Hall stuff. If we only... moved... I, I think I know what you mean, Mahler. Um, like, flip, if... move the scenes around so that yeah, you so still that have the confines of episode scene. 8. In the Harren like, Hall scene at the end, though, the only dragons there are Sea Smoke and Cyrax. So well, they, they could have it... done that before the sewing. Have it to be where the Hugo, all, for that, all the taming stuff kind of happens. It happens okay, at the so, end instead of so that like, is, at this point. Yeah, I guess a clarification. So it would be the same content of the season overall, but that instead of ending with the montage, uh, it just ends with that sequence and then, then the three dragons. I think you could intercut I even am, the armies moving too. I am sort mm -hmm. of mixed on it. I think that um, it would be a bit of a positive and a negative. I do like the idea of ending on this because of you know the visuals of look we have all the dragons and everything now. However, I do also value the idea of the montage sort of reminding you of all of the things that have been set up throughout the season. This group, that group, this group, that group, this group, and they're all kind of moving into place as sort of like a reminder of this is all the stuff that's been set up. This is all like where plot threads have led. This is where, you know, you know, quests have gone. So I do like that. So it's it's a bit of a mix for me. I, yeah, I, I kind of value the, the montage, honestly. Well, I, uh, one of the things I said was I don't know why we couldn't keep both. So you'd have that uh, dragon seed sequence. Then instead of us, because what we did in that was we cut from Ulf claiming Silverwing to the Black Council. We could then, instead of doing that, do anything we want in terms of setting up the army stuff, then have that Black Council scene, then have Eamon chasing, and you build up the music to reflect other things maybe happening. And uh, you, you, you can intercut that montage, and then you can close on this visual, I think. Uh, it, it's sufficiently hype that it could possibly account for feeling like a big event has taken place for people, um, as opposed to Blue Bowling. Yeah. Hmm. Not sure. Doesn't really matter. Ultimately, they've uh, they no, made their choice, it's... you know. <laughs> yeah, it's something to think about. But yeah. well, That's... I mean, I guess the end of season one was a dragon one v one that wasn't like a massive scale battle, but it had consequences. It was a pretty huge event, though. That's the point. It needs to be a pretty substantial event. Yes. Well, I, I think the sewing kind of is. I mean, it's it's obviously different tone, but I'd say it's of similar importance to the future of the war. Sure, I don't really disagree. Well then, shall we discuss episode eight? <laughs> I suppose we Certainly. could, if you're down for it. All right. So, it must be done. Crazy events. They open up on... Uh... Brand new, it was, it was catching up with Thailand, actually, and he's with a Taroshi captain who they're, they're, they're trying to figure out what they're going to do about getting them help, the Triarchy helping out with the gullet, which was a, a wacky, chaotic decision from Amund, but this is the result of it. We got, um, Thailand has to try and negotiate with them, and the conclusion is that once the war is over, the Stepstones will be delivered to the Triarchy as payment, essentially, for them helping on this side of the war, which, um, honestly speaking, will be important for the Greens. This is this is a big old thing for them, and ultimately, they can just not give them the Stepstones at the end, because the, yeah. they may have the power to stop them, but if they don't, as in, 
if there's no more dragons and they're kind of ruined, fuck it. They can keep the stepstones then, maybe. Because, you know, they've said they'll impose a tax for travel, but that's about it. Not necessarily you can trust them on that. Who knows what it'll mean ultimately, but for now, considering how desperate things are, I think this was a pretty good move. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they definitely need a uh, they need a win. They need a big win here. And uh, I like that Thailand makes the executive position uh, decision instead of clearing it with Eamon because it's probably the best thing to do. But he does recognize this could get him killed if uh, Eamon takes it the wrong way. Because Eamon sent him here to do this, so he's gonna do his job. Yeah, it's like he get his head lost it either way. So mm -hmm. he's uh, he's doing it. Um, and then we see the arrival of a YouTuber. Uh, I don't think that ever before in a show or a movie I have had my immersion so instantly shattered into such fine, fine mist. Um, when we were watching <laughs> this episode, Mahler, you might recall that when I saw this, uh, this, this YouTuber in this show, I laughed so hard out loud i could not contain my mind shattered shattered my immersion where it was so high before seeing those dragons seeing how much work and effort went into making them look good seeing where everything was leading so invested in the show and then this scene <laughs> ah! oh shattered into a fine mist yeah to be absolutely clear it's the, the the show itself takes place in a world that i can buy and get immersed into spotting someone who i know makes cringe video essayists the essay things i just be like what the fuck <laughs> like, what, what are you doing what here? is this yeah. interloper doing it what what is happening we are no longer in the fantasy world of westeros and and you know game of thrones we we're no longer in no it's i just I, I I mean I don't think I can I've ever had my immersion in something that I was immersed in shattered so quickly before. Um, it's like it, if it's like if Donald Trump showed up at one of the Green Council meetings. <laughs> oh, Lord like, Trump hey, we, of we, House we, Trimpleton. <laughs> I'm playing like, Otto hey. Hightower now, and the best Otto Hightower, Reese Siffins, is never going to be as good as Trump as Otto Hightower. You fired He's Otto. Like, bad, no. move. bad move. <laughs> bad move. I wouldn't have fired. Do that. <laughs> Uh, I yeah. what a what a disastrous decision. What it, it's 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 <laughs> one thing to it. like it's one thing to see an actor who's like been in a lot of other movies and TV shows. It's, it's fine because it's in the field of acting. But as soon as you see somebody who's famous for something, some like in another field entirely, it becomes oddly distracting and questionable. Well, it's like, funny you say <laughs> um, that. What I will say is there are actors that would have some. Uh, something close to this effect. For example, if they say there's a grand emperor of this world that you'll have to pass by, he's intimidating, he's scary, blah, blah, blah. They bring him out and it's Danny DeVito. We'd all be like, what the fuck? <laughs> and then <laughs> that's, that's, that's true. And yeah. the writers are like, well, we try. We wanted to try and give Danny a chance to play a role that he doesn't usually. We'd be like, no, you shouldn't have done that. Like that. I love Danny DeVito, but I don't think we should be trying to get him to play that kind of role, okay? It's not, it's not going to work out. In the same vein, there are just certain actors that do certain roles, and, and there, there are certain choices you make, and this one, I think, was a mistake. One of the first lines uh, when... I'm trying to figure out the name of this character. It's like uh, Loha or something. Chiraco um, Loha. Chiraco Loha. He says, are, are, are you a poet or a philosopher? And it feels very like, ew, <laughs> why would you... I'd die. Why yeah. would you... It, it, that feels like something, because the Five Nights at Freddy's movie does it with uh, Matt Pat, and that feels appropriate, for lack of a better term. it's Five Nights at Freddy's. Exactly. It's, a, it's fucking It's Five FNAF. Nights at Freddy's. And we know what we're here for. Well, and he's actually, yeah. like, symbiotic with the growth of that franchise, his YouTube channel, sp like, specifically. So it just feels like, eh, yeah, yeah, you have your little nod, fair enough, but this be like a philosopher You're like excuse me why would you even what are you doing did did you ask for that line yeah. to be put in like ugh. just a, yeah this is game of thrones not your fucking plaything what are we doing yeah. this isn't like your shit to fuck around with well like a lot of people have a lot of care and passion and legitimate interest in this world and universe and you're treating it like it's your toy the and the, well the, and the thing is the writers would have approved of this so would the directors like it's all a bad move, I think, artistically. Um, I fucking... I couldn't imagine imposing my own, like, in-house memes on a TV show that I've just been become a part of. You know what I mean? It feels gross. Like, Especially a dark fantasy It feels disrespectful. 
The Five Nights at Freddy's example is interesting because while it is a film, that franchise does have a significant overlap with Let's Plays. Exactly. And, you know, the legacy. Screaming. Yeah. yeah. This movie exists in part because of you. You're going to be a part of the movie. There is this. It's almost like for as like it's kind of reverent in a meta way. But this mm -hmm. just feels like um, fuck Game of Thrones. I'm going to have my little line in here and. It's it's so it's, hey maybe it's it was wrong. the writer's suggestion because they're a big fan of philosophy too who knows uh, <laughs> uh, um, well uh. the uh, yeah Thailand is essentially challenged to a fight and if he can pass it uh, will earn the respect of this captain I suppose and uh, the scenes themselves I think there are three or four three main ones four just like there's a closing one they're fine. It's, uh, I think they take a little more space than they needed to, though, considering how much we need to get done in this show. Um, I think so. I, I could have of... done without the whole mud wrestling match. It's not... Like... Um, it, it does a little bit for Thailand, but not, like, in yeah, a way it's that... Neat. It's know, neat. Yeah. And I, and I like that for him. You know, guy needs some wins. Guy needs to... You know, he's, he's kind of playing... I, I, I feel like I, we just, could have accomplished what we needed from these scenes in like one or two rather one, than yeah. three or four. Um, uh, the, the performance from Philosophy Tube is fine, um, but it's super distracting, obviously, yeah. in a meta sense. But also, yeah. there's, uh, um, there's a laugh at one point uh, that's like, ha, yeah. ha, ha, ha. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, put that back in your mouth. Please do it again or dub it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just get someone else, a normal person, to laugh. I guess in terms of, like, you get actors every once in a while who, who can't pull off certain things, and apparently philosophy is not very great at forcing a laugh. A lot of people aren't. Remember the time when we tried to do that on EFAP? like do a real fake laugh, and I got really confused by what that meant. A real fake laugh. <laughs> I do remember <laughs> when we were yeah. actually trying, not trying to make it sound I, funny. I literally kept interpreting what you were saying the, the backwards, like try to keep do a, do a fake laugh, but for real. So really do, a, and I was just like, it's too hard for <laughs> me. As opposed to your fake laughing, but make it come across as real. Yeah. Like, do a really yeah, instead of just going obviously ha, fake ha, laugh. Ha, you go. <laughs> I think I think I ended up thinking yeah, like you want me chuckle. to give a real attempt at sounding as though I'm doing a bad job of creating a real laugh <laughs> if a fake way. It's just like what. <laughs> <laughs> eh, I, wonder, the director, I wonder if there geez. I wonder if there is an apprehension on the part of the directors like when you make a casting decision like that they, they're they like insecure as to like tell them to do another take of that or do it in a different way because like when you're dealing with like actors yeah like I think a lot of them want that it's just like am I doing this right tell me like give me something to bite on here I want to do this well but with somebody who isn't like strictly an acting professional like well I, I don't i don't typically act anyway like i don't know if like the director's looking at this and going like yeah that was fine <laughs> let's just let's just go on to the next take well, like, i mean yeah i suppose you wanted that even with like uh like you know the wonder woman i need you to give me this stone was that the first take and know. they didn't have the heart to tell her to do remember, it again or was that the yeah. best one they could get remember snyder <laughs> used a different take for the uh, he did Kal yeah Kal he used no. a different take of kal -El no and dubbed it over the original but it was still cringe how is that not just an obvious omission of how bad admission, rather, of how bad of a delivery that was? God, yeah. That was yeah. So they just didn't mirror, have it. Mirror, mirror, on yeah. the wall. It implies that she could not, there the was no good take to use. It implies yes. that as much as they tried, Dude, it, it, it couldn't be Mr. done. Burns, it was we beyond did 20 her. takes and that was the best one. And yeah. it's actually that. Yeah, the best real. one was bad. The best one was arguably worse than what they But had. I do understand what you mean, John, about the idea of uh, with certain people, how comfortable would somebody feel asking them to do, you know, another take or another take of like, yeah, can just one more time, but better. Yeah. Like yeah. as if like th they're gonna go like, do you know who I am? I'm philosophy too. You're like, some I YouTuber now. Take. Fucking do it. Early. Imagine the, you're in Hollywood now. <laughs> imagine the reverse of it, where you do your take and you think to yourself, "Was that good?" And you look up the director. They're silent for like a few seconds and they go, "Let's just carry on." And you'd be like, <laughs> "Oh." Yeah, that's almost <laughs> worse than saying, "Yeah, we'll do it again." Let, let's yeah, just I can imagine I'll be more offended with the "Let's move on" because that kind of implies you're not gonna get any better at this. I can imagine the same sort of thing happening with the Ed Sheeran thing when they brought him on. Mm. Like they, he probably might have done one take, and then it's just like, okay, I wanted something else from this take, but if I give him 
acting advice like is he gonna know what i'm talking about because this isn't his specialty you know what i mean like i wonder if they were just like yeah that was we can make that work fine like yeah he makes pop music be... does he have a brain hmm. <laughs> we are yet to discover the truth on that matter anyway over to Amond, who is surveying sharp point as he has nuked it or the equivalent of with uh, a, a i dragon. was um I admit I was a little confused at first when I saw this. Uh, the way that it's shot and his expression, I, I wasn't exactly certain what I was supposed to take away from it, what, it, what was sort of happening. Um, so I, it, it was just a little confusing based on how they presented it. I think it's pretty confusing, even with the whole episode taken into account. I don't think they do a, a fantastic job of explaining to you the geography of this situation. Uh, the shot point is a significant element of the blockade. If... Dragonstone is one significant tower on the side of it. This would be the other side of it. And then the gullet is like all in between and, and the drift, drift mark is a big, almost capital of that whole operation. Destroying Sharp Point should be seen as a, whoa, what does that mean? What's going to change now? Is anyone, like, what's, what's being done in response to this? You know, is this risky? Like, Eamon, if you're willing to do this, you're willing to do more? What's, what's going to happen to the rest of the gullet? What, what, what's, what's, what's going on? And, you know, over the conversations I've had, a lot of people would say, well... I guess he nuked Sharp Point because he strategically believes that he can do this without getting himself in too much danger with other dragons. Because if he went to Driftmark slash Dragonstone slash the Gullet, he might get himself into a fight he can't win. This may have been done timeline-wise after he chased away Silverwing. He immediately went to Sharp Point, did this, and then went home in such a way that there was no time to react to this necessarily. Like there's not because one could argue is he not there leaving King's Landing wide open. Him. And could he not have a bunch of dragons try to kill him right now? So, and, and it is seen as a wacky move uh, in, in this episode. I just don't know that it's properly given enough context for the viewers because this just feels like he nuked some random place. We don't even know who who's here or who they're loyal to necessarily. I guess we assume it's not the Greens because he burned them. It's just um, not fantastic, I think, as a, as a bit of information being given to us. And uh, the other a bit regretful part is that almost the entire scene is in the promo. Like, there's no extra information of what he does here. You don't see him conduct this. You don't get a scene of what the people in the town experience or anything, or people talking about or what he does after it, so to speak. It's mostly like this whole little section. It's just uh, something one would have seen already if you saw the trailer, which uh, is going to be a common theme. I'll try and highlight this whenever we get to it. But, you know, it's like, okay. There's nothing wrong with the scene in and of itself, it's just it raises a whole bunch of questions that don't, I think, get properly answered. Anyway, we can move on to the next scene with Aegon, who's having uh, another bad time, I think, just recovering. Yeah. Master Allwile. Oh, happy camper. I think Master. Maester Allwile gives him some, uh, I think it's some regular drink. He wants rum. I think he's been uh, refused... Uh, milk of the poppy now because uh, Laris wants his mind Marks shocked. His mind, yeah. So yeah, he's pretty miserable. Um, but he does say you're a good man to to Orwell, which again, just what you doing there, Sean? Like a little, yeah, it's the a little bit, things. It's a bit interesting because it's like, why'd you say that? I feel like you wouldn't have said that eight episodes ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now that now that you've got someone who really is taking care of you. That you're relying on so much. You've got like nothing to gain by saying this either. You know, you're just you're just letting them know how you feel. Yeah, it feels genuine. Genuine appreciation. Mm -hmm. Pointing out what is true, which is that you do all of this and you should be appreciated for it. Good stuff. Um, and yes, uh, the notion of what's happened at Sharp Point gets delivered to Aegon. He says, "Your brother, uh, he flew to challenge Silverwing and was rebuffed." Led in terror, from what I hear. And Aegon says he deserves no less. And then Laris says, be that as it may, he's gone in his fury to Sharp Point where he's laid waste to the entire town. And Aegon says, fucking mad cunt. Which is pretty mm. in, uh, amusing and interesting as a point of view. Pretty apt. Well, yeah, especially coming from Aegon, who, you know, not that long ago was all about, like, yeah, let's go burn, kill, destroy him, let's fight, glory, all right. And now he's like, yeah, that guy, that dude's fucking insane for what he did. And he didn't really, he didn't really understand Aemond because it makes me think of, you know, going to the brothel to like make fun at him and, you know, make 
light with his brother or the way he talks about him um on the small council and whatnot um only to see what happens like after uh Aemond is not the person he thought he was yeah he didn't comprehend Aegon the depths would... to which Aemond took very personally his treatment in their youth Egan really looked at Aemond as his like loyal sidekick, and that's pretty much it. Like, yeah, he's my brother, whatever. He's, he's my got good the buddy, Aemond. He's gonna, he's, I'm the king, and he's gonna take care of me. He's got Vagar, and he's a really good warrior. What a good, what a good buddy my Aemond is. Um, all of this is pretty heavy on him, and so you, you just all this evidence that Aegon has changed significantly as a character, and uh, Laris says, uh, we're gonna have to. Yeah, you, like like the, this, this is bad. This is this is really bad. And and Aegon says, "What was the point of all of this shit if uh, if this has happened? Because Team Black now has so many dragons, we actually might just get outright crushed if all of the others have been uh, claimed." And he says, "Well, um, I hope you can see the urgency that we need to leave because of all this." And he says, "Well, I'm the king. Why the hell should I run?" And then he says, "Because the Prince Regent is going to kill you," which is quite. Shot. There's it's no just, subtlety in the line. It's just this is just gonna happen no now. No time for subtlety. Yeah, yeah. It's it's serious now. And, now. and Egan like, seems to immediately trouble. understand. He's just like, yeah, you're right. Like in his eyes. Oh, he looks really fucking affected by it because it's a. I think he knew it to be true. Everyone does at this point with the, uh, everything that's happened. At least uh, who have unique information. And uh, it's it's definitely a how the hell did my life come to this. Where, uh, you know, I need to make a decision now that relates to my brother trying to kill me. Um, when he's got enough to worry about, about his whole kingdom falling apart thanks to the issues yeah, he has his own life. And then, of course, his own body, his own quality of life, his air, his... Uh, everything has just fallen apart for him. And it's, you know, it's sad to watch. Kind of. It is actually kind of sad. Do you feel this kind of way for this fucking asshole. Yeah, he does a really good job of showing just how much pain he's in and it makes you feel things. Good job, TV show. I, well, th I think that's the neat thing about it. It's that we know he deserves all of this, but it's still sad. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, so Laris is offering him that they, they leave, they have plenty of money, they have contacts, they can go to Essos, basically, and just avoid all of this until the hope would be that Aemond and Rhaenyra kill each other. And then you can come back and claim your kingdom. And he says, go, li go live with the goat fuckers. And he says, well, better to live, I think. And, yeah, um, better to live, I think. And he says his dragon's dead. He's burnt, disgusting, and alone, and a cripple. And Lara says, you're not alone. Which is like, "Oh, these Aww. two. Lara just might have <laughs> a heart. Just might. Oh, maybe. yeah, because obviously just there's, there's yeah. elements of pragmatism here for yep. sure. Um, he is a calculating, conniving guy. But I do get the impression that there is actual uh, sense of kindred spirits that they both, uh, in, in some way, shape, or form, uh, have the same fundamental plight that they have to overcome. That he sees as good of himself in Aegon. He's still manipulating, but he's no longer lying. Um, is it manip? Hmm. I guess. Well, so it, 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 yeah. it's manipulation in the sense that the the angle that he's playing at is still one where he, if if he's victorious, he's got a real good shot of being handed the king, right? Like mm -hmm. if if everything goes as planned, they run away and hide out. Everything gets fucked up, and then Aegon comes back. Like he's going to be hand, which is the best that he can expect. Yeah, because uh, Aemon sure as shit ain't gonna give it. So it's not like nope. what he's doing here is selfless, um, but it's not entirely cynical. Is probably what I yeah. would say. Yeah, yeah, and uh, they've quite earned this relationship and the reflections in each other of what lives they've mm -hmm. lived. Um, and we haven't. Uh, yeah, and it's it's not like we've gotten a lot of these two, really. Um. I think they've made really excellent work of the scenes that they have had together. Um, I think it's just one of those, it, it's kind of like uh, Oscar, right? The young guy. He was, he's like, we, we barely get him, leaves an impression, is effective in the time that it uses. And yeah, uh, he starts to despair a bit, of course, on the point of having lost his. Uh... He says his cock was destroyed, burnt in the flames, on top of everything else, uh, just panicking about the future of his life. And um, the way Laris brings him back by talking about 
what he would be considered, what his name would be when uh, arriving back to this kingdom. Mm -hmm. Suggestions being Aegon the Victorious, Aegon the Peacemaker, Aegon the Rebuilder. And then Aegon says, the realm's delight, which was uh, Rhaenyra's name. Rhaenyra's, yeah. And also just an interesting um, illustration of the nature of the arc that he's gone on in this season, because it was back in... I want to say episode one, it was either episode one or episode two where he's sitting around with his friends, like, sort of, uh, it, no, it was, it, it was, it, there was a scene where they were, like, brainstorming names or he got bestowed with a name that he didn't, he was like, ah, oh, whatever. It was that's, the first that's episode of the season, episode one, right? Yeah. yeah, I thought so. And he calls so him it's interesting. magnanimous, I think, and then he's even like, huh? No one's gonna know With what that the, means. Just interesting as a as a kind of like the nature of where his mind's at uh, now, right? Like full circle, kind of essentially realizing what he probably would have known about himself if he was a little bit more self aware, which is that he just wants to be liked. Yeah, uh, that's it. He just wants to be liked. He wants well, to feel that, like people. It like also him. expresses an element of emasculation, frankly, due to you know the absence of his penis. I guess he's uh, you know, to wonder. The, the one uh, motive we know that he had that was being loved, that's still on the table. He hasn't lost that potential. He may have lost his that's dragon, right. a lot of his power, his ability to act, his uh, standing in general, his status, his future, to an extent with the, the quality of life and children to have. But you can still be loved by the realm. That's still possible. Yeah, you can still get a lot of attention. You can still get a lot of respect and admiration and love. And uh, yeah, he's definitely... He's at a super low point, but he is not out. He is not out um, of the picture. By the way, when you talk about, no, you mentioned it prior, but the, the performance, when you're essentially, your restrictions are, you can't really move. You can't <laughs> really raise your voice. Like, you're not, you're not even, like, really in much of a position to even move your face that much. Um, anyway, still give it to us. Like, <laughs> give us the performance. He does an excellent job. Mm -hmm. It's the eyes. It's all sold in the eyes. That's a good point. If you were, if you had your face burned like that, even minute expressions would probably be agonizing. Just exactly. The matter of, the ma oh, sorry, Jojo. Um, <laughs> the matter of fact, deliveries help a lot too with him being like, I can't piss. It just runs down my leg now. Yeah. So, I mean, he's been fucking annihilated by this whole experience, but uh, Laris is one of the perfect people to hype him up, honestly. Yeah, I think so. There is definitely an element of, you know, hey, yeah, I look at what I've been able to accomplish. Look at me and my station. And, you know, I've, you know, look, I, I've got my physical shortcomings, but I've been able to do a lot and accomplish. Ooh, then we got a Raina scene. Yes. Yay. Hey, what's she up what to? What is she up to? She yeah, what is, is she doing? Walking. Oh, oh. Okay. Oh, and then Go she on. drinks from a stream. Yes. But, uh, I, I got it. Pet peeve. That's not how you drink from a stream. Fuck oh, off. I know exactly what you mean. When you're desperately in need of water, you don't splash your face into it all over the place. Yeah. You, you, you cup drink. it in your hands and you drink from your hand or you just get it straight from the thing. You just stick your face in there and just suck it right up. Mm -hmm. You don't you do not do this weird one-handed like you could barely get your tongue wet with that. What are we doing? Come on. Do she better. Do looks better. Like She's failing <laughs> to properly, because her last attempt, it seems she wants to wash her face with it. And it's like, well, maybe don't do both of those things at the same time, you know? Or I guess if you, there are better ways to do that, even if that's what, anyway, let's just move on. Raina being silly. Let's move on. So we get the uh, uh, Jace meeting with the dragon seeds as they become dragon riders. And um, with everything we've gone over with Jace and his insecurities, Ulf is quite possibly the worst human being for him to speak to in this moment. Yeah, <laughs> Ulf is not going to leave a great impression if his concerns are uh, uh, He's the, the legacy the of all the of honor and the nobility Ulf was and the decorum. custom engineered in a lab to annoy Jace. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to ruin Jace's day every time he speaks or exists near him. I mean, the fact that one of the first things he says to Jace is, uh, oh, wow, that hair, as dark as they say. <laughs> like, fucking hell. <laughs> this thing called tact. <laughs> you almost think he's going to give him a noogie, like get him in a headlock yep. and just rub his knuckle in, like, hey, how you doing, Jace? Well, and, and he's <laughs> constantly talking about us, insisting, like, you and I, we're, like, the same. We're, we're dragon riders. We're cut yeah. from the same cloth, you and I. 
uh, when yeah. J- Jace just came off a scene being like, we're not the same, but the, me and him are not the same. It's like, totally the same. Uh, so he fucking rants and raves at Ulf quite harshly, even threatens that if he doesn't fucking do his job correctly, he'll have him killed. And Ulf's like, all right, no disrespect, man, my prince. And uh, sort of walks off. Very much a... You get the distinct feeling of this is probably indicative of things to come. Not gonna... Yeah, yeah, I want to well see more of them. Maybe. I don't know that those two will be friends. Probably not. Is how I'd put it. Or maybe they could... Maybe their friendship could blossom and they could turn into a, an interesting <laughs> dynamic. Hey, maybe. Maybe. Hey. You never know. It's um, quite overtly comedic for the audience, too. Like, we just saw him scared shitless, almost killed, and now he's just got his feet up on the table. Oh, like, yes. The place. <laughs> he's winning now. Things are exactly the way that he, he can't help but feel hyper-confident. Um, but then the, ju- the show jump scares us with something we never thought we'd ever see. Rhaenyra has decided she will have a conversation with her hand about Master Oh, my oh God. my God! It's only been how many episodes? Well, I mean, technically it's not been a many episodes since he's been made hand, but that's also the problem. But he should have been made hand ages ago. Have Long time ago. And even, yeah. fuck it, it doesn't matter if she, she, he's her hand or not. He's her best advisor, bar none. So, you know what I mean? Like, she should be fucking and advising after... him whether or not he's hand. Yeah, especially after uh, uh, Rhaenys died. You'd think that you'd be like, man, I need to, I need to really be good to Corliss here. Mm-hmm. He's lost a lot for me. Correct. So yeah, they're just discussing the current situation. Uh, we get nothing on her conducting of the insane action she did in the previous episode from him nor anyone else. Uh. Like I said, we're just moving right along on that. You can, like I said, I, I don't even know if the writers see it as a bad thing that she did. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. They it's really it makes me wonder that the nobility treating the small folk as if they are disposable is not exactly a good thing, even though they're all doing it. Okay, what's so fucking funny is that they make that a huge plotline for the Greens. They Aaron ignore Hall. the two huge times this has happened for the Blacks. They're just like, well, Rainey's killing all those people. Eh, ignore it. Oh, Rhaenyra getting like 50 people ready as a happy meal for a dragon. Eh. <laughs> like, I feel Sad like these meal. things, if the show was being completely honest, would actually affect her relationship slash uh, her reputation when it comes to dealing with small folk. But oh, well. She can't just keep getting away with it. <laughs> How it feels, man. Uh, in any case, she says, I've got all these dragons now. I think we'll use them as a way to sort of scare everybody into healing, essentially. And Corliss is like, you fucking serious? You just got all these dragons and now you're like, we'll, uh, we'll threaten with them. So he convinces her that's retarded and that we should actually be pushing with them, which I appreciate. Thank fuck. Yep. In any case, uh, she gets... You know, I, I, I think this is the more progress than has ever been made, and it just happens to be her first time properly talking to Corliss about actions of the future. It, it, it kind of drives Interesting. you nuts. Interesting. Yeah. Who knows what might have been done if she had more conversations with Corliss? Who knows what woes could have been avoided? Well, and the thing is, uh, I can't help but highlight this. This is her first proper one, and it's very likely her last. Um, he's going. The next scene we have for him, I think, is going to be with... Alan, and then in the scene after that, he's on a little rowboat heading to his ship, which is where he's going to be heading to the big gullet uh, collection with with uh, you got the the triarchy and possibly dragons. Who knows what's going to be involved there? Uh, considering the show is only four seasons, that feels to me like a very good place. Considering the Blacks need to take a serious L soon, they they're way too far ahead. Uh, that we could be losing Corliss soon enough. Yeah, so this might actually be the first and last. <laughs> Which would be so fucking I lame. Hope not. Um, I sure w- hope not too, but uh, I think I agree with Mauler. I think I yeah. think it just follows. Especially if you think about it, if the original plan was for, you know, this season uh, to have two more episodes, that there'd be like some big death happening in the next one, and it seems like he'd be the most... He's one of the ones I would expect, because the thing about the Blacks now is they have a lot of power, but they don't have a lot of intelligence. They need to be dragged down a bit. Yeah, well, I I think that would be a good way to cripple them, is to take away um, someone who's clever and responsible. I suppose it's funny to think that that's how it works, though, right? Is that the Greens were winning because they won a battle, and then the Blacks were winning, not because they won a battle, but just because they got resources that they could have used, but Rhaenyra failed to use. And they obtained them in very unethical ways. Yeah. 
and then they use them and then they'll lose and they'll be like, oh no, they're they're back, they're oh no, they're in trouble again. Hmm. So we'll see, but uh, he's also renamed his ship in, uh, as the Queen Who Never Was instead of the Sea Snake, which is, you know. It should have nice. named it all the people who she s stepped on with her dragon <laughs> in the uh, in episode nine. It it'll and be hard to fit all that on the plaque. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it all work, of the damn it. It's called Tim the Cobbler, Barry the Farmhand, and the list just keeps going. <laughs> Tim, John. Who are all these names? Like, I uh, didn't take too long Valerie, to explain it. Steven. So, you can run people he, over with a ship. They got to be in the water already, but you can do it. Back to Harrenhal then. It's supposed to be clapping after I say Harrenhal, but okay, fine. No, but everybody yeah. knows. Yeah. Oh, I was, I was just silently, Harrenhal. I was just silently wiping a tear of joy from my eye. Sorry, um, I was just, uh, I was just thinking about Littlefinger saying Harrenhal because he said it really funny in that one scene. Oh. Well, you talking about some people it? say Harrenhal. And, what? Uh, Why? Harrenhal. Well, it's because this happens all the time in all things. It's just actors who haven't been properly. Uh, you know what? I I would be fine with it if everyone called it that, but they don't. So it's really weird at a show. Yeah, when yeah you know. I'd be fine with it if that was its name. Yeah. Yeah. But it's... on account of it not being its name, then it's kind of an issue. Sometimes you just don't catch these things. I suppose you know a lot going on. But anyway, uh, it looks like Broom has reached him, and uh, we've we've got the armies have arrived. It's looking pretty good for for Damon. He's just you know checking with everybody, making sure everything's good to go. Even says that um, they're running out of sheep to feed Caraxes, but they've got plenty of pork, and he says he prefers them. Which just dragons are different. They yeah. have uh, he knows his dragons' uh, individual uh, preferences. He's like, hey, you know, they're individual. And so, uh... do you prefer? Wait, wait. Do you prefer? sheep or do you prefer pork do pork. we have any strong opinions on yeah yeah uh, fair enough I, th I think they're both incredibly delicious i th i don't know which one i prefer actually they're both very yummy i don't know if anyone had strong opinions on how dragon bacon is are. carrying a lot of weight for pork and ribs bacon is carrying a lot of weight not to down not to downplay like a really good pork loin or something like that but i mean Mutton's really good when it's done well. A good, a good lamb. Mmm, good stuff. Yeah, rack of lamb is delightful. Now I'm hungry. Hmm. Well, let's let's pause this and have lunch. So anyway, Broom and Damon have oh, a little okay. chat, and uh, Broom makes it clear that he thinks he's well. He's he's like I'm loyal as fuck to you guys. However, not sure about Rhaenyra leading. And I think maybe you should lead instead, which is just straight up treason. That's, you can't you can't be doing that. You can't be uh, going against what the actual system is at, at had right now. But at the same time, he truly believes that Rhaenyra is that shit of a leader. I suppose slash is a woman, which doesn't bind uh, armies as much. I mean, well, it's just true within the universe anyway. It's uh, it's I mean, actually yeah. reflected in the scene coming up with Damon and Rhaenyra. It's well, there's been huge plot points in the first season as well about, you know, women leading is just not typically a thing that happens and is done. So, um, of course, has a very peculiar hatred of women in that regard, yeah. I find that this... The thing about it is, like, I think the show just thinks the uh, Broom's being kind of an asshole, whereas uh, we were on the verge of possibly justifying everything he said here in a different way, being like, Rhaenyra's been absurdly incompetent. She's costing us the whole war. She doesn't make any decisions properly. She barely spends any time with the Black Council. She nearly killed herself several times by doing insane fucking antics. To be like, Damon, do you know what she did with the whole Allison thing? It was fucking crazy. Did, did anyone tell she you about like, this? Oh, you'll never guess. She, so she like yeah, she... explained the whole thing, and <laughs> Damon would be like, she did what? There are potential worlds where she had she could have like already cost them the war, considering the Blacks have been more or less inactive on the continent. Yeah. Well, we're lucky say, because she tells a lot of secrets to that prostitute you used to date too. Yep, this is what I mean. There's there's a lot there's a laundry list of issues that could very well be reason to say she needs to be put aside for a moment while people who know what they're doing uh, put in charge. But I think the broad point of view of this show is that this is a bad man doing bad things because uh, whispered on the wind, if you have captions on, is the word traitor. So. The right has leaned into the scene. <laughs> yeah, the, the right is like, fuck this guy in particular. As they write him to do this, they're like, they're this fucking asshole. 
But I suppose <laughs> if you're going to be a little bit more generous to it, you'd say the interesting angle is what's Damon going to do with this? And he is definitely not made. He's not making it clear with this scene. He doesn't accept or deny. He walks away. He's like, hmm. Mm. After he smiling, just jabs for him a little bit. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Damon's a smart boy. He's just going to leave all doors open until they must be closed, which is coming. Just. Just gonna let that one sit there for a bit. Um, but you know, as as per even the vision's implication, he now has everything he needs. He's got all of the men. He has a dragon. He's got the support mm -hmm. ready to go. He can betray Rhaenyra if he wants to. He can take because it's it's just like everything he has asked for and wanted and and been insecure about. It's all there. So what's the decision after everything that's happened? But maybe there's something else to to do before he makes that decision. Who can say? In any case, cutting back over to what could be the equivalent of a Green Council meeting, it's mainly just Eamon and Jasper. They're talking about how small folk are being collected up with any Targaryen blood to try and claim dragons and uh, you know, act on behalf of the Pretender. Mm -hmm. And Eamon says, deception, subterfuge, cowards, all of them. And he wants them to now check every single boat coming in and out to make sure none of that shit's happening. Which, if they do, is going to hamper the fishermen significantly, which will hamper the production of, well, food for King's Landing, and which is already in a bad place. Already starving people would be, uh, oof. And so he says, like, it's not, maybe not a good idea, and Eamon just says, well, they're going to have to make sacrifices, we all do. Taking the fish away mm. from the people who've been complaining about eating too much fish. Well, that's just cruel, isn't it, when you're like, you know what, I'm starving, and I don't like fish, but I'll eat it, and then, like, you can't even have fish. What? Maybe shoes. Eamon sees it as, oh, they, they're getting sick of fish, huh? Well, we can take care of that. Yeah, problem solved. And then we move over to uh, kind of a rough scene of Eamon trying to basically, he's, he's flailing, he's not doing so well. He's, he's asking Elena to take up her dragon, Dreamfire, and to join the battle, of which she's pretty much not at all interested in. And to be honest with you, if I were Eamon's uh, friend, I'd be like, oh, yeah. You want her on a are dragon? You, she's, are we the baddies? She's a little, um, you know. <laughs> she's know. just a little, a little absent-minded. She's kind of off doing her own thing. She, just to be like, yeah, you. You of all people. Go and burn people. And uh, Allison is here, and she's, uh, before even came in, she was even suggesting potential for leaving. It's gonna come up again by the time we hit the end of the Um. Mm-hmm. But yes, Aemond is losing it a little bit, and he says that they've defiled our birthright, they've made commoners into dragon lords, so he's 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 clearly taking this as badly as a... He's uh, mad about it. Yes. Yes. He is yeah, offended. Is, yeah, that is interesting as a parallel. He's, he's got the same problem Jace does to an extent with this having happened. Uh, but we just, we know he takes being a Targaryen so fucking seriously, his whole, like his whole life has been consumed by what you're supposed to do as a Targaryen sort of thing. Dragons are a huge part of that. I don't think he went for Vagar by pure coincidence. Yeah. I think that was very deliberate. Such a symbol of uh, your rightful heritage to have taken the biggest living dragon. So the idea that now some, to him, Pissan is just on Vermithal, <laughs> it's kind of annoying, I imagine. And uh, he starts grabbing Helena pretty hard, and so... She's, uh, she's in a bit of pain, and Allison says, May I remind you, your sister is the queen. And he says, As you were once, and you see now what the consequence of your weakness is. We are in peril today more than we were yesterday. It's just this, uh, that, that awful relationship they have, just being absolutely uh, terrible for them both. And get a little bit of snaps of truth coming out, and um, he says, was it peril that moved you to burn the town of Sharp Point? Peril or basest fury at your own humiliation? You wish to rule the Seven Kingdoms, but you rain ruin and death upon its small folk when you've been insulted because it makes you feel strong, and now you seek to corrupt your sister. Of all our line, the gentlest and most deserving of your protection. Which to me is one of the most uh, overt recognition that the Greens are basically like, we're all horrible, disgusting pieces of shit. She's the nice one. Don't ruin her too. We've got one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It would be nice to have an exception in the family. Please, let her be the good guy. Um, and that does seem to hit him relatively hard, because this is, this is the thing. He is desperate, he's humiliated, he's lashing out, he's not experienced this before. He was kind of winning, everything was in place, and in one day, it's all been shattered. He could be taken out pretty easily now, if there's like five dragons at once. 
once again, there's a world where Rhaenyra rallies all of her dragons, storms King Land King's Landing, looking specifically for Vega, uh, takes out Vega, whatever the cost of that may be, and then it's sort of over. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pretty much five v one and five v one Vega, and like kind of literally the whole just game. just gank Vega because. Especially because Vega would probably be riderless, because Aemon can't be on Vega all the time, and it would take Aemon quite a while to get to Vega. It is kind of I I don't know what the way it is that you kind of want, in a way, Aemon to be on Vega because you want to knock them both out. Mm -hmm. It's uh I know you could, you could do them both separately. It's just that uh and I don't know that would a I guess well, a dragon would be better with its rider because the rider is just a bonus set of senses and another brain. So I, I assume that a rider to direct them yeah. makes them more useful in yeah. combat and better at fighting and stuff. The thing is, once Vega's gone, you can go and find Aemon and torch him, right? <laughs> True. It's it would just be the... the relatively it would be the the relatively safer move to knock out Aemon by himself. Vagar would still be alive, but mm -hmm. without a rider, then it would kind of be. Oh yeah, out I mean, of the fight, uh, so... is Vagar gonna be mad? I, I don't know. I don't know how work? that works exactly. If, could they just be like, "All right, dragon seeds, go get Vagar"? <laughs> one of you is the that, that throws it. If Vagar's not gonna be mad about that, then that throws a huge wrench into things. Because yeah, they can just go and torch the Red Keep, and they sort of win instantly. Mm -hmm. Uh. Damon says in the scene to sort of close it out, uh, it's no longer our rule that's threatened, it's our very lives. Would you not have us prevail? And uh, Alison says, not like this. Which I appreciate, and I think is is moving her forward well, With considering the last scene. This is one of the last scenes that she will be moved forward well. Um, the... Uh, nature in the scene that I find interesting as well is that Eamon, the, the actor's choosing to portray his voice a lot more vulnerable. Usually he talks very like under his voice and it's very yes. uh, like, uh, don't fuck with me. But in this he's he's much higher pitched and uh, louder than he ever usually is. It feels like he's genuinely trying to give off a sense that he's very vulnerable, very kind of scared to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, which yeah, you know, Aemon has always been a really fucking interesting character. They haven't really failed with him ever. Yeah, he's been super solid all the way through. Uh, enjoyed him quite a bit this season. We'll be enjoying whatever they do with him later. Before yeah, I we, mean, there's a lot more that can be done. Before we leave this area of the land, we do get one more scene with the Maester and Alison, but we'll probably address that later as part of uh, where she ends up going as a result of that conversation. Yeah, that sounds. I think that's a good move. Yeah. And so we get the scene, the scene, the Kristen Cole scene for the episode. Yes, Ooh, the Kristen Cole scene. Was this? this uh, did we one. decide if this is the best one in the episode? Oh, uh, it's oh, either I it's, it's my favorite, my favorite personally. Yeah, yeah. It's probably this one or the one that we'll get to. But this is a super well, the, the only other one I think that would be beating it out potentially would be the the coolest scene. Yeah, but I still think I prefer this one more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're both really yeah. good. This is super solid, and I think that this is really needed because uh, Cole is unfairly maligned for how excellent of a character that he is. Yeah, I would say after this scene is completed, he feels almost fully repaired. I don't have many qualms with him anymore. Like, those errors into no. the end of season one, I don't... I, they're almost, like, dissipating. Luke's, yeah. It's just, well, they... it seems so... You have to see, see it as he was he was a fucking nutcase temporarily. He went a bit mad, and that's why he did those things. Like, eh, okay. Um, but moving on from it now, he's a much more considered... He's probably the most mature character in the universe at this point. Like, Honestly, <laughs> kind of. Other than maybe like a fucking Otto or whatever. But still, even he feels more rea more of a realist than Otto as well. Well, yeah, he's... Uh, this, is, this is basically... Um, Cole is on his, his nihilistic arc. He is... <laughs> he is taking he is the black pill. The, yeah, exactly. He is He's fully nihilistic. He doesn't believe He's like, nothing yep, no more. Nothing matters, he is fine. passing out black pills as well. He yeah, he's just like, hey, you want one? I'll give them to you. He has, he has transformed into a Sigma male. <laughs> where yes, where his leaves blowing in the wind and that wind might turn to fire at any moment. But no, black seriously, the, the reality is that um, he has such a unique perspective that is very much not um, held by any other prominent character in the show because he's just gone through a unique set of circumstances that have given him, like, ultimate perspective on, uh, on the world. Mm -hmm. 
Well, he's, he's been on such extreme battlefields and seen the worst that they have to offer with dragons and every sort of dynamic that could be at play. He's just like gone through the Stargate like in 2001 where he's come out the other end yeah. and it's just like, holy fuck. Like I, I sort of understand the nature of this whole world now in a way that other people can't even hope to. Before. I wonder, at this exact point in time, how many other people have a reference point of comparison of a battle that involves dragons and a battle that does not. They're like a... having participated I mean, when was in the last... yeah. When was the last time it happened in the universe? Was when did what happen? Dragons being involved in war? When dragons involved in like a war. That would be Aegon was... the Conqueror, Depends which is... Dawn, right? Oh, right. Well, yeah, because I don't know the timeline for that exactly, but I have no idea. That I forget the name of the dragon. Was it Meraxes? That one got yes. killed, right? Uh, spear went through the head. So, yeah, that would probably be the last time. You're right. Um, I'm not sure when that was exactly, but yes. Uh, before talking about the individual lines, this scene is written quite beautifully. Uh, it's worth mentioning there was a tweet. I wish I had it. I would put it on screen, but it was um, a bit of fury from a hot D enjoyer that. Why did you give such an amazingly sympathetic scene to a character that's so awful? Oh, because no. awful people need to be sympathized with, not people that you already like and enjoy and are good people. <laughs> the impression I got uh, was finally people have started to actually, their biases aren't strong enough to prevent them from liking Cole. It's, he's finally getting <laughs> through. Because uh, we've liked him really early on compared to a lot of people. We've, we've kind of oh, tried yeah. to back him up as being an incredibly interesting character. He was famously voted in the uh, early parts of this breakdown for, for EFAP Hot D episodes by Theo as a possibly favorite character. That was iconic. It was mentioned in papers yeah. everywhere. I think I think this scene is probably cementing that. So Pretty fucking good. Let's talk about why, shall we? Yeah, let's do it. So, uh, it's safe to assume that Gwen is vaguely aware of what's been happening possibly between Cole and Alicent is more than the relationship it should be. And uh, the scene starts with Cole sniffing his uh, favor that he was provided by Alicent. And that's what makes Gwen draw a sword on him and say, uh, do you think nothing of your oath, Lord Commander? So obviously he's, he's basically saying, I know what the fuck you've done and what the fuck have you done? And you can see there's a good five meters, maybe more, to the nearest guy in the area, but they're all staring at this. This is the two significant lords. One of them is threatening to kill the other one. So you can imagine they're all like, what the fuck is going on? But um, as for how much they can hear of this conversation will be another thing. We'll talk about the consequences of that in a second. The response he has, Cole here, is is indicative, I think, of how he himself could be a fucking good writer. The character at this point, he just says, I think of nothing else. Like, oh, you little bitch, you had hardly any words, and you just said everything, didn't you? Like, that's uh, how I see the it's character at this point. It's very economical He's... line. Oh, yeah, because well, it, it's like you could talk forever about that one line. So it's like, do you think nothing of your oath? It's it's the whole purpose and meaning he had for his whole life. It was annihilated. He almost went on a different path. It was closed off. Almost killed himself, because he figured that was the natural consequence of having broken that oath. Until he spared by a girl he eventually falls so far in love with he doesn't even know what to do with himself anymore and in an effort to move around protect himself and her has ended up with more power than he could ever have imagined and all of that has been completely upended and uprooted by the notion of what it means to have had dragons involved in this entire conflict that he watched unfold since the earliest time he probably knows better than anyone how this has all happened and ultimately how pointless it all is because we're one dragon away from everyone being wiped out and all of history meaning nothing so, you know, you could say there's a lot behind each line that he's going to be saying. They're rather heavy. And uh, his oath is all that, like, surrounds all of this. So having Gwen come up to him and say something like this is almost, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> Did you want me Comical, to explain all this almost, to you? Kind yeah. Of, like, um, it's. He sees. It's like, I want to. Cole is almost like seeing an old version of himself. In Gawain, like, oh, you're doing this for honor, yeah. you're doing this for, you know, this is the right thing to do, and because you have a lot of, you know, you think it's virtuous, and da-da-da, it's like, oh, those, those halcyon days of my, <laughs> my, I, I would say my youth, but it kind of was, yeah, it was a while ago, but. He's someone uh, they didn't really age up. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, no, he looked exactly it, the same the whole time. Hey, some people, they got it. <laughs> yes, you know? they some do. Some people just, some people got it. Uh. 
Gwen says that uh, he's a steward's son from Dawn and he's fucking the Queen of the Seven Kingdoms, obviously thinking very highly of his sister and that this is just a gross thing that's happened in general. And Cole responds, first of all, former Queen. And you might assume from that that he's almost being tongue-in-cheek of, like, correcting him, but it's not. He says, uh, she's broken no oath for all that I have done. So the angle there being to protect her immediately on the accusation, but not defending himself at all, basically. He's just like, yeah, what I did was, yeah, I fucked up. Oh, wait, is, is it, I guess that's to imply that she never had her affair while Viserys was alive? Yeah, she's not necessarily done anything wrong. It's obviously still something she absolutely should not do. It's just that yeah. um, she didn't betray her vow to um to the king. Yeah, she was mm -hmm. fucking someone, not fucking over someone. And... You know, she's. It's not quite as bad as fucking the current queen. I guess the. Is she even considered? What What is Alicent right now? She's queen dowager, is it? Dowager queen. Yeah. Yeah, dowager queen. So, try, like, it's, it's somewhat moving in a way that's like trying to protect her somewhat. And he says that um, I could send you to the wall. And then he says, yeah, but you'd stay in the high tower name for a generation, the king's mother and his hand. And so so quickly basically makes clear you're not going to do shit. It would be crazy for you to do that. You, you do more damage <laughs> than anything. And, it, um, is, it is fascinating how effortlessly he's wheeling yeah. out all of these perfect arguments essentially to... Uh, it's like he knows all of it. Crazy. As in like he's yeah. thought about this. <laughs> like, or maybe thought about this conversation coming up. I get the feeling like while on the march with Gwen, he was sort of waiting for this to happen. Or at least some inquest of this variety. Maybe. Yeah, well, yeah he certainly wasn't shocked that it happened. Yeah. Oh, he doesn't even flinch when he puts the sword to his throat. Yeah. He's like, hmm. And of course, part of that is his general black pilled sort of demeanor. But I think it is also partially that he knew this was coming. It's just like if Allison's brother slits my throat with a broadsword, honestly, I could see myself going out way worse ways. Well, and I like, um, after all of that, Gwen just says, She's my sister. That's what it comes down to, essentially, like removing all of the, mm -hmm. the ranks and roles and honor and oaths. It's like, you. you Fuck you for doing this. And I think that that appeal it pushes um, Cole then to be like, okay, she saved my life twice over. Once from the breaching of the oath, another from when he tried to kill himself. And since then, he's done nothing but essentially worship her. Like he, And he doesn't mean that in a sense that it's um, something he's locked into. More so that he really does love her. And that's what she yeah, did for him. she's North Star. Like, yeah, he says that the he's beacon that to come he follows, which wars too. <laughs> feels appropriate for the high towers having the uh, the the beacon that is their towers as part of their house as well. So it's you know him explaining basically you shouldn't feel too much shame for her because this has all happened as a result of her doing something incredibly kind for me. Like, you know she's a good person basically, like trying to assure that for uh, Gwen, and that he says uh, desire for women has brought me grief after grief. I find very, very funny. <laughs> Tonight's guest, I'm fresh and fit. <laughs> and then Gwen says, resist it. He says, oh, would it be that simple? <laughs> yeah, cool. man. It's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily that easy. And yeah, um, I think that's good confirmation, too, of the line in prior episodes where he said he was trying to uh, protect Allison from having to make decisions that involve the deaths of thousands of people or horrific like assassinations or whatever have you he truly does care a hell of a lot about her and thinks that it's probably better that she isn't the one that's doing all of that instead get a person like Eamon to do it get this done quick like if one had assumed that he might have been subverting her and pulling his lot in with Eamon I think that this scene confirms that's not the case it was a matter of uh, keeping her out of a place that he thinks is only going to hurt her anyway yeah he legitimately did care um I mean the fact that he used her real name um, yeah. there is, I mean, even when you look back on him, not, I guess, supporting her for who takes over, you know, while Aegon's recovering, he really did want to keep her out of this terrible business, especially because he has personally seen how awful it is and the kinds of terrible things that will have to be done now, especially the dragons are involved. Was... He wants to keep her clean in a way. <clears throat> yeah, I think so. Pure. Save her from having to deal with all this shit. Mm -hmm. Uh... And having that if many he can barely handle it. If... Yeah. Well, like he's a seasoned veteran. You know, he's seen he's he's done and seen a lot of crazy shit. If he's you know having, you know, if he's wavering in his ability to handle it, like, geez, what what'll it be like for her? 
And so uh, Gwen says, King's God, they, they do it. Why can't you do it? That he says, well, maybe they do. do they? Or maybe <laughs> yeah. all men are corrupt and true honor is a mist that melts the morning. But he says, that's a bleak philosophy. And he's like, I have no philosophy. Which is, it's all just like, good God. <laughs> Sometimes it's yeah. just, I was like, yeah, I just, Sorry, I, just call it, like... I just call it as I see it, all right? I ain't got no philosophy. This is what the world has taught me, nothing more. One, uh, it's super interesting for him to think about that all of that weight he put on honor, that he's now wondering whether or not all of that comes from people who aren't even sticking to their oaths. I wonder how many people in history who are considered the most honorable ever weren't even doing it. Because how long is... He's now Lord Commander and the King's Hand, and he's won several battles. He'll be written about in history, possibly one of the most honorable kings, God, or whatever, when he's dealing with more shame than he would imagine anyone ever has in relation to oaths. And so then it makes you wonder, it's like, I couldn't be the first person, right? It was probably mm -hmm. more. And then it's like, what if it's everyone? What if everybody is breaking their <laughs> fucking oaths and we just don't talk about it? What if we all just <laughs> suck? What if we're all terrible? Yeah, hence Gwen being like, I mean, that's... <laughs> Damn. I mean, in a sense, it almost strikes me like a coping mechanism. The idea that, like, it isn't just him, mm -hmm. it's everyone. Yeah. Well, and I'm not, failing, yeah. it makes the failing less personal. He does leave it open as a possibility, right? He's not, because yeah. he definitely is ashamed of himself. Um, but he, he uses that to dodge uh, the appeal to, well, some of them manage. Yeah. Well, and, he's, and he moves on to say his philosophy was to protect the righteous, dispense justice on the rest, but now you saw what I saw. The dragons dance and men are like dust under their feet and all our fine yeah. thoughts, all of our endeavors are as nothing. We march toward oh. our annihilation. To die will be a kind of relief, don't you think? Oh my god, oh, the, the lines, the writing. That's that is so, shade uh, of pill so darker good. than it's, black. It's, it's like poetry, goddammit. Yeah, really grim poetry. Pretty much. And I mean, it basically puts into perspective the nature of this conflict. Because, I mean, you know, he's right, right? Like, what what is the nature of any of his philosophy when, at the end of the day, it's all going to be decided by these, like, mythical, like, monsters in the sky that are, uh, that are fighting each other as though the humans on the ground don't even exist. Yeah, we're the, we're like... the, the low poly background of the dragon's fight. <laughs> In yeah, we're sense, the lazy yeah, like, JPEGs in the stadium. That you know, that was, that was what, what he realized at the end of episode four, is what has been set in motion is beyond his capacity now. It's, be it's beyond, like, any individual human's capacity. And what are you meant to do with that, other than be like, well, shit, I mean, I guess when I die, because it's probably it's a when, not an if. I mean, shit, yeah, I guess I'll die, right? Like, what, what do you and do? And he's been left with no sort of faith in either side on that in that regard after what exactly. he's seen with Aemon and Aegon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's it doesn't like even what, matter what who is wins. the righteous cause here of who wins? All that's going to happen is a bunch of people are going to die and nothing's going to change. So yeah, it, it's he, as he said, they do march towards their annihilation. They he, do. He can, he can believe whatever the hell he wants about what what is right or who should sit the Iron Throne, who is more valorous or just or what have you. But then at the end of the day, then Vagar steps on him and he's gone forever. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And there, nowhere Vagar is doesn't safe, even know really. he was there. You can actually almost use it as motivation to be like, I might as well just far, fight as hard as I can and oh. try to win because yeah, see, I don't know. I almost, fart. That, that was probably one of my funniest. You times might as Cole is like, I might as well fart. I tried to blow yeah. through it, but you got me. Oh, yeah, I bet you tried to blow through it. <laughs> but yeah, For so cute. might as well fight as hard as you can because you're trying to avoid the dragon is not really something you should be thinking about because nowhere is safe on that battlefield. There could be fire or a dragon landing on anywhere. Certainly. For, hum for human beings to actually occupy a world with uh, dinosaur-like creatures would definitely fuck with people in terms of like what their place is in the universe, what the mm -hmm. significance is of their lives, to be so low on the pecking order, you know, that like armies can just be evaporated in a matter of seconds, regardless of, you know, who which war of human beings deserve to win over the other, like in, in relation to dragons, even just having like a stupid fight where they, you know, one just pissed off the other over nothing, you know, and then they leave a, this sort of bloodbath in their wake without any thought as to the lives that they're destroying. Like Cole has fully taken the time to comprehend this more so than I think anybody 
else because he's seen the worst it has to offer. Like it's one thing to be sort of peripherally aware of dragons and like to just see them occasionally fly overhead because, you know, you, you know they're real, but like there's still a sort of air of mysticism about them. But like to see what he's seen where it's just like in a matter of seconds, an entire battlefield is just molten tar and everybody's just skeletons and people on fire screaming like that's a fucked up thing to see. Yeah. Um, it's like transform them. And I, I love the way that this conversation is built. The uh, we, we address the individual sort of like it was my sister. We've got the, the ranks and roles they're supposed to play and oaths taken. And then the admission that that portion of his oath has been on his mind since we've met him as a character. But the other side of it, the defend the innocent and, you know, destroy the, the evil, that sort of stuff. Um, as much as that was something he always believed in, that it would have been shaken completely by Rook's Rest and the results of that, along with the introduction of his understanding fully of dragons, which makes all of it meaningless. All of those things that was in his head, the backs and forths of how to behave, what to do, all this stuff... And then the history of the world is just like, good God, what does any of it even mean? Why am I even, like, spending so much time thinking about it? And then, unfortunately, he's fallen down the hole of, you know what? Let's just die. Be done with this shit. At least when you're dead, <laughs> you don't have to worry about any of it. Which yeah. is uh, really sad, really depressing, and um, we discussed this last time, but I, I would say it would be really neat if we could get an ending for him that restores some sense of meaning through action. Like, he gets to feel the despite his role in this world being so minuscule, despite his honor having been destroyed, there's still actions he can take that'll mean a lot to those who are still here and those who still care, and that, that that in and of itself is worth it. You know, like, he still has a role to play. I would prefer that than him walking on the battlefield and just going, kill me, dragon, and it goes... Like, there we go. Told you mm -hmm. it was meaningless. Well, he, <laughs> he just he, he turns into the Joker just like, come on, I want you to do it, I want okay. you to do it. Come on, hit me! Come on, hit me! <laughs> <laughs> the, the criticism he's the criticism he's getting like he's done some things that have pissed people off and now he's in this sort of irredeemable category where he should only get scenes that reinforce how bad he is <laughs> so stupid he reminds me of um theon Greyjoy, you know yeah. who's a guy who's established to be morally ambiguous and doing some pretty reprehensible things but then goes through the ringer to such a harsh degree and comes out the other side in a in a respectable light you know he, he has a very mm -hmm. meaningful arc i suspect they're sort of doing the same thing with it, with cole here where he is being put through the ringer in a different way where he's just seeing the most horrific shit uh, you know on the battlefield and i like that Gwen sits next to him after all that just being like fuck <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, they are right you convinced me all of the wind out of his sails you want yeah. a beer or what? <laughs> uh, this shit, like, what was that? A minute? The the sheer amount of work that just got done is it's there is a fluctuation of the quality of the writing in this show. I'm not going to deny that. And uh, yeah. if it were all this degree, it would be like an eleven out of ten. This show would be unstoppable. Yeah. It would be is legendary. The, is the credited writer per uh, for each episode writing every bit of that episode, or is it more like? Certain people have different arcs that they're writing, and then they cut them up into episodes. Really, the good thing question. is, it really depends on what the writers' know. room is. It depends. Different writers' rooms have different approaches when it comes to the nature of what does crediting somebody for an episode of television mean in terms yeah. of their total contribution. It could be a hundred percent. It could be considerably less than that. I mean, it could be uh, the case that like all of it gets filtered through one writer who like unifies it under a certain style. It's hard to know. I think in most cases, all the writers, staff writers, some interns or staff ass or writing assistants are all in one room and they hash out all the plot beats together and they sort of bounce questions off each other. And then when they feel like they've got a whole episode sort of plotted out, those will be assigned to individuals. It's like you write episode one, you write episode two, maybe well, one I, episode I will have writing that... partners like... That yeah, is how this show seems to be credited, right? It's only it's usually like one lead writer per episode. And well, yeah, but that's, I just... that's like normal though for basically all television shows. Normally one person will be credited as the writer, but there's always a writer's room. 
Uh, I guess what I'm getting at is it, it would be difficult for me to believe that the person that wrote the philosophy tube scene at the beginning also wrote the Kristen Cole scene. <laughs> uh, I, I well, would, I mean, I, I guess it's uh, the philosophy tube's issue isn't necessarily the writing. Beings. It's the cringe guess, acting and the immersion shattering. There is that one line, though. Yeah. I, I suppose it is hard, right? It's it's difficult to reconcile, like, when um somebody uh, writes, or like, like one line of dialogue that's really amazing and another one that's bad. Um, kind of reminds me again of how, like, there's no way that the man who wrote the Vat of Acid episode of Rick and Morty also wrote Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. <laughs> and it's, like, irreconcilable to me as a thing that could even be the case. Yeah, I get you. Well, Wait, it's, sometimes we... we'll never know the answer. Even if, uh, I think even if an episode has a single writing credit, that will still, that script will still go to the showrunner. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, for a, for a proofreading. And then it's just like, change this, change this, change this. And then the changes get made, but it's still the guy who wrote the draft that gets the sole credit. So, uh, mm. next up, because that, that, that is that scene. It's so good, gosh darn it. But we so gotta, gotta keep on moving. Good. It does a good job of bookending Kristen Cole for the season, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it puts him in an interesting position um, in terms of like the meta of the season break. And what will happen to him? What we would want to see happen to him? Because it's not like he's set in stone in terms of you know the path that he's going. But now it's very clear: this is who he is. This is what led him here. Who knows I, what will happen they've, next? They've set him up in a way that whether his fate ends up being like dark or light, ultimately it will make it, it will mean more after scenes like this because it's like well yeah because we can they put in the work to get him to this point yeah we'll be so, happy if he wins now and more sad if he dies um yeah in a sense like you want to see like you can't help but want the guy to be all right you know after everything he's done mm -hmm. after all this he's have to you know put up with after everything that's happened to him you really do feel super bad for him and you want things to you want things to work out well you do wonder, like, man, this is the this is the character that last season was basically begging a young Rhaenyra to run away with him to go to some place and they could just be happy and live together and leave all this bullshit behind. Mm -hmm. and, and look at him now. Look at him now. He went from there to filled with sort of like righteous vengeance against Rhaenyra and her faction, and now we're here. None now of it he's matters. like, ah, oh, fuck it, yeah. It's, uh... Uh, yeah, so, I mean, you know, th th there's a, several endings you could write for him. I, I hope they give him respect instead of making him, like, an asshole that dies, you know? It's, uh, yeah, and I <laughs> certainly hope that people see him as more than the asshole who died. Because that would be a a criminal thing for people to think after all that has been all said. All the work they've done. done, you know? Anyway, uh, we're off to Reyna... Trying to, you know, cheer up Jace, who feels inadequate, which is uh, very much an expected close to this sort of arc somewhat. The, um, or, well, I say close, who knows how long it'll go on for. But she says the, um, the important thing is not any particular symbol like hair color or riding a dragon as opposed to the actions you take as the role. So making himself much more official and accepted as the heir to the throne would involve being by his, his mum's side, the queen, and taking action that relates to that, and that that's what he should be more concerned with instead of whether or not he's taken seriously, he should be doing important actions. Like, the thing with the twins probably would have been considered a very good move, so do more of that, which, uh, you know, I'm inclined to agree. And uh... Yeah, I'm down. I like where they're, I like where they're taking him. I like his... Um... The, the idea that, oh, all these bastards, oh, aren't they bastards, and I am one too, and, you know, I've had to deal with all this crap for all my life. Where does my value come from? What will people, you know, think of me if they can do it too? And this element of, you know, do the right thing, do good stuff, give them a reason to like you, and those in the end will win people over. I think that runs, you know, decently parallel with a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of good messages that this this show might try to tell the people like, yeah, sure. You, you might have a dragon. You might not have a dragon, but there's a lot of stuff you can do. And, you know, Viserys didn't have a dragon, you know, and a lot of, a lot of good stuff with Jace. I think it's, I think his position's very understandable and it's good that he has someone mm -hmm. to kind of open up with in that way. So mm -hmm. he can kind of let his more vulnerable side show um, instead of having to not put up a front, 
because he's being earnest in these ways, but you know that he can, uh, you know, like he can, we can explore this side of him. Because apart from going to the bridge, he hasn't done all that much in terms of like actions, right? He's been present here, and he's had a quite a number of good scenes, actually. I think in terms of like the average scene quality per character, I think Jace is pretty high up. Um, so yeah, I can't think of can't think of a bad scene he had this season. I think it's not much in a show of his them, acting though. chops, which he has plenty of. Yeah, he had good range. He can be indignant at Ulf. He could be a little bit, you know, resigned at, you know, with, um, oh, with Bela. Is, her, is that her name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Bela here. Um, he can, you know, show, you know, energy and he can come across as, you know, like not, I mean, kind of arrogant and classist in a way, but, you know, it makes sense for the world. And, uh, of course, the, you know, after. Uh, one of the first scenes he, I think the first scene this season that he had with Rhaenyra, you know, he was like, you know, being emotional. A lot of, a lot of good range for this character. We've kind of seen him in basically every, <laughs> running through the, the whole gambit of emotions here. Kind Which... of a sleeper in a way uh, character, but it's like a good one, a really good one. Yeah. I think the only Very reason he's sleeper is just, of good he hasn't had a huge amount to do. Yeah, yeah. He hasn't done that much. He's done one thing, and it was good, and it worked out well. And it showed that he had the cojones to do it, and some skill, and, you know, the speech craft, and the politicking, you know, nature of things. But apart from that, it's kind of been him reacting to all the things that are going on around him, and character work primarily with his mother. And so, moving forward, we... Uh... Get to have the big old dinner scene, which we like dinner scenes here. We're very, dinner uh, scene, dinner scene. Dinner scenes. EFAP so. is pro dinner scene. Whatever, there, man, if we could just throw dinner scenes into shows to fix them, we would do it. Because, oh, there are so many shows in desperate need of good dinner scenes. So, uh, it opens with Rhaenyra basically saying, hey, to uh, us new writers, this is good stuff. You're not of noble birth, but you've done something never dreamed of, and you've been entrusted with power only few know, and I charge you to take it up with fealty and respect. Serve me well, and I'll make you knights of the realm. And they do something interesting here of the three she's addressing would be Adam, Ulf, and Hugh, and the notion of being made a knight. It's like you have three reactions that are all very different. Ulf's f first being, oh wow, you hear that? We're going to be knights. Neat. Just like that. And then... Adams is we will not fail you, my queen. And Hughes is what are we what are we gonna do? It's uh Yeah, we don't we don't have to be evil, do we? Because <laughs> I don't know about the evil. the three like sort of notions of loyalty, the one being one hundred percent, one not even thinking about loyalty, just the coolness of being a knight, and then one being like, Well, it depends. What what does yeah. this involve? You have unconditional loyalty, conditional loyalty, and no loyalty, in oh. a sense. So, you can see They're... how to, especially from Rhaenyra's perspective, how, you know, unconditional loyalty to her is obviously, that's what you want. You know, that you want that, because they're being loyal to you. But from a, a, for a more moral and virtuous standpoint, your loyalty to someone should be conditional based off of who that person is and what they do quite economic in terms of screenplay writing yeah like, it's good stuff okay we're, we're we're bringing three characters to the table let's all have them do like ra go in radically different directions or explore maximally different territory because you might as well not have two characters overlap that would just be a waste of screen time so Rhaenyra says you're gonna fly in two days the strongholds of the usurper being old town and Lannisport and their armies must be subdued along with their allies uh, alone, without allies, they will have no choice but to surrender. Which is apparently the first she's even made mention of this to this selection of people, because even Baylor immediately says, you want us to kill innocent people? And then Hugh says, and so many, on top of that. So many. Like, he's already thinking, his his eyes are kind of looking out, and he's like, ooh. He's, he he's... doesn't seem happy mm. at all. Yeah, like, um, it's, it's a very interesting thing, but honestly, I can't resist being a bit critical of this. Rhaenyra should know better than to drop this on people. Yep. I don't even know how this was dropped on Baylor. Baylor should have a very strong understanding of the nature of war right now. But if I wanted to introduce the notion that we're going to be killing a whole bunch of people that are going to involve innocence in towns to cripple our enemy, I'd need to give him a full history. I'd be like, listen, okay? Yeah. 
we got we got so many things that have happened and these are how war this is how wars are won bringing callers bringing the advisors bring people who know what they're actually talking about to these literal commoners who have lived lives just trying to scrape by don't know what exactly they're doing with their drive it's something that Rhaenyra doesn't appreciate at all is that you understand the people you're planning on destroying are have lived lives that these guys have and so they're going to have things to say that'll be different from your average lord you have to you have yeah. to appreciate that you're not that retarded that you wouldn't know that um the thing is you don't even need to go that far because even Baylor, someone who has grown up right next to Rhaenyra and has uh, appreciated the whole weight of this war even being relied upon as a patrol is surprised so clearly this is a bad way to approach this and she should have done it much more carefully to make sure they understand every last piece and address all of their concerns it was something we brought up uh, in the original recording, and we're gonna do it again because I have to, gosh darn it. There are options, okay, as a writer. Many options. The thing about the Blacks as it stands is, I think, and it, it, it's probably gonna happen, I mean, how could you resist? I have a feeling one of the dragons, especially if Reyna gets Sheep Stealer, I feel mm -hmm. like one of these dragons is gonna betray the Blacks. Now, as a writer, which one would you pick? For me, it suggested that uh, I think the show is aiming to Ulf being the one that would turn, but I have a feeling it's going to be Hugh instead, that he's kind of a red herring. He's not actually necessarily going to turn. He might be a wacky, chaotic element, but Hugh feels like the one that might actually turn on principle. Yes, and, um, yeah, exactly, because he has yeah. principles. He will be the one who will say, I have limits, and I will not do everything that is asked of me if I think it's evil. Then uh, yeah, all you have to do so is so that could be the reason why he maybe not even necessarily switch, but just take his dragon and fuck off. Yeah, the the very few lines we've got of him are already feel like the writers are saying, "Hey, that guy, he's not fully on board here." Yep. Now I think a missed opportunity is that we could have had an explanation of the current state of war and everything that's happened to further justify their involvement, right? And she could let clear. Yeah, we did the gullet thing, and then uh, Masaria came up with this fucking genius plan of essentially giving the people of King's Landing their own food back under our banner to pull them to our side and make the crown look pathetic. And you know, while she's explaining this genius plan that worked really well, you could just have the camera slowly listing off to uh, Hugh and Ulf to an extent, where they could just be like, wow. My daughter's starved. Yeah, literally that. Yeah. But not letting her know, letting us know that he's taken all this information in and he realizes, holy shit, I'm working for the bad guys to attack the bad guys. You're all fucking bad guys. <laughs> You're all bad guys. <laughs> so it's, you know, and uh, that's a better way, I think, to develop it instead of we're going to go destroy everyone. Well, aren't those innocents? Yes, but it's necessary. You know, to me, that feels a lot more clunky and, and why would you do it that yeah. way? Like, um, you would expect characters to ask a lot of questions. Is this necessary? You're going to have think... to sell me on this. And R R Rhaenyra should sense the obvious hesitation in people. Like, two of the yeah, four people know there with dragons are, are like, wait, what? So you need to instantly clarify. He's like, whoa, time out. Time out. Let, me, let me rephrase that. I, I worded that cl clunkily. <laughs> Clun clunkily. Let me rephrase so that you don't hate me exactly <laughs> yeah because um, if all three of those dragon riders switch sides in that room the war would be over and the greens would win exactly so i don't like that Rhaenyra doesn't take more care with it and i don't like that the writers didn't take more care of it in general that there's better ways to build this all up and the fact that we know his daughter died but he has no reason to tell anybody in that room that that's the case or why she died is a huge boon to the writing right now that's just something yep. that you can use whenever you want and i think they will use it I'm just already kind of sitting here thinking, I feel like you should have uh, built the, this better already. Because, yeah, um, I, I've seen it complained. It's like, why would she say they're going to nuke Old Town and Lannisport as opposed to just the armies? And I don't know if they're actually trying to say about her that she wants to do more than nuke the armies. She wants to go and nuke their families <laughs> or something. And in which case, it's like, yeah, this this really does need an explanation, Radira, if you're going to say this shit. Yeah, why not just go and strafe the army? We got that army and everything, the one that... Like the one that a uh, coal is at, and well, isn't, they've got to know about. Isn't these, it crazy? The movements of these large amounts of men. She's announcing this plan in a way that's obstructing like the understanding from all the people that are going to be the most important in the war. Where are her council? Where's Corlys? Did you discuss this with them? 
Is this a plan of action that they reached, and then she has to go and tell them all alone? Because I feel like there would have been a really interesting discussion to be had, and to, to be honest with you, they need to be a part of it, the Dragon Riders. you got to get them in, they got to understand the logic behind all of this. Well, You're the good I guys, I just don't think right? Are interested at all in like the council scenes on the black side? They don't fucking care. They don't think that's just kind of the Rhaenyra show, on, unfortunately. You don't even no, get Masaria <laughs> this time around. No, that's true. She'll come later when yes. in the one, two, three punch um, of terribleness. <laughs> but it's uh, it really is fascinating that um, the Green Council, each of the individual council members, uh, like developed characters in and of themselves of varying importance that all have their own perspective and motivations that play into how rich with subtext those scenes are. But with the Black Council, we rarely see them, and if we do, it's it's like, it's vacuous a lot of the time. Very or it's or the most shallow thing of, oh, look, he's drinking. He's, he's, the hinges, they're coming off. He's becoming <laughs> unhinged. Who knows what he'll do? That's like it. That's the only point of these scenes. I don't get it. Why wouldn't you want to have two parallel council, um, uh, dynamics with like what? their own subtext why are you interested in developing these people as characters on the black side yeah what, what do you lose by trying to do that so far like, all we have is from broom from is kind of an <laughs> asshole and keltigar is kind of an asshole that's what they but want clearly the writer's opinion them. is that they're an yeah. asshole yeah yeah and the one cool guy you burned him so huh great <laughs> I yeah, it, it's a it makes it's a me bit wish the twins were still around. I I still hold that. I think they they wrapped up the whole the the Eric and um, Arik, Arik. Uh, the, the they wrapped them up too soon. We should have kept them around for longer. I think that would have been. I think we got rid of them too quick. Uh, but yes, lots of issues here, and uh, we'll see how this unravels exactly. But it it's already feeling like it very much could unravel. There's um. A bit of like chaos in the way that things are being discussed, and Ulf is a uh, is obnoxious, a bit loud. Describes Silverwing as a goer, and they're afraid of nothing. And Adam is like, you know, annoyed with them, and see, he's like, we'll see which of us is the coward. That's this sort of rabbly thing. And then she's like, hey, hey, hey knights will comport themselves with grace yeah. at the queen's table. Right. Back and to the murder. Ulf says, uh, well, then make me a knight, which is. You know, pretty fucking aggressive in a way, but kind of fun. And uh, in the background, you can see a, a king's guard pull a sword out when he says that, because it's like, yeah, you know, he's, rude. He's a bit like, oh shit, you're so rude. I might have to lop your head off. And uh, he's like, eh, you're just fucking hell. Sense of humor would do everybody here good. And it's why I get this sense that they're pushing us toward Ulf being the one that's going to screw everything up. When I think that the the sleeper hit will be, it's it's Hugh. Yeah. I think so. I, th I think there's a lot of reasons for that. It's um obviously the fact that in this scene is like, wait, you want us to burn yeah. like innocent people? That's I don't like that. And then the fact that there may just be the revelation of like putting it all together of you know his daughter. The reason why she's uh, died was because of the blockade. That was Rhaenyra's choice. What was framed as like a positive of oh hey she's helping and giving us food. Maybe he'll. Yeah, maybe he'll actually decide, no, I, th she's responsible, I'm gonna get her. Yeah, I could do with a scene where uh, it does get pretty high tension and you reveals to Rhaenyra, it's like, you killed my daughter. Just as simple as that. It would be pretty mm -hmm. interesting. And it would be nice to get some pressure on her for the decision she's made across this war. That well, that's, in that's what's much needed at this point, is, is uh, reality to come back in and say, you know, Rhaenyra, you made a lot of very bad decisions, and you need to understand... That's the case, or at least decisions that have consequences. You know, it's yeah, uh, it'd be nice to get. Or at least, there. at least own your choices. I guess one thing I do appreciate with regards to Ulf here is the idea that this guy clearly does not know his place. Is like that's somewhat worrisome enough on its own, but he has a dragon. Uh, that's something you want to take seriously. A person who, in the social order of things, does not seem to have a clear understanding of his role in things, and he has a weapon of mass destruction. Yeah. Almost feels like they probably contemplate, like, maybe we just kill yeah. him. <laughs> Lop his head off and try again is yeah. a legitimate consideration. So, uh, yeah, and she needs to leave because she's gotten word from Simon Strong that there is treachery afoot at Harren Hall. And oh. so uh, she immediately calls Adam to accompany her, which makes the most sense considering the. Uh, yep. He's the one who just said, yep, I'll do whatever you want, Jace. basically. 
Yeah, Jay's not, not feeling good about it, though. He should, and I think that's going to be a deliberate thing of he's probably... He's still not gotten over it. He's still having trouble with the... Yeah. With his role. Because, yeah, this is an attempt to protect him. It's, uh, the thing is, she probably shouldn't even be going, but she's definitely pissed off at this point. And she wants to know what is happening in Harren Hall, and the fact that she can take a dragon with her uh, is going to make her feel a lot more protected. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair that she goes, yeah. Which Some takes us to show up in person for her. to Harren Hall. <gasps> Harren Hall, we're back, baby. There you go. Yeah, that's the, that's the kind of vibe that it should be. So it should be a red carpet. I've shed all my tears of happiness. Exactly. I have, I have, I have energy reserves yet, yeah, always to spend on Harren Hall. So, uh, evil witch lady. Well, I Yay. say evil. She's pretty chill, actually. Uh, she's she yeah, seems cool. she's shedding a tear when uh, we see her. By the way, she says, I wonder if we'll get more context on that, or if we're supposed to imagine what it means. In any case, it could be that she's thinking about what she's about to show Damon, to be honest with you. Um, it was quite funny, by the way, she wakes him up and he says, do you never sleep, witch? It's pretty funny. Always at night. No. Hour no. of the owl or the wolf or whatever they say. But, um, yeah, uh, Damon has arguably been given now everything he needs to make his decision, except... Something that he's not been as aware of, but would be more in open to now as information. It's something Ryan was mentioning earlier. The uh, something he would have ignored Ooh. or thought insane back in the yeah, day. Yeah, the weird stuff. The, now the he's kind of ready. Supernatural. So uh, yeah, he gets a hand on the tree and goes whoosh and sees a trailer for the future. Uh, getting a little <laughs> hype. Like, oh my god, look, Game of Thrones. I remember oh, season eight. <laughs> Brand new TV shows that have definitely never been made before and definitely didn't have three final seasons. And this is something that you can go to other places on the internet for speculation as to what exactly the visions relate to from source material slash future telling stuff. For us, it's just a lot of cool imagery that could mean a lot of things. Some of it is from Game of Thrones, or at least is supposed to be implied as a similar story, such as Daenerys sitting there with her three dragoons yeah. at the end of season one of Game of Thrones. It's like, hmm... A lot of people believe this is confirmation that she is the one in the prophecy, when, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it could mean fucking anything. It is a series be... of visuals. Yep. And, I mean, it could be anybody, really. She is... It might be someone else. She's not the only uh, lady with white hair and dragons, maybe? Well, no, and, and I is the one that kills the Night King, so, you know, whatever. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> if we want to you... go that direction. Do you think that they will ever commit to this show being in the same continuity as the Game of Thrones show that has been I made? It's funny or you say that. I don't think we've got it... any uh, any line from him yet, but I mean, don't see anything stop. Like, uh, the thing about it is, any exec could feel that that's a good decision because it makes people feel like there's a huge story being told across all kinds, and collector's editions would include them both. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a very... I, I see why someone would I see why an executive would do yeah. that, but I feel like that would be a mistake. I feel like well, that's one of those if there I feel was like one it's thing one of those un that deserves yeah. a redo in history. There's a lot of things that deserve a fucking redo in history. But season eight of Game of Thrones yeah. would be one that genuinely it was like the, the most why don't you just redo it thing ever. Really just the whole back half I of just Game of Thrones. the the it idea like of general apprehension to redoing anything because you're basically like redoing it in that sense of we fucked up, let's try again because it's, you have to we admit need Game that you of Thrones up. Brotherhood. Uh, yeah. I, I personally do it really. Yeah, yeah, just do yeah. the real version again and everyone will be fine with it if it's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just don't really appreciate the hanging of so much of what is at stake with this series on what is going to happen in A Song of Ice and Fire slash Game of Thrones. I think it shrinks the world in a pretty that. palpable way, insofar as, yeah, everything is building up to a particular event rather than the history of the world having... I don't you know. know. I think I could sense. be a lot more happy with it if Game of Thrones ended amazingly, because I would be like, it's a really cool yeah. way of bringing yeah. all of the politicking to an end. Not necessarily to an absolute end, but to... It's like a constant looming threat that the whole point of it is all of you are making a mistake in being desperate to vie for power, for status, for revenge, for petty interests or values when mm -hmm. ultimately what we should be doing is trying to celebrate fucking living in general and take advantage of every last experience. And 
bit of time you have on this world and that the White Walkers represent the freezing over and death of everything. And so we've got to work together to stop them and appreciate life for what it is, and that should be applicable across all of the works of A Song of Ice and Fire stuff. I could totally see that. Unfortunately, it ends horribly, and I hate everything about Season 8 of Game <laughs> of Thrones, so I don't what? like being reminded of his existence. I'm like, stop. Tell your own story. What it, yeah, what it reminds that's, that's me of I, most I that's better, though, is I, I think that I got a lot of satisfaction out of the ending of Better Call Saul, mostly because Breaking Bad was quite good. I think if Breaking Bad ended horribly, I wouldn't really care as much about anything that's even mm. happening in Better Call Saul. So like, it, it, you do get... You get a much better feeling when all of it refers to good stuff as opposed to it like being like, oh, yeah, then the story's going to be terrible at the end. Do you guys see the story about Kit Harrington that came out recently? It might have been like today or yesterday. It was, he was just recently. Talking about, yeah. yeah. Everyone which, was tired. I think I know what you're talking about. So it, apparently his Jon Snow solo show was like being in development for a little while and he had his own like directors and writers trying to get it done but then they just kind of pulled the plug on it but and since then he's just like yeah i don't even want to watch house of the dragon i just i want to i want to leave all of westeros behind me at this point so well, i thought john like was he's never gonna play referencing the quotes about him saying that um season eight was kind of like a particular way but it was always going to be that way because everyone was exhausted Yes, that's what I took. Oh, from yeah. it. It, it was interesting to hear that perspective. Like, it wasn't just the showrunners and writers that had had enough. I think, according to him, a lot of the actors were just done, which is really troubling to hear, you know? Yeah. And it's just like, what's the solution to that? Sh should they have taken a year off? Could they afford that with the way certain young actors like age across the span of two or three years? Like, can they afford to do that? Like, and I think that would actually be the preferable option. Like, if everyone's that fucking exhausted, but you want to do the show right and everyone's willing to eventually come back to it, then maybe they should have just taken a year or two off and then come back and do two, maybe three seasons just to tie everything yeah, up properly. Just, I mean, if you're, you're approaching the end of what's like nine, like basically a decade's worth of work and a decade's worth of the cultural dominance, like maybe yeah. if you said, you know what, we're going to give this last season to wrap everything up an extra year of polish to work on. That's like, sort of what Stranger Things man, has been doing. hype. Stranger Things mm -hmm. has been really taking its time for its last few seasons, and I mean, it's it's a show that was very clearly based around young actors, and I think they're just That's... like, now we're going to use the time jump as part of the story and take our time with this, make sure it's good. That's I true. mean, who knows That's if a good the last point. one will be good, but I, I think they're at least kind of doing the right thing here. I wish Game mm -hmm. of Thrones had done that. I wouldn't be surprised if some of them are in their 30s now and they're still playing like you know, high school kids or whatever. That's like well, I think that the, um, <laughs> the, the time jump is being factored into the story. So like, they're, oh. they're kind of using it. And I, I'm like, well, I have no problem with that. That would also kind of solve the teleporting problem in the later Game of Thrones season. It's like, well, yeah, this, this yeah. war's taken a while, you know, like it takes a while for these people to get places. Yeah, time jump would be acceptable between seasons. If, it, if, it, if that's what it takes I don't, to do it right. Well, not to get off topic, because uh, we're somehow, we've already beaten the length of our previous recording, by the way. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> hey, I'm hey, not sure how that, that happened. But, uh, we got things to say. We've had, we have we more had things time to, to say, think yeah. about it. Time for perspectives to develop, I guess. Um, the Mueller cut. So he, uh, some of the stuff he sees, a lot of death, a lot of blood, a lot of future flames, and it's uh, he sees Rhaenyra on the throne. As much as these visuals are all presented to us with some accompanying sound effects, it's not going to be the same experience as he had. Whatever this is, however it feels, he would likely have an experience of what feels like is coming and what feels should be done. These are harder to account for in terms of what we see and feel. We have to go off of what he says. But uh, it seems like it's an experience that had a profound effect on him. It, um, it's not accepted as anything other than a serious like bit of information that's been provided to him about what the future holds and what needs to be done. Whereas before it would have been seen as nonsense, insanity that he should ignore. So um, interesting for him, and we'll see the results of that soon enough. But one thing that happens of note during it is Helena spots him in the vision, and he looks a little bit like, what the fuck is going on? And she says, it's all a story and you're but one part in it. Know your part. Helena's a wacky character. So, right? so I guess I think Helena's always been weird. Um, so I guess 
the idea that these might be visions that she is experiencing maybe even semi regularly that she can she has them or can see them or something and that she's a part of other people's visions cuz i think it's pretty very strongly implied that she's doing this in real time she is aware of this vision that he is that the Damon's having and she can yeah like she's reaching out to him almost it. yeah yeah like we can communicate in this way through this magical vision and she's not just spouting nonsense dream stuff she's she's actually saying to him it's like yeah this is how this works it's a story here's your part in it you need to play your part it's important I mean, uh, the interpretation I would have is that she has a crazy level of knowledge about the future to the point where she's almost aware of what actions need to be taken to facilitate whatever future that may be, and a lot of it involves pain that she has to be, she has to go through and has already experienced. That would explain like some of the stuff to do with her uh, son. But then also, this unique level of knowledge makes her come above any sense of uh, the war that's being fought. It seems like she's she's already on board with the trying to get us to the point of winning that, that big war with the White Walkers. And so Eamon being like, we need you to jump on your dragon and stop burning people just doesn't even phase her at all. Is like, that's never going to yeah, fucking happen. Like, what would that accomplish? Like, what's, yeah. what's the point of that? This is all so trivial, relatively. Meanwhile, also, I really don't want to... Yeah, yeah. And uh, Damon, of course, just not really understanding fully what he's just gone through, but uh, relates, obviously, to... You got some big picture decisions to make, and whether or not you're going to lead or Rhaenyra is, or you together as a unit, you know, that's a big thing that he's now coming real close to making a final decision on. We'll get back to that, but for now, we got Aemond and Helena sharing a scene, which is a pretty good one. It is a very it is good a really one. good one. That's yep. the thing that is that uh, it looks like it. Whatever uh, that that her speaking to Damon was happening in real time, just based on the way that it's shot, that it like leads mm. right into this conversation. Yeah, yeah. I know uh, what you mean, it's interesting. While Helena's doing that, she is in a place. She's there at the Red Keep. She's looking out over the balcony. So, and I think that the scene needs to happen because I I don't think that Eamon is gonna just like accept like oh no my mom told me I can't do this I'd better not. He's like, no, and she's not here. Like, listen, we're, we're fucking doing this. All yeah. Right. He does make a case what? to her that it needs to happen. Gotta wipe out Damon, gotta wipe out the army. Otherwise, we'll be fucked. And she says, if I refuse, will you burn me like you did Aegon? And uh, the way she... The, both actors do such a fucking good job here. Uh, Aemon just gets weaker and weaker in this scene. Uh, quieter, and he's tearing up more and more while she's getting stronger and stronger with the more of the claims she makes. And... Uh, he says that's a lie, and then she says she saw it, that he burned him and let him fall, and uh, Aegon will be king again. You'll sit uh, an eye, a wooden throne, and you're gonna be dead. You'll be swallowed up in the god's eye, and you'll never be seen again. Which, um, I think what Aemon is... is at least somewhat aware of her ability slash, you know, she's a weird girl, but she still has weird insights into stuff, so I think he takes that somewhat seriously, uh, her saying all that shit. What is the God's Eye? It is a place a you, you don't need to worry about yet. Oh. All right. You'll get, uh, that's going to be a big season three thing. Uh, it's nearish to Harrenhal, but the, you know, they don't need to have given you any more information, so I don't think we need to worry about it just yet. All right. If you look at a map of Westeros, it's, it's a fairly large thing. Out near, uh, it's near Harrenhal, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, with that, he says, he whispers to her, I could have you killed, and she just says, it wouldn't change anything. <laughs> Which is kind of like a badass line of just, yes. okay. <laughs> really so good. Sh- like, what would the point of that be? Because what does he do with that information? He's just like, well, well, fuck you then. <laughs> like, oh yeah, you're, you're some... supposed to care. He goes into He's this having scene, like a right? Damon. It's like a Damon kind of moment. It's like, wait, no, no, I... You're supposed to care about that. Everyone else cares about that. Yeah. You're supposed to as well. What do you mean you don't care? He goes into the scene pretty strong and expecting he can probably convince her through being like, we're family and we're about to die if you don't do this sort of thing. But instead, it's completely turned on him. The The horrible shit he did to his brother is known by his sister. He is like a deceptive, selfish little prick. And then she establishes that he's gonna die. No one will ever see him again. He'll be like lost to time. And uh, the, the, like all of his plans are going to fall apart. 
and there's nothing you can do about it, and she's not even afraid of him threatening her. And it comes from his sister, you know, like a loved one, family and stuff. It's just, he's already in a pretty bad place. This is all just not what he needs to hear at all. And to be honest with you, I don't know how they're going to run season three, but I don't know how much time he has left as a character. I get the impression he might be close to the end. He's, uh, he really, it, it would, it seems kind of suitable that he would have climbed to the top and it's so rickety at all the decisions he made are all catching up with him. Yep, all those not friends he has, um, <laughs> all of the, yeah, the violence. And I assume that with this conversation, we're supposed to take it as she has the ability to just see things that she's not physically witnessing. She can, like, remote view. She can, she's just aware of events that happen in the world. He's always yeah, known. moves through dreams, and all of her dreams appear to be of different moments in time. Most of which haven't happened yet, but some of which happened a long time ago. By the way, just because this scene's so good for both of them, people saying that he's not a good actor. You could tell what? even from yeah, still. Come on. Like, <laughs> look at that expression. That's ridiculous. He's got an eye patch too. We're talking about how these people have to. He's operating get, oh, on half the eyes that exactly. most actors <laughs> get to use. But uh, where do you find all the these depth. awful opinions? Do you find Twitter, these on Reddit? They're filled with them. It's horrifying. Twitter, yeah, there, I have sent Fringy like fifty of, of them. <laughs> many, many popular, baffling perspectives on House of the Dragon. That's mm. that is that is absolutely the expression of someone who has just been told approximately twice now that his family would rather die than follow his course. Yeah. Well, and just this, it it's just, a haunting it fucking just... future she just painted. It's like, your plans mm -hmm. are not going to work, and you're, you're going to die. You're just going to die. That's it. Is it just reducing his performance down to, well, he's just being evil, and it's really easy to look evil if you have an eye patch on? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> a lot of it seems to come from people are quite angry at House of the Dragon for not having given them what they wanted. And uh, there's a lot of that I understand. I feel so similarly. There's a lot we've been through in just this recording. Several scenes we would have wanted instead of not having. But I don't. Uh, one mm -hmm. thing I think people make the mistake of is it'll overshadow almost all of the good shit that does exist in here. You have to there's remember a, which it. There's a lot of. I, if I want to be as charitable as I can, I guess for a time maybe you could say he has a fairly low range, but that would be more of like a directoral thing, I, I guess. Like also, he doesn't express a particularly wide or complicated array of emotions. I mean, the, I the, the argument, of course, would does. be that that's deliberate, right? That he portrays yes. it's like a part of the character he wants to be seen as a particular way, which is why it makes it powerful whenever he goes outside of it, which he does. Yeah, it's a he really strong well. performance in that regard. The man got his dick out for this role. He okay. did. Goddamn respect. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, we cut over to Harren Hall. We get a real neat scene of Caraxes being woken up by his buddies. Oh, Harren Hall! Yeah! You see Cyrax roaring in, and you just get a sense that Caraxes is like, Yay! <laughs> it's been ages. He's like, Yay! <laughs> What's going on, guys? You have no idea Aaron how Hall. weird this Luigi's Mansion shit has been. I've been having some <laughs> crazy dreams, man. I've been getting a lot of pork, <laughs> I got no one to talk to awesome. about them. Well, that's what They've people wondered. so many pigs. Was if, uh, if Caraxes had <laughs> dreams, too. So he's, like, he's wandering through Luigi's Mansion as a dragon, like, and dealing with hallucinations and shit. And they're about, like, sheep and pigs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, Why did you murder like me that. and my family? Sounds like a funny <laughs> show film, like, Pixar would make. Yeah. I didn't kill you, but you would have. We're so, not kosher. Uh, <laughs> I really like the scale they get from these shots as well. Harren Hall is fucking enormous. It's cool to see the castle, how it would work as a, an incredibly difficult siege. Uh, Shad did comment on that. He was like, that shit would be so hard to take. It's so huge and so well defended. <laughs> um, but of course, that's when considering a universe that does not have dragons. Um, and yeah, you see the, the encampments for all the armies. It's uh, Damon has done a lot while he's been here. Dragons are so unfair in a medieval-ish setting because they make the absolute hardest and longest part of the war just pretty trivial. Yeah, yeah they it's just break a siege boom. instantly. It is interesting, isn't it? Like, dragons are super overpowered in medieval settings, but a dragon wouldn't really do you that much good in a modern military oh, setting. Oh, one missile well, Like, a it. dragon's <laughs> not going to do well against a jet. <laughs> like, it's not going to win that fight. I, I think the jet, that's, the jet's that's gonna the kill it from one spring. 
our, our equivalent to a dragon would be something like a Harrier jet that like shoots. Well, the thing is, is that well, it wouldn't be right because you know jets like not really. It'd be like That's an attack a way helicopter. Faster. Yeah, an attack helicopter, some some air to ground weapon system. Oh, but also, just but even I, I think comparatively like, yeah, though. Exactly, like, but There's you gotta remember, like our weapons are a lot better than the weapons that everyone else has in the. the well, no, that's what, that's game. why the, the comparing them to nuclear weapons is is the better one in in terms of like yeah, probably. in in the world of Westeros, there were really not many counters to a to a dragon other than another dragon. Yeah, and yeah, they, like, are those? Yeah, which is why the new also, comparison comes up for sure. Yeah, they are representative of a vastly greater level of destruction than anything else the setting can muster. Exactly. Scorpions. That's it. The scorpion turrets. Yes. So, uh, Rhaenyra is welcomed by Simon, and he says, Welcome to Harren Hall, my queen. I must admit, I had reason to fear. Come and see for yourself. Which, uh, find satisfying on his end, not satisfying on hers. She should be like, be clear, what are you talking Simon, about? Simon, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, ah, yes. Uh, now please idea. follow me without elaboration. Yeah, what be could like, that mean? What is it? is it? Like, is it something someone said? Is it someone you've seen? What, 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 like, are I you... need to understand the situation better. Worst comes to worst, are you leading me into a trap? Like, <laughs> exactly, because he's just go. like, come oh, on. Come are on, you man. in cahoots? Are you in cahoots Let's with go. Damon luring me inside? Well, with your niceness and beautiful, am I about to be poisoned? By our I will say, I do appreciate her entrance having Cyrax above, just being like, "Hey, everybody, yeah. we're all chill, aren't we? Hi. We wouldn't do anything don't mind crazy." Me. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't mind me. I'm well, that's the, up here. That's got to be the most annoying thing about the Targaryens to just about every other lord in the setting is you can't do anything to them because there's a dragon over there. Because you and can, if anything, but it's not going to have a better end. day well, if the dragon doesn't. You could do fire. something to them, but then someone related to them who also has a dragon is going to burn you, yeah. everyone you care about, and everything around you forever. A lot of leverage, <laughs> you could say. Um, you know, in retrospect, I was thinking, shouldn't Simon have announced her? Yes. Why wouldn't he? Because he is loyal to her. Do you think Maybe it's a, actually she just a, like walked in past I, him? Maybe she just was in such a hurry or rush to get in there and see what the hell well, was do going you think on with maybe Damon that she just... Part of it is the fact that he's not actually... Sh he's keeping all doors open. Because that's how I see that introduction where he says, I have oh, reason to fear. Like, what? Yeah, and he's, he's like, not hey. even saying... He, yeah, he's, he's not a saying, man. Damon is betraying you. Well, he's because saying, let's say there's something to worry about here. Something crazy happens and Rhaenyra gets told to kneel to Damon. We have a huge power struggle and she even agrees. Then Simon's not in any trouble, is he, with Damon? Because he'd be like, hey, man, you know, oh, it's great. You're king now. Woohoo. Yeah. Well done. Eh. Whereas, uh, had he said, this is the actual queen and Damon's been fucking around, and then she tells that to Damon, maybe he would get him in trouble. I can buy as a character he's trying to be careful. Um, yeah, absolutely. He's not, he's very smart. He's a, he's a smart character. He doesn't like, he he's a bit reserved in what he does. He doesn't go crazy. Mm -hmm. I, I'm uh, not entirely sure how he would get in trouble from following procedure in that way. Eh, I, like I guess a... the thing about it is it's 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 a form of of maybe undermining Damon that he's he's not sure about. Remember, we saw in the other scene he's very. I think he sees Damon as chaotic as fuck. He doesn't know how he's going to react to any given thing. So the less yeah, input he has, the better. I think from his point yeah. of view. Um, though obviously contacting Rhaenyra was still a huge deal and could get him in serious trouble, so it's um it's all very interesting to think about for the character. I quite it, we've said before he is the the most interesting and well valued secondary character for season two. We're very happy to have him. He's uh, he's interesting yes. to think about, and it's a subtle great performance. performance too. Yeah, and he wears such great clothes. He does. He's stylish too. This is what's going on. So oh, yes, uh, Damon arrives, and we're all like, oh geez, what's gonna happen? Oh boy, oh gosh, oh golly. And uh, she says, you've done done well here. And he says, yep, they're all sworn to me, and not a moment too soon. And so she steps away from him and says, and who are you sworn to? And it's a great moment of, all right, it's time. <laughs> like, uh, be clear, <laughs> stop fucking Can't around. hold the cards close to the chest anymore. And I like what he does in response, which is to move closer to her and then start speaking in High Valyrian so that there's no worry for the other men for a second. But that's not actually because he plans to betray her in any way. It's because he wants to talk about the crazy white-walking zombie army of cold that's coming from the north, which 
that thing? To be honest with you, makes you sound insane if you mention that to anybody who doesn't know more about it. But we've already had that. The last time they spoke, this is something that came up and... about how Viserys didn't tell Damon, but now Damon's like, "But I know now." Yeah, and he's taking it seriously, and she says, "You sound like my father." He says he saw it, and it cannot be withstood alone. Somehow they've got to do it. I kind of it's it's kind of funny the um. The White Walker army in Game of Thrones would be easily annihilated by several dragons. Uh, if it arrived right now, it would get swept up. It would be nothing. <laughs> as much it's as like the fucking perfect night. dragon destroying army. Huh? Oh, sorry, it, I worded that wrong. It's the perfect army for a dragon to destroy. That's just it, yeah. this massive, you know, just this massive zombies. Yeah, no, zo <laughs> they get well, hard counted by dragon zombies. <laughs> the zombies Less are pretty shit. King. It, it's just the Night King pulling out those weird broken yes. one-shot spears he has. Which you knew when they introduced apparently. them was the only way they could balance it, and I wasn't exactly yep. happy about that myself, but hey, you know, I was I was hopeful in Season 7 that we'd still have a good bit of story to go, but oh well. Um, yeah, that might be something to worry about, but let's be honest, if you had the entire White Walker army, including all of the, the generals and stuff, five dragons, yeah, you're done. By the time he even manages to kill one or two of them and zombify them, it's already too late. Um... So yeah, it's interesting to see Damon so threatened by it and so interested in preparing for them when he doesn't know. Like this isn't a problem; it's just he doesn't know that with with what they have right now, they would easily win. Um, in any case, uh, he says the realm's only hope is a leader who can unite it, and my brother chose you. I think that line is kind of perfect. It's the combination of everything he's learned in Harrenhal about mm -hmm. himself, about his impact on Rhaenyra's life, his failures with his brother. And what is coming, and how important it is. Of... Well, and how and is developing, uh, and how his view on his uh, on Viserys has changed as well. That's kind of what I was getting at with the the brother part of it, right? Like he learned a lot about what he did wrong with his brother and what he didn't appreciate about him. You get this is the realm's only hope, so we've got to do it together. That's like the relationship with him and her, the reference to this is important for the world, and then finally, my brother chose you arguably the most important part of the sentence, depending on how you feel about the character, that he is respecting Viserys' choice. Uh, it's good shit. It is very good shit. And we've done all that work to make that a very meaningful payoff. Because well, Heron Hall is fucking awesome. No rags. In the, at the end of season one, Damon kneeled. At the end of season two, he kneeled. <laughs> Nothing oh. happened. Oh. That's true. Um, I mean, I hate true. to bring it up, but there there is a surprisingly strong notion for a lot of people online that Damon gets cucked in this season. <laughs> Those people are fools. <laughs> like he's he's set up to go his own way and to become a powerful like third party entity that's going to be difficult for Rhaenyra to deal with, and instead he just cucks out and she's McQueen's <laughs> with Rhaenyra. <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't get it. I, I mean, hate it. So I much work it. was done. So much work. I, I almost want to direct people to his like, first set of visions. They're all focused on the damage he did to Rhaenyra. I've seen plenty of people frustrated at the hanging of this final part of the decision on the White Walker invasion in many ways, which I'm much more sympathetic to. I don't personally appreciate that as a writing choice. I don't think there's necessarily like a particular logical problem with it. I just don't appreciate it. I would have preferred something more personal for him, if that makes sense. I don't know that I'd buy that he would have betrayed her if not for the White Walker dream. Yeah, I don't I don't I think he was already there. I that's what yeah, I Yeah, we've done enough work with think, like this Eris and you know I don't think I him. appreciate the involvement of this aspect of it and the way his lines seem to stake his decision on that. I mean, I still feel like this, the way the sentence is built is that um, the most important element was coming to terms with his relationship with his brother and respecting his decision. That feels to me like the final and most important element. He leaves it to the end. Even if he might not have fully bought into the vision, then all of the brother stuff still works out perfectly. Yeah. He's like, I've come to accept that, you know, he's, you know, he chose you for whatever might, you know, come next, you know, in this kingdom, be it fucking crazy, spooky ice zombie army or not, he did choose you, and there yeah. there is a reason for that. But, Gotta um, play his hmm. part in the story. I mean, you know, that that's it. That's the, the references. That's the selection. That's the work that was done. And if people don't like it or buy into it, then that's that, I suppose. There's not really much more to say. 
Um, I quite like them together, and I think Damon being back on to in Rhaenyra scenes might be able to save her from Masaria. So oh. you know, we, <laughs> we can, can only oh, hope. It, we can only hope. We can only hope. I'm oh, writing terrified gods, of how scenes involving Damon and Masaria in the same room would I go. Was... That would be so funny if Damon is all of a sudden there for those scenes and he's just like, uh, I'm sorry, who the fuck is this? Well, <laughs> like, well I'm worried that the favoritism, oh, is... the yeah, clear favoritism is shown. Yeah, yeah her, if that overpowers is any strong. character. Yeah, she has yeah, a black no hole of right and bad, so Damon might not be strong enough to resist that black hole. Yeah, because Damon's a character in this universe, but she's like a weird semi-meta favorite look at us pick. So yeah. she instantly <laughs> trumps any in-universe character. I hope it doesn't happen. Just like I hope that fucking bitch gets eaten by the fucking dragon. <laughs> like, oh, that'd be neat. Well, I get man. Oh, so much is riding on that. <laughs> so much. Um, they will have such brass ones <laughs> if they commit. To that shit. that should be the season three teaser before the the credits even come. Oh up my god! It, how invested I would be <laughs> if they oh, just showed the dude. only trailer was her getting munched on. And I'm like, I'm there. I already she love gets this season, regardless. Cold Cold open, she gets eaten, and then it cuts the HBO logo. There's, there's <laughs> one improvement you gotta make. It's uh, Masaria wakes up. She's in like a grassy field. She's like, "What the? Where? Where am I? What's going on?" And then the camera pans over, and Raina's like, "What are you doing here?" And then Sheep Stealer eats them both. Oh. <laughs> Man, boy, Cinema. we sure do hate women. <laughs> <laughs> Get these women out of here. Bring in more men. It's not this our is... fault. We wouldn't hate them if they behaved better. <laughs> better stories, damn it. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say before we close out this scene as well that I quite like she says, leave me again at your peril. And he says, I could not. I've tried. Oh, yeah, I, I couldn't. It's, yeah. It's all I done like in that. High Valyrian because, again, most, if not, everyone here won't understand what they're saying so they don't get to know the white walker shit and they don't get to know the interpersonal back and forth thing they're having they instead only hear the more official language and the i submit myself to you and the army you know so all of the 50 50 ing david's been doing it now pays off in a sense of i was always loyal to her and so are you woohoo let's go <laughs> it's like you don't have to worry about any of that nope yeah and you could totally we also imagine see, uh we see the the advisor kind of sneaking away in the crowd. He just kind of yeah, broom just slips out. Slithers away a bit. You, I'm curious if they'll develop something further from that. I'm not sure. The most important part of the scene, though, is uh, Simon starts clapping in the background when. Uh, Yay! He's uh, like, "Oh, no one's being brutally murdered. Isn't this wonderful?" Even though he's blurry, you can see he's got a huge smile on his face. He's so happy to see everyone. His is united. smile transcends yeah. resolution. Exactly. Concerned, but also fairly confident that they're just going to kill Broom. Probably. I, I mean, I could see Damon I, doing it at this point. You gotta yeah. be careful, innit? Yeah, unless... Before we move out, uh, this guy tried to pull some shit. Yeah, and, and yeah, the sad thing is, I, I think feel... that's a bit of a waste of a character, but whatever. I think so. I feel it's reasonable, yeah, if he gets killed, but I do wonder if they've got something else lined up for him. If maybe Rhaenyra sees it in a different way, or... I don't know. Maybe um I don't know. I wouldn't write a, I'm I'm not writing him off yet, but I feel like his day his day might be numbered. Or maybe he escapes and he swaps. Nah, I don't think he'd swap sides. I wouldn't be I don't know. We haven't gotten a lot of his character. That's the thing. Yeah, it's mostly this is why good decisions that he makes. If we if we open with him fucking getting executed, I'd be like, "Well, oh well. There, there, there's not a huge amount we're oh, getting yeah. rid of. It's just a bit of a waste, but fine." What could have been yeah. sort of. Yeah. Um so, with that, we come over to Corliss. We get the other banger scene. Corliss, Corliss. Yeah! So, uh, uh, good old uh, Alan is here to have a chat with Corliss, and Corliss is like, oh, you know, the, the weather, the uh, goals are flying low, weather might be set to change, and uh, we're going to join the blockade. You might be in peril sooner than late. I'd rather set out on good terms. He's like, well, uh, are we not on, on good terms? And he says, well, you've done everything you've asked, but you've been asked for, but you've been curt, you've been silent, and the men find you distant. You can't lead if you don't inspire, which is really fair in isolation. Probably not the kind of thing <laughs> one would recommend Corliss say to this man in particular. Um, he says he, was never, uh, he never asked to lead. He's like, yeah, well, you've been given a position a lot of people here would aspire to. And he says, okay, I'm sorry, forgive me. 
I'll endeavor to improve myself and walks off. And this is <laughs> this is such an ultimate moment of you should have let him go. <laughs> you should have let him. Clearly wanted this man was clearly disengaging from this conversation. He was like, okay, I'm gonna go elsewhere. And then uh, Corliss, I don't know, thinking like this conversation should continue. He's like, I'm, I'm just trying to help you. And uh, you get this big old atmosphere, this 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 aura of motherfucker. Why did you just say that? You've ruined everything. He says, uh, "You want to help me?" Like, uh oh, because it's it's the kind of person who um, is the strong, silent type. And the second they break from that, you get a sense of holy shit. Am I about to die? Like, is he gonna yeah, kill me? Why are your you... alarm sirens are like, like going off? You're loud. You're never loud. Why are you doing this? And then because it's so funny, Corliss is immediately like, uh, "I meant no offense. You could go." <laughs> yeah, like, you know what never mind we don't need to talk it's right. interesting too because Corliss is like he's a warrior and he's uh, strong yeah. and he's super brave and he doesn't mind confrontation but when it comes to you know dealing with his own you know kids he's like uh, 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 how do I do this I don't, oh my god uh. yeah super awkward please don't make me deal with this I can't handle this and um, so begins this angry fucking speech where he says uh you know what it was like for us to grow up fatherless, to be sneered upon as bastards, never sure of the bread to feed us? You know what hunger does to a boy, what grief does, what shame does? And Corliss says, you're dismissed. And it's like, bro, he's not even started. <laughs> you're have to... Unfortunately for you, Corliss, you're just going to have to take this one. Yes. Uh, I even like... I like I like how he had to. Th he tried to throw it away at the beginning by saying, like, you may go. And he's just like, you fucking prick. Yeah, <laughs> like, I may, but I won't. Let me tell you something. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and he, he goes over his, essentially his life story, but in a way that feels so very drawn from pain. The memories themselves aren't a description on a piece of paper, like an accounting in a Wikipedia. It feels more like they're um, individual slots of things that he very much remembers because of the fucking experience of them. And uh, that combined with the performance from the actor who... Up to this point, someone might have called him dry, boring, whatever have you. Very At this reserved, point, fully stoic, recontextualized kind of... it because uh, he's always tried to appear one way in front of his father because he wants to prove he can stand on his own, sort of thing, which is a very big part of this speech. And uh, man, he lets loose and uh, impressed everybody. Basically, this actor. Absolutely, it it will it it's it's part of the contrast. He's been he's been so you know reserved and stoic, and now when he finally goes like it's good in its own right but because it's just so different than what we expect from him and what we have seen from him it just kind of it like catches you off guard it's kind of surprises you um yeah. and really well written too he said it, it well written in a way that uh, a different kind of well written to take for example cole's scene these are all very much they have to be in line with the kind of people who are speaking these lines and he says um in relation to Lainoy, he says, that boy is dead, his sister before him, and the heir that took his place, and now you remember I live. Now you wish to suddenly scatter your crumbs of favor. I'm an honorable man, and I'll serve you because I must, but if it's all the same, I'll decline any offers of help. If I survive this war, I will continue as I began, alone. <laughs> like the best delivery wah, of wah, alone. Wah, wah. I guess this Just... character's bottled his rage for so long, whereas, like, from Kristen Cole's perspective, he is just sort of numb. Yeah, to everything. So his performance is sharply different. So is the dialogue to follow, and Corliss is fucking flattened by this. Can't do anything. He's just like, mm. what can you do? It's it's sort of yeah, man. That's right. just a bunch of roof bombs right yeah, there. Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. Ish. It's sort of incredible because Alan is uh, proverbially like mag dumping him, but it's sort of in a way that Corliss <laughs> would approve of. <laughs> Yeah, I'd say the cause <laughs> would have this to... Is the sort of self-made man kind of way that Alan wants to conduct himself is something that, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a perspective that Corliss himself, like, abides. Yeah. And, I wish my uh, awesome son didn't hate my guts. Yeah, no, I think that's genuinely a thought he's going to have, because, you know, the next time we see them, they're just sort of staring awkwardly around each other, because that's his first mate, so it's like, well... <laughs> well, it's gonna have to make this work. stuck on a boat for you for a while. Um, with you for a while. And I can't imagine... See, this is the thing, if 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 we were to expect uh, Corliss to live longer, maybe... If we were told he's gonna survive season three, uh, I would expect Yay. that so would Alan, and they would have several interactions as a result of the war, they'll fight together, they'll give each other respect, sort of thing. I could totally imagine that Potentially. Happening. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, the fact that there is another brother means that one of them is 
not expendable, but is like if one of them dies and Coralus is like, oh shit, I actually only have one person left to connect with. I look forward to the next scene, whenever it may be, because uh, speaking scenes. I do as well, Tears. absolutely. Interested to see what would happen when Adam and Alan speak again next as well. Yeah. Yeah, one might the relationship be super has, appreciative. Uh, and... Rather been redefined since last time they spoke. Um, I've been <laughs> kind of just skipping over them, but I can't resist mentioning. Got a Raider scene running around. Well, what's she That's doing? Crazy. Uh... Running around. Cool yeah, but like, Incredible. what happens? What is she, what does she do? Well, there's a really wide shot of her running. That goes okay, for a little and bit. And then, then the All camera right. closes up, but it's still pretty far away, and she's seen walking this time. She's not running this time, to be fair. How emaciated does she look? Then there's another scene of her walking. Emaciated. She's she's looking a little rough, but I wouldn't have thought. In a couple would... days, right? Well, to be honest with you, I have no fucking clue. <laughs> I guess that's technically true. It's uh, yeah, it's just. It could be years. And then she spots Decades. the dragon. So it's like, oh, 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 oh my goodness. Now, those are considered goofy scenes. And one might even reference them as a bit of a, a punch of badness. And that's why someone then might say the next scene is another punch of badness where the camera shows us Rhaenyra. And you know what? It's like, hey, Rhaenyra, you know what? You, okay, you, Rhaenyra, you're you probably a good you're... scene sometimes. Yeah, this yeah, is fine. You've yeah. had your ups and downs. Good actress, but, you know, good, good right. character for the most part. Yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah, camera starts to pan working. and reveals behind her is Missaria. Oh, oh no! <laughs> dun, dun, dun. You're like the opposite of Heron oh, Hall. Oh, God Bad. damn it. Evil Hall. The, uh, um, something that we've come to conclude about Masari and her offerings to this season, in totality, would be she makes suggestions that almost always improves her own position. She regularly lies in ways that um, Rhaenyra can never seem to fucking realize, even though they're blatant. And then she'll gas up Rhaenyra in every way, shape, and form as to every decision she makes, especially including ones that Masaria fucking told her to make. Now... We get all of that in this scene, and we progress nothing. This is actually a scene that could have been removed, and it, it would be fine. Um, we get, uh, Messaria says, What you've done is something no one else would dream of, and you've been rewarded. The gods favor you. They, uh, you know, it's, it's generally just a, an opening sentence when we already have issues with her, of just being like, oh. Because you would hope that she might have had criticism for her. Well, yeah, because like I was saying, you got a lot of the you know little guys killed. You got them killed. You know they they died horribly, and you you really botched the execution of this idea. And um, no, Rhaenyra's, you know, she's a bit doubtful. She's like, well, I doom thousands to their deaths. You know, people are gonna burn. And my father wouldn't have wanted this. And fucking Basaria says, well, he left you with no choice. Be strong. You are just. You must not let the realm fall to those who care for power more than peace. You must prevail. I think that what little characterization we have of Masaria is really damaged by her saying this. Unless she sucks. she's is it because like I said, Masaria is supposed to be like, oh, I'm for the little people, mm -hmm. you know? I want to do what's best for people. And if you if Rhaenyra is the person who's gonna facilitate the best outcome for the most people, then I'll help her and I'll support her. And now she's like, you know what? If thousands gotta burn, eh, you know, it's just you know, it's, it's it's part of the mathematics of winning the war instead of, like, being horrified at the idea and looking at Rhaenyra like a like a killer. Like, oh, you're just like the other ones. You you may not be as bad in some elements, but, like, you're still kind of the same. Yeah. And I regret being here and helping you out because you're going to go and kill a lot of people. <sighs> Offering lot of little people. any kind Do of observation that's unique or insightful or different, just something, anything, please... Do you think Masaria is, no other way? is aware that a lot of, probably not all of, uh, but a lot of the bloodshed and chaos that is about to ensue could potentially have been avoided in a non-trivial number of circumstances if Rhaenyra had renounced her claim? I don't think that's even fucking... The, the writers wouldn't even have entertained... I don't, I don't know. It feels like they haven't kept it up at all. That, the, is, um... that is a thing she absolutely could have done. And uh, I don't think... Or like, at least confronted Masaria, her about... Masaria would be the person to talk to her about that if she's so concerned with the small folk. Yeah, if you 
renounced your claim and just left. If you took all your cash money and you just left the continent and let them be in charge, the civil war would end in a large portion. There'd be obviously a lot of repercussions on those who supported you, but that would be like cleanup from a civil war, not the civil war itself in a way. Um, you could just do that compared to what's coming. Yeah, this is literally something you could just do. Um, so why are you not doing it? She doesn't. Uh, anyway, we don't get any. Yeah, we just it's just she I hate her and she's a waste of time. She <laughs> takes up room that other characters could have used and we never learned it. She's she having her after the scene of Reyna is just like, ah, it's it's like, of course. Well, and the, so the, the show is like punch. the one two punch of useless fuck. The show is saying to you, OK, so we gave you the small punch, the mid punch. Now you're ready. For, uh, <laughs> you think ready like, for, oh, yeah. okay, okay, the, uh, I'm going to get a recovery, the, like a hire and hold scene. I've made my no, payment. No, no, Should no, I get no. a good scene? No. And then it's like, no. No, it's Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong is doing his punch. You know, when he's spinning Super Smash Brothers, when he's like spinning his arm around, like, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. just uh, this... revving up, getting that energy. <laughs> Here I am this is the, the up B of scenes. Um, <laughs> yeah, we. I think it took us like half an hour to talk through this last time. <laughs> so here goes. <laughs> Let's do it again. This time, okay. once more with feeling. Uh, so I guess the way I'll do this is probably just reading portions out of it, and then we'll we'll discuss it as it progresses, as though we're watching the scene in real time. Um, this is Alison comes to visit Rhaenyra, and so before we even talk about what happens. That means that when Rainier, sorry, Alicent went to go and speak to uh, Maester uh, Orwell, she asked him to facilitate a trip to Dragonstone, which is insane if we just start there. Why would really he nuts. ever agree to do that? Why would let's he assume ever... he has the ability Zero to facilitate yes. that. Let's just, let's just say that that's a thing he can do. He's the or a while is that or <laughs> wily? What, what did I give you to the enemy? No, no. <laughs> I think I will not do that. Actually, I just Are love the idea okay? that he would have been like, <laughs> my queen. I believe there is a counter argument to this notion. <laughs> like, well, I would it, wish it, to express. There is the only reason that this could be happening will have a bad outcome. Either she's going there to sell out your side, which you should not let her do. Or she's got some bizarre plan that would just lead to her being captured anyway, which you should not exactly. facilitate. There's, there's no reason from his perspective to ever do this. Yeah. To the point I, what is... where I would expect him, if she was nuts, to say, you know what? Meet back with me here in just two hours and I'll get it all sorted for you. And she's like, woohoo. She comes in two hours and there are three <laughs> guards in there. Aemond is in there. <laughs> fucking, And they're all like, we need to talk. <laughs> and she's like, oh. Well, it's like, I'm sorry, but. You're insane. <laughs> Yeah. Like I'm protecting you from yourself. You have gone. You've gone quite mad. I guess which leads through to why the maester to oh. facilitate this of all the people. What's he going to do? I think she talks to the maester because they entertained her talking to the small council, and they were like, "Well, it ain't gonna be Laris. He's busy on his own shit, and he would never facilitate this. It's not gonna be Jasper. So who else?" Or, like, or while was the only person who said she would, you know, she would probably be good. Taking yeah, he was sympathetic to her, play. so I think the writers were like, good enough, we'll do him. That's enough, right? Orwell will concoct Ooh. a potion of teleportation. <laughs> yeah. Would it be That's more it. believable if she just snuck out? He's fine, he's probably, he's probably, he would probably be happy to give her teleportation potion instead of more abortion tea. He's like, oh, <laughs> finally, I can make something else. Thank goodness. I get to make something fun. What do you mean? Right. The abortion tea is teleportation tea. It teleports the baby into a fucking blended oh. dimension. I just oh imagine someone. Oh my goodness! Just... Oh, the blender dimension. <laughs> someone, like some aide, walks into his office or wherever the wherever the maester works and says, "You need more? Yeah, moon tea. Yeah, I figured, <laughs> of course." <laughs> I just when she suggests it to him, I picture him. Wanting to hit his head on his table over and over and over again and feel like, what the fuck is wrong with this stupid family? Like, you're all insane. You make the worst choices constantly, and I have to pick up the pieces every time. <laughs> like, what do you imagine is yeah. going to happen, Alicent? And she'll be like, that's none of your concern. You'll be like, no, it actually is, because I'm the one that's going to be making this happen. <laughs> He you says, I'll see what clear. I can do, walks off screen, and you just hear screaming for the next ten <laughs> seconds. Yeah. 
He just goes into his room, picks up a pillow, and screams into it for like half an hour. He's like, ah. Oh, it would be funny if he had direct tried communication. Tried to be normal, damn it. He had direct communication with the maester from Dragonstone, and they would just, you know, message each other about how insane both the sides are. He's like, can you believe this? He's like, Allison wants to come and meet. And he's like, no. He puts a shocked like, emoji. Whose boss is worse? <laughs> like, it's a contest. Yeah. Who is the worst boss? So if you haven't picked it up already, gentle viewers, we think this is hyper-retarded and we haven't even gotten into the first line of dialogue between these two. Um, mm -hmm. Not a good start. Consequently, Alicent would have been captured through the many different checks available and likely brought to Rhaenyra still. So the consequently would mean similar things. The consequences I'm more interested in on is the green side of things that Orwell would have told on her and she wouldn't have been able to escape King's Landing without people noticing at least somewhat. Uh, I don't yeah, know how... Not allowed this scene. Yeah, this scene can't happen. They did it again. It couldn't happen in the fucking first time. It certainly couldn't happen again, but here we are. So, last time we felt that the conversation at least was pretty strong, character-wise. So despite the damage it did to world building and plot, and some character stuff. You know, at least we got a conversation out that was pretty decent. How does everyone feel about the conversation that got out about it this time? Ooh. Hmm. Hmm. Generally, um, the first time, sometimes when, uh, you know how, like, after you watched The Last Jedi, there was this, like, element of, like, confusion, and you didn't quite know what to think, and it, and, and it just sort of, like, caught you off guard, and you didn't walk away with it with any like strong impression because for me i was kind of it's kind of the feeling i had something wasn't right there was the acting which was you know really good mm -hmm. and you know all that sort of stuff it had that you know the, the veneer of everything you know high quality that i like but there was just something something about it that i knew something wasn't quite someone quite right um and it, it just struck me as odd even though i i, I wasn't quite tracking with it um like my my brain wasn't working you know in that in that weird kind of way like <laughs> you're just sort of like you, you get this like weird malaise of confusion after a, a scene occurs uh, her name is Maylise. Um, <laughs> what <laughs> hey, <Lays. laughs> oh malaise oh instead of Maylise, the <laughs> Because I said uh, yeah, M A L A I S E. Yeah, that's, that's true. Very true. Fortunately, just a big problem with this scene is that on a fundamental level, it shouldn't be happening. It's not only all of the logistical reasons why it shouldn't be happening. In more of a meta sense, unfortunately, the story that you've told means that this scene is an impossibility. It was already a stretch to get the first one, but at least it was worthwhile. You can't do it again. It's over. Your story won't allow you to have this scene. I was very I usually, curious the second it happened. I, usually, I was like, what the fuck is going to be offered here? I, I had no idea, but the answer's not good. I usually miss stuff like this. Like, you know, most of the time I'll look at a scene like this and be like, oh, it's all right. And then someone will point out like, no, this, this <laughs> makes no sense. I'll be like, oh, yeah. I lost patience with this pretty quick. I was watching this with my mom and I out loud. I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> She's like, what? I'm like, why is she here? Why is she making all these claims that the, everyone will lay down their arms? Like, what, did you run this by Eamon? Like, do you know you've been, like, overtaken. Like, I, I, don't, I don't understand what ground you feel you have to stand on to, to make any of these claims and arguments that you're making. Like, how, how did you get here? It feels so abrupt. Like, it just, it didn't sit right with me at all. And, uh, yeah, that Let's... was my impression of it. That was, that's beyond any of, like, the f dialogue of it. It's just like, what, why the fuck is she here? Like, it didn't make any sense to me. So it begins with Allison saying, I had to see you. And Rhaenyra says, who knows? And Allison says, her protector has laid his sword down at the gate, but that's it. And I was just saying to myself, like, fuck, imagine being that protector. You had to entertain the camping trip, you know, yesterday. And she's like, now I'd like to go to the enemy stronghold. You're like, oh. Imagine the fucking awkward-ass conversation. Like, the, the weird silence between him and the guards up front where they're just both <laughs> standing there. And he's doing that thing where he kind of, like, shifts on his toes back and forth. And maybe he yeah. taps his fingers together. Like, just wow, kind of looks war, around. Huh? Looks around awkwardly. 
had like stuff. Imagine what point he's, he's just hands. like, um, do you want to arrest me? I guess. And they're like, I don't know. I, you... I, don't, I don't know if we can yeah, actually. We, like, I know, like we can, <laughs> but I don't know if we like can can. You know. It's like yeah, fair, fair. Okay, fair. yeah, well. How's uh? How's stuff? Fine. <laughs> they all just looked out at the ground where yeah. his latest sword. They're like, Fine. nice Fine. sword. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. thanks. That's a pretty good one. Good you know, sword. it's nice, tasteful. You know, it's <sighs> Yeah. Um. <laughs> Do you hear about Rook's Rest? Yes, what... yes, that was yeah, crazy. Wow, yeah. wow, what a tragedy, really. <laughs> yeah. It's... Oh yeah, he's he's like, yeah, what a victory. Well, well, well uh, shit. Yeah, <laughs> damn, that was. A... <laughs> How about that? Wonder what they're talking about in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Enough? that's actually another issue I have with this scene is they dismiss the um, the gods, which on one hand is bad enough from the perspective that last time you two met, a knife was all that stood between killing, and that, that this is could easily be that. You have no idea. But then, secondly, there are gods as the shots uh, pass by who are clearly within earshot, so... I was like, you just got the worst of both worlds. You didn't keep anyone around to protect you, but you also, because you wanted it to be private, but then you also let people listen in on this. In what seems to be the most open part of this fucking castle, there's like nothing but yeah. echoes and halls everywhere. Like, Could you maybe <laughs> go somewhere more private? Maybe? I guess I can't use Rhaenyra's chambers because Mysaria seems to have just taken up residence there. <laughs> Mysaria was fucking listening to this whole conversation for sure. She was behind one of the mm -hmm. corners just like, hmm, hmm, hmm. So you know, everything really you said to Allison was so good, actually, is going to be her next scene. It reminds me of that Garden of Betrayal from South Park yes. when they do the console wars thing. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> let, let us go to the garden to discuss nefarious plants, and there's always somebody fucking eavesdropping. <laughs> good shit. So, she says, um, she was raised to believe there's an order to things, that there was security in following the path laid out for us. And that she resented Rhaenyra for caring so little for any of it, for knowing what she wanted. And uh, Alison says she didn't know what she wanted. She just knew what was expected of her. And she said she's lost her way, or rather her way was taken from her. And all those that she's put faith in being her husband, her father, her lover, her son. And as she's saying this, Rhaenyra cuts her off to go, Ooh, a lover. The incorruptible queen sullies herself. You mind? We're trying, yeah. to have a we're trying to have a serious <laughs> conversation I, here. I, I think a lot of people might misunderstand what the, the, the problem here is. It's it's less a... Because it, 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 I don't want to make it sound like I think, hey, stop being rude. It's like, she can be as rude as she fucking wants. It's like, no. It's more of an in-character thing. I think Rhaenyra, the mere presence of Alicent at Dragonstone is fucking mind-blowing. So then to be like, why are you here? And she starts with a brief history and then announces like the all of the people that are important in her life and one of them involves a lover to move on to gr grander points to make clear what she's being here for which you should have entertained by now is likely an attempt to end the war which just so you know should just remove any other sense of anything you're thinking about that should be all you're thinking about right you'd be like holy shit where is this going i don't believe Rhaenyra would take the time to be like <laughs> look at you lover <laughs> It felt yeah, so like, what the fuck been, are you doing? Stop. They've Allison not been Cole friends who... The they, they've not been friends who gossip about boys for a very long time at this point. Well, it feels to me like the uh, meta seeping in. They know everyone enjoys like, pointing oh, out that Allison's, Allison's a hypocrite. Yeah. That's right. And so then Rhaenyra does it, and it's like, yeah, get yeah, her! Get her, get her, get, get, that, get that burn in there. In some context, I can see that being a thing Rhaenyra would needle Alison with, but I think she can read the fucking room <laughs> to understand exactly. why. I think there's a yeah. better way to have delivered that other than during the speech of explaining why she is here, Rhaenyra it does a little like, lol, you're a silly little whore. It's like, but of course what? it has the kind of like the opposite, uh, you know, in the first scene when they were talking, Rhaenyra was not in the position of power. Now she is, and it's like, this is what she's doing with it, because she's in it. She's just taunting her and making fun of her. Like, like I said, if it were me, is... I want to know immediately what the reason she's here for. Is she delivering some horrifying news? Is she here to apologize? Is she here to try to end the war? What is it? Get on with it. We can yeah, do fucking have... pleasantries afterward. Yeah, she might have some insane bargaining chip uh, that she has uncovered, or delivering secret news. Um... And so, um, Allison yeah. is allowed... 
let's say their health bars right now, Rhaenyra has 10,000 health with armor all over it. R uh, Alicent has maybe 3 HP, and with every response Rhaenyra gives, she knocks off a HP, so Alicent's running out of uh, any attempt from the writers to defend herself. This is going to become very clear very soon. For example, uh, Alicent says, Don't judge me for what you yourself have done. Your father died, I took comfort with another, I too have desires. And Rhaenyra responds, Yes, but you alone made virtue your banner. Which is supposed to be a, Whoa, Bindi, got it, true. You're being extra hypocritical. Yeah, that, unironically, yes. That is clearly what the writers are doing with that. They're like, as much as they've both committed this sin, you're the only one that made it so. Oh um, my god, Mahler. This is this is the uh, the Norm Macdonald thing, the hypocrite, the the Bill Cosby thing. This is it. You know, you know that bit. Oh yeah, I'm the, not sure Norm how it McDonald applies man. exactly. It was like, uh, we're talking about someone um, acting as if hypocrite is the worst thing you are when she's the person who's done way, way, oh, way worse than that. But that's the thing, though, right? It's like, I think from a modern viewer's perspective. Rhaenyra sleeping with those she loves as opposed to those she's honor-bound or oath-bound to sleep with. In some ways, a lot of audience members were, like, kind of happy she was able to explore her, like, desires without damaging anything in particular. And Alison doing it, I think, in a isolated context would also be seen as, like, she gets to have some sex with some people she loves or whatever the fuck. The problem is... Uh, you know, Alison judged Rhaenyra for it, so people are like, aha, now you get to suffer the consequences of your own judgment, hypocrite, blah, blah, blah. But it feels like everyone's forgotten. Rhaenyra wasn't supposed to do it, or rather shouldn't have, because it turned out it had effects on the children that were born, which fucked up their legitimacy, which led to people dying. And uh, arguably created a huge schism that led to this war. It's something that's been almost washed from history. She, yeah, the, the no, amount she got of booted from court just... almost because she wasn't taken seriously anymore because of how much she'd fucked up her duties of creating heirs with the person that was supposed to strengthen the line between Valarian and Targaryen. And if there was at least some, you know, shall we say, plausible deniability, then th that's one thing. But uh... well, people say like it's not her fault. She couldn't get it, he couldn't get it up for it or whatever and i just i just don't care we said this earlier figure it out yeah figure it out, figure it out. come up with something so to speak or like she needs well, to mean, cheat on someone who's a bit more um uh, game know. of thrones season two there is a character who is gay who needs to have a wife in order to strengthen a bond between two families and he says it's going to be tough to have kids with you because i'm gay and this this girl he's with literally says if we need to bring in a guy we'll do it but it's happening. Specifically her brother. <laughs> yes, her brother. <laughs> like, it's to make this work. All it's, right. Listen, the thing is, it goes beyond... This is the universe. Airs are super fucking important. They strengthen everything. It's how it works. So, yeah, all I'm getting at is that she says to Alison, you're the hypocrite because you celebrated your virtue. And it's like, you, that doesn't come close to you doing active damage to the point of people dying. Who cares if I fucking valued my virtue compared to you not doing the thing that then leads to dire consequences? I don't understand the um the the yes queening happening with with I thought season one made very clear Rhaenyra's mistakes have caused immense amounts of damage. Insane damage, many deaths, incredible strife that will persist and continue to persist. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> So, Alicent continues that she clung to a virtue in defiance of Rhaenyra, uh, and she's been alone of late. She's walked outside of the walls of the city and felt a weight lifted from her. And then Rhaenyra cuts it again with, how lovely for you. Stop interrupting! Just, just let it... Just... <laughs> like I said, why is there not more investment in knowing why Alicent is here? Please, just let her finish. Um, and it just, it makes Rhaenyra kind of annoying, if anything, she's being petty. Does. Yeah, petty, that's the word. Getting she's her little talking snipes to her in. as if these meetings are petty in that sense, as if these are meetings that can just happen whenever. Yeah. Which the fucking writers seem to think is possible, but... Instead of treating this as fucking mind-blowing that it's even happening, yeah. like I said. There's no live chat here, you don't have to impress anyone with your little, your little fucking jabs. Ah, okay. see, that's a great way to put it, because there is! The writers oh know there gosh. is! It's us! It's oh, us, it was no! us the whole time. 
This is what oh, I meant, by the way, oh, about I the, um, the chat the whole time. To it be clear, me. she dismisses the gods, and it's like, hi, he's clearly listening. <laughs> like, he's look at his expression. Like, what are you guys talking about over there? <laughs> is that Dowager Queen Allison? Hmm. Hmm. That's weird. Curious. That's that's uh that's really weird. That's probably not her. That would be wild. It's probably just. This is funny though because there are some her. characters in this universe. If they saw those two talking, they would leave immediately. Like I don't want to be known as a person who saw this happen. <laughs> I didn't see this. <laughs> I'm not important. I was a bad. Nothing happened. So she says, uh, "I thought for the first time what I would choose if not for the duty I put before all else," and. From that line, Rhaenyra somehow concludes by responding, So you're going to cast your son down and rule alone. Th this was the first line in this scene. I'd already taken issue with several other things, but I was like, okay, what the fuck? Is the person who wrote this brain damaged? Why the hell would Rhaenyra say that? You're going to cast your son down and rule alone. What? Yeah, it's like, it, this feels like a total non sequitur. Why would like, that the, be? Why would, why would this be what? a thing that you said? She what has you no design on ruling in this gonna scene. Happen? And so uh, uh, Alison I... has to clarify, no, I don't wish to rule, I wish to live. And I was just like, why, why did you even need to like, say that? Mm -hmm. what? Like, what, you think your nearest plan was to sneak here and say, all right, I'm going to kill Aegon and I get to be the, the queen. <laughs> I was like, wanted to let what, you know. I wanted to let you know. What? What? Well, she just says, like, what do you think of that plan? She's like, eh, it's pretty good, I guess. It's like, okay, I'm going to go do it. Bye. <laughs> I mean, it results in a dead Aegon, I suppose, which is a plus, I guess, but Feather in my cap. Um, so Allison continues, I, I, I want to be free of all this endless plotting and striving. The crown will pursue war and victory at any cost. And I, as for me, would like to take my daughter and her child and leave it all behind. This is a disappointing statement because of the lack of people involved in who will be protected at the end of this from Allison. It seems she only cares about her daughter and her daughter's daughter, which is not good. It feels I, um... to me that the writers have forgotten several characters that Allison should be including in the I wish to protect these people. And you might almost forget about them too in a moment because we haven't seen one of them in uh, quite a while and yes. his absence has been missed immensely. And so I feel like you've got to just start making a list of the people she is selling out here. Well, yeah, we're almost to there. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, does Orwile know that he's <laughs> likely get killed? He even after all, all I did for that bitch, <laughs> God it's damn like, it! Oh, she went and did that. This so, is why I took that vow of chastity twenty-seven years. Well, you know the fucking ago. king's god is probably peeking Orwell. from by the corner, like, "Am I in the list?" But Orwile in a black cell, like just texting uh, <laughs> whoever the maester is on Dragonstone. Like, you're never gonna believe what the fuck just happened. <laughs> Well, because he said she was on the way to this base, and now this base is listening and being like, "Did you know she was going to say this? She sailed you out, bro. <laughs> she's <laughs> she's giving up everything. That that's just so I don't not even know like who her. that is. What do you mean? So who is that lady? Uh, Rhaenyra says it's too late. You said it yourself. Blood has been shed. City has been burned. Armies are marching. And you wish to wash your hands of what you yourself have set in motion. Which again, to me, just feels a knock on Rhaenyra's intelligence. Is she not listening? She didn't say wash your hands. She's saying she wants to live. Dot, dot, dot. The implication for anybody who has a brain is, oh, so what's the offer then? You want to live, what are you going to give me in exchange for securing your safety, the safety of your daughter, and the safety of your daughter's daughter? That's obviously what you want. What are you going to give me? That's like the normal brain thing to do, but instead she says, you are trying to wash your hands of this war. And to me, I'm just like, can you help her out, uh, Rhaenyra? Get engage. her back on, you know, yeah. yeah, engage with the conversation, please. Um... And so then Allison says, oh, the arrogance of blaming me as if you would not have been challenged regardless. And uh, she says, well, wasn't it you that brought forward the challenge, like the, the whole thing with what Viserys wanted? And she says, I thought that was what your father did want. And then she goes, oh, okay, fine then. Leave us behind. Go on, go. <laughs> and again, I was like, what the what? fuck? Like, are you not paying attention? Uh, I feel like, yeah, are you, you are just paying... <laughs> Like, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like she's a participant in a different alternate universe conversation. She's telling a bunch of disconnected like, insults. That's it. And she says, go wander in the wilderness. Like, motherfucker. <laughs> That's not the I am trying to talk to you. Please listen. I want to... She hasn't even gotten to the reason she's here yet. 
Still, Chat GPT, not even once. Well, maybe Chat GPT would have been better at this. Chat GPT would have been like, "Why <laughs> Chat are GPT you here? would be like, "It would be like Alicent would never do that. That's ridiculous." <laughs> so then she says, "What has this got to do with me? Did you think you could be absolved by coming here?" Which is just like again not listening. And so she rants a bit more, and then eventually says, "Why have you come here?" Of which I was like, "Thank fuck, the writers have refocused. Back to the problem. Why All are you right, here? here? We're back to where we began. Okay. All right." And so then Alicent says, Aemond will soon fly to join Cole uh, in the Riverlands. When he's gone, Helena will be queen, and she'll act with the crown's authority. If you come then to King's Landing, I'll see, that it, uh, see to it that our guards throw down their arms and open the gates. We'll shed no blood, and you will enter as conqueror. Bitch, you are crazy. What are you talking about, woman? Let Bitch, are you, are you for <laughs> real? I need pen and paper even... to go through all of the reasons why this is nonsense. The whole point you've been put on this arc in the first place is you have no power. What makes you think that you are in any position to make anything happen in King's let's, Landing? Well, let's start. Let's start at the beginning. I don't, Helena is just going to be in charge, huh? Um, when the, the Aemon's away, the Helena will be in charge, and we'll everyone's play. just going to be fine <laughs> with that. And it's not like there's shall we, wait, there's a, there's a more there's beginning to this life. beginning. The <laughs> earliest complaint you could have with this statement, which first is, Aemond will soon fly to join Cole in the Riverlands. It's like, you just gave away military, military secrets. Yeah. Yep. Military information. You gave him you, life and nothing! This is, this is House of the Dragon, not the War Thunder You forums, gave him life okay? and nothing! <laughs> you haven't got anything yet in exchange. Nope. And she's just uh, already given away movements that are super fucking important because that is just confirmation of information that it, you don't know that that's going to happen. And besides, this world is filled with subversive action, right? Like, oh, they go in there, but they're actually going there. But you just gave away, like, yep, that's what's happening. And so with that, we could do this. Like, oh my god. Well, if, if season two of this show has taught me anything, it's that Aemond would never do anything sneaky with his dragon. No, <laughs> of course. Nothing subversive. So... And yeah. also, um, this is, like, Aemond is your son? I know you're not on the best of terms right now, but are you ready to give him up in a military secret so that he can be killed by your superior number of dragons? Because <sighs> that's, a, that's a realistic result of this, is that Rhaenyra goes, oh, so I can kill Aemond with my dragons because I know where he'll be, and I can just, sw I can just swarm him with dragons and kill him. And then why would she do any favors for you? It's like, well, she got what she needed. There was no trade. You are you killed your son. You gave up your son by spilling his yeah, military this is the thing. secrets. Aemond is the problem. Aemond and Vagar. Once they're gone, the board is clear. There's nothing Team Green can do without Vagar. You'd be like, well, we've still got... It's like, no, you don't. You no, don't have you shit don't. without Vagar. Your armies it. don't mean anything... Tassarian your... doesn't mean shit. He's, he's way smaller dragon. They have like six of them. So it's just, yeah. Nothing. If anything, he'll be our dragon now. Pretty much. We will so go up. And, yeah. The real thing for Rhaenyra to consider is not how do I sneak into King's Landing and sit on the stupid fucking chair. It's where is Aemond and how do I subvert and kill him faster than anything? That's what needs to be done to end this war. Because even if you took King's Landing and everyone went, "Yay, you're here," Aemond is still out there with a giant fucking dragon. What are you doing about that? What if he just comes back pissed off and burns King's Landing in like a kamikaze attempt? He's like, yeah, you can come and kill me, but not before I burn the fuck out of your like, everything you stole from me. Or what if he says, you know what, I'm going to go to Dragonstone, burn that. I might go to uh, any of the strongholds, anyone who's I'm just going to run. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to fuck off and I'll just, you know what? I'll, I'll, may, I'll be miserable to you because I'm Aemond and I'm I'll just happy. blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get back at you for everything you took to me. I'm gonna in a rage fueled path of destruction. I'm gonna get back at you. So this is all insane, and Rhaenyra Crazy believing so. any of it would be also insane because this is such a subversive plan. Like it, it, it feels like an idiot came up with it. You, you expect me to just walk into King's Landing and everyone? Like, why wouldn't you have just told everybody to pretend and then kill me? Or why, why would yeah, they all even exactly. listen to you? There's so many variables why would at they? hand. Yeah, there's just nothing. Especially after Allison made a huge point and about also, how she has no way of doing any of this shit. It, you know, we, you know, it's already been mentioned. It's like, so I guess you've decided, you've decided that like Aemon, you know, whatever, he'll die. But like, what do you think's going to happen to the High Towers? You think you think it's just going to be chill? 
Like, just because because of all of this, I'm like, oh, well, we're on the throne, so it's all good. You think there won't be any punishment for the the uh, yeah. houses that are divided Well, Hightowers the the are at least losing a lot of their holdings. Yeah, yeah. put a, put a least, pin in there for a sec, as we'll get, as we'll well. get even more on what Allison's plan is. I was just going to end this section with saying that um, her sitting on the throne is really not the issue. And she's probably safer at Dragonstone and more comfortable as operating her HQ. Ending the war needs to happen first, and then the symbols of power can be sorted out after, right? So the primary issue is taking out Vega and Aemond. This whole stupid idea of getting her on the throne really is not what Rhaenyra should be worried about. But Alison says, <clears throat> you have the stronger hand, and once you take the throne, this senseless war must end. And then she says, what about Aegon? And so Allison says, well, he's broken beyond recognition. He lies in the dark in pain and terror. He has many faults, but he still needs his mother, or still heeds his mother, sorry. And she says, I believe I can prevail upon him to bend the knee. <clears throat> and Rhaenyra says, no, you still defend him. You still imagine you can have all you want without paying too high a price, a price I had no choice but to pay. <clears throat> Like oh should... man, it's, it's, it's like which which part do you pick? First of all, well, I was gonna say that if I if I finish summarizing and then we go through it because like we're near the end of the conversation somewhat, so what we could do with that? She says, "I want to set things right," and she says, "Okay, if I take the throne, I have to put an end to the opposition. I must have Aegon's head, and I have to do it for all to see. You know this. However, you try to evade it, you know it. Choose." And then she says, "A son for a son." I have. Have all of the characters thought... forgotten about what happened at the beginning of this season? <laughs> something to do with uh -oh. cheese, right? Uh, something mm. blood, cheese, or like that. Harris, maybe, is a name that might come oh. up. Oh, you mean that, that was... guy who did the council? In the, in the story of this world, <laughs> that was like two weeks ago. That was two weeks earlier. Not that long, no. Well, I mean, it's also worth noting that a son for a son, after talking about defeating D Aemond at some point, it's like, well, are you going to let Aemond live then if you must this take Aegon's head? You are right. This like, is that's... all fucked. This whole Math conversation, the writers have screwed up like seven different ways. I don't know how this happened. Um, and, and to be honest with you, being efficient with how we should approach this is actually pretty difficult because it's all a big tangle, <clears throat> tangled mess. Well, yeah, because on top of that, you add on, it's like, why would Rhaenyra have to explain to Alicent that the way to end the, the battle over the succession of the crown, he can't, Aegon can't live. Like, that's, that's, so that's as... never going to be allowed to happen. So long as Aegon is alive, his faction believes that he is the rightful heir to the Iron Throne. Exactly. Exactly. If we're all students that... of history for how this is an important thing to do, and that's the argument Rhaenyra is running with, it can't stop with him. You're going to have to wipe out anyone relates to that bloodline and inheritance. It's like it, it's super important to get rid it of. Is... Like Daeron has is... to go. You can reach a compromise eventually. Like, for example, the actual English Civil War that the uh that the dance of the dragons is loosely based off of the anarchy did end with an agreement uh the treaty of wallingford i think which is uh king stephan agreed that when he dies his opponent king henry the second would like become king but he's gonna keep being king for as until that happens so it is possible to reach an agreement it took an incredibly ruinous civil war that broke down like pretty much all forms of central control and descended England into what has been called anarchy. So, you know, it well, doesn't happen easily. The point I really want to make with it is that I think Rhaenyra is full of shit. I think she doesn't That's... actually believe that she wants to do this in a sense of getting rid of any sense of succession. She's more so just looking to get revenge, which she makes clear with a son for a son, which is completely undermined by the fact that a son, a very innocent son, has been killed already. Uh, that happened under Rhaenyra's watch, and Damon will not be punished for it. It feels nope. like the writers out outright forgot, because there's no recognition of Jaehaerys' death in this scene. Grandsons don't Wait. count. The, it, his name isn't even brought up. Nope. Allison, it's like, Allison is completely forgotten. It's insane. And then, as Mark mentioned, um, we've already accepted, it seems, in this scene that Aemon's dead no matter what. So when you say a son for a son, you've got one, one is on the way, and you want an extra one. And and plus, what's going to happen to the high towers? What's going to happen to Otto? And Daron. What's going to happen to, yeah, what's going to happen to a, even other, you know, beyond the high towers, right? Like, the, the Lannisters are probably going to get screwed big time. Yep. 
uh, because of this. Oh, I like, guess the part I didn't include about this summary was Alicent agrees. Assassination. <laughs> it's by, over. It's gone. One of the most <laughs> interesting characters in the show, but poof, just gone. Also outright on my list of favorites. Yeah, she's she's gone. That, that <laughs> climbing up the ladder, you can't see it as anything other than she selected the next rung. It had butter on it. She slipped and just fell. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. It feels like someone just pushed That's... the ladder over, right? Yeah. <laughs> Into the darkness she falls, because yes, uh, if anybody's having trouble understanding this, Alison would never agree to any of this insane shit. She would obviously make the case that they're equal on the sun for a sun shit, and even if they weren't, it's a fucking horrifying thing to ask. Her son, Aegon, they have built it throughout this season, and they've built it very well, that she feels nothing but guilt for everything to do with him. She feels she's at fault for the pain that he is in and the person that he is in. She's desperately trying to repair what little is left. She just described him as being in constant, like, terror. <coughs> Fucking throat. Um, so, like, the, the, the idea being that, of course, he's not a threat and that she can possibly convince him of certain things. That's, like, her position. And then she's immediately convinced that she'll kill him. No. No, 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 way. no, 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 no. Not. Complete breach of her, her central motivations. It's over. It's done. Allison's assassinated. And Rhaenyra does not come out of this looking very good either, unfortunately. Uh, um, no, because she's fucking forced upon her the death of three, I said two of her sons and then a grandson. And she doesn't seem to recognize how horrific the request is, but also buying into Allison's offer, which is insane. It's all a mess. Yeah, yeah it's like you're simultaneously stupid and incredibly arrogant. Uh, about this, like callous, even it's, it's also just like... being petty and sniping. We could have built it such that Aegon were in agonizing pain constantly, and that she was with him throughout all of it, and he even asked her at some point to kill him, end his suffering, and that that could have played into Rhaenyra's request that Alison could decide to leverage the fact that his son wants to stop the pain with it could end the war. You know, there could be something there. But that's not the story. Uh, Aegon wants to live. He's doing better every day. He's coherent. His brain works. He can now walk somewhat. Alicent loves him. It's very much a mother's love. She feels nothing he's but guilt a... for all the damage he's experienced and causes. And you... he has a legitimate claim to the throne. You can't build it up that way and then say, nah, she's fine with him dying. It's like, no, she's not. That's not the character. Yeah, what happened to all that stuff we saw? It, what am I supposed to think now when I, if I was to rewatch this or see that again? What does that ultimately mean? And all of it for the sake of I want to live as I please, essentially. Yeah, her, Helena, and Helena's daughter, no one else. You are giving the life of your son up and you haven't even bought much at all. You could no, just, you know, could just leave whenever you, you wanted all. anyway. Oh, sorry, sons. Yeah. yeah, what you have brought reflects like kind of selfishly in that in that sense. What's important to her is getting to you know, do as she wishes. Something that on her own. created very interesting conversations was the love Caitlin Stark had and Cersei Lannister had for their respective children. Um, it was always portrayed as very much protective, motherly sort of shit. And Alicent was next in line to be getting payoffs that relate to that, but they fucking cut her off. You can create a um a more cynical, less loving mother who treats her children as nothing but, like, you know, uh, pawns on the table of chess, so to speak. Uh, and Alicent, maybe you could have built her that way, but you didn't. She loves them. She She's shown so many scenes of being hyper-emotional about her kids and protecting them. You, you, yeah, I you can't get away with this. <laughs> I, I thought it. we were cl very clearly sending her down the path of, I need to, what can I do to salvage my relationship with my, with my kids? Yeah, and save them. Know, when I failed them. Yeah, I, I just, just, I naturally assumed, and it's not my fault, because of course the signs were there, and just reading the, the ones you plopped down, and I, that led here instead, I feel bamboozled, quite frankly. Uh, run, running counter to what we were talking about earlier, about how these episodes get written, or like discussed collaboratively, um... I was listening to the behind the scenes on this and the way they talk about this scene, very like self-congratulatory, like wow, this is such a beautiful scene. And it it was suggested that it was written in isolation by one person. Like the, the, I think it was a director talking about it 
and she was like this this uh woman wrote this hmm. great scene and it was just so beautiful and i can believe it's just like Sarah has was this discussed this. Yeah, like it's like, did did this get tossed around the writing table, or did you just let someone, some one individual, just wing it, and then bring it to the director, and then he was like, yeah, let's shoot this. Like, is that? It seems like that's how. Like going by the way the scene sort of plays, it's. I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. They do speak well, yeah, about it oddly that. in the BTS. This would be, it's not quite the same. Um, it's its the equivalent of the ending of episode nine for this well, season. It gets, uh, we haven't even covered all of the worst things about it. She's leaving. Rhaenyra wouldn't let her leave yet. She would be like, yo, tell me everything you know about everything. Exactly. I want everything. You I want get every last side? piece of information. Well, yeah. Yeah. If you, if you want, when I win this war, which I inevitably will, to be on my good side, you best give me all the information I could ever use. And if any of it's fucking false, you understand what happens. Uh, we are not friends. Instead, retardation is what we get. Um, uh, Alicent says, so, like, what what happens now? Um, well, Rhaenyra says, what am I supposed to do with you? And Alicent says, well, you let me go so I can do what I promised. Which is such a fucking goofball like, line. Huh? Of all the lines you could have to end this conversation, you have... Alison agreeing to this insane proposition that's going to destroy her whole family in favor of Rhaenyra in every way, shape, and form, which requires her to leave, and then Rhaenyra says, what do I do with you? It's, it's such a, like, didn't we just... How do I answer this without sounding like an asshole? Yeah, how do I... What? Instead, of course, you could have had lines that relate to, before you leave, you're going to outline every last fucking thing you know, and you're going to write it down, you're going to give it to me. This will be proof, and this is why I'll let you go. It'll be proof that... Uh, you know, you're actually trying to help. You're not trying to uh, sabotage me. Even to the point where she could say, until we get a piece of information confirmed, we're not letting you go. I wonder if You don't get the Masaria treatment. Mm. I wonder if the scene would have been here at all if it weren't for the last two episodes getting cut off of this. Uh, unfortunately, I feel like this would probably have happened anyway. I think the writers are yeah. incorrigible in this respect. They want it, so they're going to have it. Yeah, unfortunately, You're we come right. to realize this These was their plan characters. for Allison, and it's like, oh shit, this is not what you built, guys. You got to the very end, and you didn't just trip on the finish line, you somehow impaled yourself on the finish line. And, uh, if not, you know, you might be thinking, so that's it, right? And it's like, well, uh, Allison says, I am at last myself, with no ambition greater than to walk where I please, and to breathe the open air, to die unremarked and unnoticed, and to be free. And Rhaenyra says, you speak as if from a distant dream. And Alison says, come with me. Fuck what? off. Why? What? 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 Why? What, a, I, what a stake what, to the heart you, after the other what? ten stakes. What, what the are hell? you talking about? Let's go live together in the woods. Hey, yeah, yeah like, after exactly. You just, just, discussed, you, every every character. you just discussed is contingent on Rhaenyra continuing to do what she's presently doing. Like the you're actually insane. You're nuts. Yeah. It it is like what 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 are we gonna do? Like frolic in the gods wood <laughs> like we're kids again and just forget <laughs> our roles. Well, like why did you forgot? That was this... like fifteen years ago. Well, I like, wish Rhaenyra said that Wait. you have just agreed you will kill my children and a lot of my extended family as well. Probably. And then we can frolic afterward, right? <laughs> <laughs> like what? First the murder, then the, the frolicking. What do you mean? What's the point of this plan that you've concocted if Rhaenyra's just well, going to run off Again, you? as if it's not bad enough, Rhaenyra's response is, my part is here, whether I will it or no. It was decided for me long ago. As opposed to the response being, lol, what? I can't <laughs> believe <laughs> Rhaenyra's saying... I misheard you, yeah. Yeah, it's like Rhaenyra's saying, I'd like to, but I've got some stuff I've got to sort out, so, sorry. And it's like, yeah, what I the would, fuck are you but... talking about? You would never entertain abandoning your husband, your whole family, the kingdom. What the fuck? Is like Sarah's it... wishes, like Jesus. Oh, you know, this is where you know this is where my path led me over here. What a what, what an, an actually crazy thing to say. The scene gets worse and worse the more we discuss it. Oh, it hurts to watch. Bite your thumb, such though, a shame. So that's that's yeah. nice. Like, there's it no recovering like... for Allison after this one. It's the... Uh... Yep. I guess the only, the, the only thing the they show. could do is if all of this was a lie, like she lied deliberately to subvert Rhaenyra or something, you could get it, get away with that maybe, but... Oh, I don't think that's what they're doing. 
it feels like the first draft of a scene that was written without any thought as to like how it sort of meshes in with all the other scenes and like maintains the integrity of the the episode the season the show like it was just wedged in like yeah let's just shoot that okay <laughs> like why wouldn't you be more careful with it i mean this is the end this is season it's the end of season two i mean you gotta be careful dude what a what a what a fucking shame you know, she, all of uh, that leading to this two seasons of TV for one of its most prominent characters, all that work, all that effort, which so recently, so recently had led me to believe that amazing things were amiss, that this was all going somewhere interesting. Yeah, it's a solid season. I've been really enjoying the show overall, and that was such a massive fumble right at the end. Well, that's the funny thing. I'm more, much more concerned about this scene than I was about what the main complaints from a lot of people were, which is the blue balling, which we're about to get to next. Oh, uh, yeah, well, that's another thing, yeah. Rhaenyra leaves, and we're seeing the, the dragon riders are all suiting up. We see the, uh, the army from Old Town is moving out. The Greybeards from the north are coming down, and the Lannisters are moving across. So Damon's looking at his army at Harrenhal. Got the Triarchy on the way, Corlys is on the way to the, the, the gullet, and uh, Raina picks up fucking sheep stealer, whatever. And then, the most shocking scene of all, when we saw the opening credits and it said Reese fans was going to be in the episode, you could say we were excited having him back. I was like, oh, my <laughs> beloved, my darling, he's here. Oh my god, Otto. Oh, I want you to meet <laughs> Simon and have adventures together. I just want, I want you to be here. And uh, we get one scene, and it's him in a cage. Getting woken up. He looks up for a few moments. Even, yeah. We he's don't like, even what? get any context of like who he is, what faction he's with. It's what's just going on now. Cage. We got nothing. You have to wait until season three. So yeah, I will say uh, I think he had less screen time. I, I saw someone post about it. He had less screen time than Bela this season. It's like oh, Jesus. Really? <laughs> yeah. So sad. Jesus. The the thing that should be shocking about that is. Nobody really remembers much about Baylor because she's not that interesting as a character. Otto is fucking top tier. He was in it for less than she was, and he feels like he was a strong part of the season that we were desperately wanting back at any moment. I maybe wouldn't have I written think... it that way myself. I would have tried to find I... some way to get more Oh, Otto. there would have been changes. Yeah. There would have been changes. Valuable, man. This man will be in every scene. We'll find a way. <laughs> we'll harness the power of the multiverse. Oh, and uh, of course we see Laris and Aegon uh, escaping to uh, presumably Essos. So I'm not sure exactly where they're going, but that's happening too. And the season closes out with a visual of Alicent being free with the sky, the limit to whatever she can do, and Rhaenyra not free at all. She's crisscrossed with the histories of the world closing in on her. I believe this is probably in reference to how things are going to go to shit for Team Black in Season 3, more than likely. Because they're, they're winning a little too hard, IMO. They kind of need to, yeah. When I, uh, I saw the, the montage nature of this last uh, string of scenes and shots, and, you know, the music's playing, as she, and, you know, Allison's walking in slow motion, it's just like, they're going to cut to credits. They're going to cut to credits, and we're yes. not going to get a cool... Oh, yeah. Acting yeah. thing the, the music swelled this is what the, did me off. <laughs> this is the big controversy, right? So my issue with it is actually more of how fucking tricksy those bastards were with the marketing. I like the, yeah. the promo next times. They're cool. They oftentimes uh, boost my hype, and I'm interested to see like a little bit enough to speculate on what I think is coming. All those closing shots are in that fucking promo. You liars. <laughs> oh, yeah. You did that I, on purpose. Uh, of yeah. course. Yeah. That's that's uh that's fair. I think for me, my main one is more so that I do agree with the sense that it is some it is an a season of television uh is never gonna tell a complete story in terms of the overarching. You know, there'll be threads that are left unresolved that will be followed through on in the next season, but I do think that a season of television should essentially tell something of a complete story with like a clear beginning, middle, and end, and it feels like this one doesn't have a well, Hall. Ending. Harren Hall got an ending, but uh, overall, uh, 
basically most of the plot threads are in a state of being very much unresolved. Not resolved with, hmm, question mark, just like they're, they're it, midway through. It feels like, well, the season sort of ended at a point of, well, that's it, war has arrived, when it kind of had already arrived. I thought, yeah, exactly. I thought, it's been I, here I thought for that a while. was the whole point of well, this season. The show does season way one. too much beating around the bush with that. The promise that the ending of season one makes is, ah, yeah, the war, you're gonna see the war happen, not, you're gonna see, kind of like the initial skirmishes and stuff, but like, you're not gonna, so, you know, like, you gotta wait yeah. a little bit longer if you if, wanna um, see major ramifications. If what were to go on was the, the girl that was about to happen, like a big fight there, with, with the ships heading there and whoever else is gonna be meeting up, feels to me as though... Let's say in Source, there was like five battles that happened in the course of five minutes. I'd be like, okay, well, we're making a TV show, so we're going to need to move them around. And season two is obviously going to have more things happen in it, maybe, than would happen over the course of seasons one, two, three, four, according to the Source material. Because for one, it's a better thing to do for pacing overall, but it's also just better for the budget. If you spread these things out, we can better afford to actually portray them. Um, if you crush all of the big battles that are on their way into one season, you're not going to do that. You're instead going to portray maybe one, maybe two big battles, well, and then the others will be off-screen ones, um, when they didn't have to be. I think season two lacks one extra big battle, uh, and of course nine and ten we now know would have been the gullet and then aftermath, more than likely. So... What is the solution to this? How do we account for this? Like, we don't. We just end with what feels like, and, and that's, I think, what Fringy was getting at. What would the completed story have been if there was a big battle at the gullet? It's like, well, depending on who died and how certain events transpired, we probably have some comments to make about, I don't know, acquisition of power or the, um, the nature of leadership, how, how things have turned out because the war has hit such a significant amount of events, including but not limited to significant characters are probably going to die. And there would be a lot to say about what, what it would mean going forward. Um, but without it, Season 2 does unfortunately feel like Season 1B. Where it's like, this is some uh, extra bits and bobs. There's a lot of stuff in here that's still good. It just doesn't feel like a um, full season meal, for lack of a better term. Now, I would normally be okay with this if it meant Season 3 and 4 were going to be big old chunky boys that cover everything you could ever want story-wise. But with how TV shows work, I'm actually very concerned that the failing of having two episodes chopped off of season two is going to affect season three because it will shove them into that season. Uh, they can write it as well as they want, but the budget is still limited. They can only go so far. They can only portray so much. And we got Rook's Rest in this season. Very, very entertaining. Very strong shit. Yeah, but great episode. If you judged by the season as a whole for the budget, it feels like we could afford a maximum of two big battle scenes, and you probably need then to not portray any dragons, basically at all with how CG budgets seem to work. So, yes, my concerns are actually uh, alarming now compared to what they were before because I feel like this is going to have a knock-on effect. I understand I everyone's frustrations. Kind of but with all of that said, there's still plenty of good shit in Season 2 that I think is going underappreciated. Yeah. Yep. A lot of good stuff. Hopefully Absolutely. they learned the right lesson in terms of, like, the productions, not shortening things up, and, you know, you want to leave that lasting, good, positive impression. You want people really excited about it, and... There are vibes, and um, hopefully they kind of... I mean, some of them are more fair than others. Uh, Heron Hall haters are wrong! But, uh, I don't know. It is still super invested. There's a lot to be invested in. There's a lot to be excited for. Hopefully they don't uh, repeat mistakes, learn the wrong lessons, construct the show a bit better in terms of its... I guess it's pacing, but well, this season didn't feel uh, conclusive enough. Like there, I mean, you, and, yeah, but and you you can be conclusive while still being open ended for seasons to come. So there's something uh, the old older Game of Thrones seasons I thought were really good at. They had a good pattern of building up across a string of episodes to like a chungus action scene or moment, usually in the penult penultimate episode and then the last episode is sort of like an epilogue and set up for the um season to follow and you could argue maybe that this season sort of did that where the penultimate episode was the the scene where vermithor eats everybody that's like the chungus scene and then the last one is just like a setup for stuff to come in season three but that not enough happened like the 
the um, Vermithorth scene was not enough to rely on that as its sort of chungus set piece. Like, and even factoring into the fact that this had the mid mid season um, dragon fight, which was cool. But I think if you're gonna when you're building up to a finale, you still got to do something impressive and closed enough that is set that it is satisfying and has you looking forward to more. And this didn't quite do that. It's a shame. I know a lot of it comes from, I guess, writing decisions, but so much of the dithering on the side of the blacks just rings so much worse with the way the season ends as well. Because mm -hmm. it, it feels so much like everyone, well, most of our major characters, or at least at the very least on the side of the blacks, are ignoring the reality that war is now on. It is, it is no longer a preventable thing, especially post Rook's Rest, where we return to another sort of lull state somehow. Yeah. Yeah, when mm -hmm. it should be the calm between the next inevitable storm. Well, what was the response to Sharp that's Point? A, that, that's a strange thing, is that uh, I'm not sure if it was the whole army. I'm kind of unclear on this. It looks like it was, but Kristen and the boys just sort of marched home after Rook's Rest and then went back out up towards Harren Hall again. Yeah, which, that's a long way. And like I said, Sharp Point is mentioned, but nothing is seemingly done. It's just sort of like, mm -hmm. well, that's a thing that happened. Yeah, the the the, the episode opens on it. Um, Alicent mentions it, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, Laris mentions it to uh, Aegon, and then it's just sort of like, all right. Yeah, I, I think uh, Jace mentions it as well. He's like that psychopath. He he burned Sharp Point. It's like, okay. All right, then, and then acknowledged what? and moving on. The the big uh, Vermithor scene is obviously like, you know, it's big, it's technically complicated, it's like a s sort of a landmark scene, it's a wonder, it's, you know, it feels special, but it's still, it's not conclusive in like the way, you know, the wildlings come at Castle Black and you have that huge fight scene. That, oh, where watches on the wall. Is sense of revolution the wall is at the end. Fantastic. Yeah, or like the Battle of the Bastards, which, I mean, I thought it was a cool fight scene. I mean, you can argue whether that scene, that season is any good or not, but I thought that was a good fight. Oh, I get what you're and saying, if, the climactic and, nature and, of a thing. like it's Yeah, yeah. it's like two, two factions come together, and it's bloody, and then there's sort of an aftermath. And with, with the Vermithor scene, it's not... It doesn't really conclude anything. It's still building up to a big thing of like, we're at war, we're going to go to war, and then that doesn't come. Well, it's supposed, it's, a, it's it speaks to the idea of good and bad cliffhangers, right? Or like good and bad uh, times where like a story comes to an end. I mean, you know, this is just come up to the top of my mind, but like, you know, Mass Effect, Mass Effect Two, obviously conclude with there's more coming, but they resolve the main storyline that they set up for their individual game with yes, them like the all of that games. is ah yes, and now the Reapers are coming, but like yep. you just finished all with the coll the collector stuff. You've got like yeah. that sense of finality while still having a sense of what's to come. Whereas, I suppose for a different gaming example, Halo 2's ending, like everybody kind of understands. It's like, yeah, you didn't finish it. I understand. <laughs> Don't beat yourself up over it. You worked your asses off, but we all know I mean, that this was... wasn't what you <laughs> wanted as I the mean, ending. It's... Yeah, stuff with. Uh, uh... But hey, I mean, amazing game. A lot of stuff happened. It is the Empire Strikes Back to a New Hope in a way. Um, massive well, expansion I suppose, of characters. Um, and... Even that game, even though obviously there was an original plan that uh, had an ending that extended beyond the one that you got, there is even a sense of finality to, you know, we, fight, we stopped this uh, Halo ring from firing and now we've got our setup for what's going to happen in Halo 3. It would be a lot different if if Halo 2, like, this, what happened here is if Halo 2 ended with the grave mine scene. It'd be like, what? Oh, what? yeah, oh, that God. would be, like, that would be <laughs> fucking we're bizarre. We're not done yet. What are you talking about? Like, not it's not all right. <laughs> yeah. What is that thing? <laughs> no, well, I actually, I could totally imagine that the showrunners are a little like, oh, shit, because um, there's a unique experience being created in in the viewers, and it's it's collective, it feels, that that montage did not make people think, oh, boy, here comes season three. It made everyone think... Hey, hey! Could we yeah. have had this? Could we have had this this season? Where's oh, my it's, book uh... end of this season? Especially yeah. coming right off that the Allison scene, where Ugh. it's just like, what the fuck, man? I don't, <laughs> I don't feel like we've really gone anywhere. 
We've accomplished a lot for select characters, but the season as a whole didn't really say anything. Well, here's the thing. We've accomplished a lot of select characters, like, in their own heads, so to speak. Like, the map yeah. of Westeros feels a little too unchanged for a season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially, war. um... I suppose the thing is, it was probably never going to quite stack up to season one, because season one tells such an expansive story spanning years and years. Many years, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, it's, um... There is a reason why the prevailing sentiment on the season, regardless of whether it's particularly harsh or not, is, huh, the ending of this was like a teaser for season three. It was it was like a trailer, as opposed yes. to an ending that made me feel, yes, satisfaction, finality, conclusion, but there's more to come. I just yeah. hired a stripper, and all I got was being edged. <laughs> the thing is, is it's yeah, weird you need to, to goon, assess. you can't just edge. It's weird to assess what it means for the season overall because I uh, I certainly disagree with the assessment that the season is bad. There's too many good scenes for it to be a yeah, bad season. Yeah, there's too much good for it to be it bad. It's not yeah. bad. But it is a good I'd say it's good, but it's not as good as it should have been. It's left me in a position of unfortunately being kind of deflated on the show at the moment. Well, I, I mean with what Ryan said, one... if they release a real good season 3 trailer, I feel like all of us are going to be revved up again. Possible. I'm yeah. yeah like, there's I, I still enough the, here to be excited about. I've had the long running like. I guess it's grown beyond a quibble at this point. Uh, but I, I, I've shut up about it because it's not that interesting to talk about. But uh, the show at this point is very far away from any sort of authentic portrayal of a medieval society, even a faux medieval one. Uh, so that's been frustrating me a lot. Uh. Like the the way people perceive themselves and their place in the world, their cultural attitudes and beliefs and ideas for a large amount of the cast and the way people express themselves, it is really distanced from what like it could or should be. Except a... for Harrenhal. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Yeah. If if nothing else, this season as it is does provide season three an opportunity to hit the ground running like right at the start just have like fucking these yeah crazy um, action i hope scenes. it's lit a fire under him a bit yeah, yeah it's got a lot of goodwill to win back again <laughs> yes. but that it is yeah. on the table it is right there for them to grab yep. yeah though it it has it has left us with a lot to be excited for there's still a lot of good characters good scenes good things i'm looking forwards to seeing but it also has left this idea of, oh, they can fuck up royally. Hmm. Yeah. I really hope they don't do that again. Because Honest. now it's definitely on the table that they are unfortunately willing to do Fallible. that. <laughs> Honestly, the most important thing to me right now is I really would like Rhaenyra to be interesting again. I feel Honestly, like was, yeah. The season damaged her and stagnated her quite severely. She developed a cancer. It's called Masaria, and it's hurting her a lot. She needs to get some chemo. <laughs> she developed a Masaria. Her conduct has been very uh, dithering in a way that I don't know that the show wants to understand. She is being morally like raised up and whitewashed in a way that the show doesn't seem to acknowledge that she has done lots of terrible things and continues to do so. Probably should continue to do so. Yeah. She's the the show seems to be a bit case of... cowardly on that front. Yeah. And meanwhile, she doesn't have a huge amount going on, I suppose, internally, as of her like her own role in things. Well, yeah, she's, she's just reacting sort of... completely externally. I don't know what she wants anymore. What her character is, what her goals are, what her personality kind of is. She's very, for how annoying and shitty she is, she's very flat. Um. Uh. I would, the less of her we get, the better. Um, not, I mean, obviously I would like for them to do something with her, but eh, I'm not being led to have confidence in that as an option. I'm hoping that uh, the show follows through on what I think Ryan was saying that they might try and do, uh, which is that she is very much buying into the hype of the gods favoring her and whatnot, and the portents and omens. And I would like it if, if that was challenged. Yeah. And I don't yeah. think that's at all beyond the realm of possibility. Well, 
what is there anything else you guys would like to say in closing about House of the Dragon season two? Um, mm. a thought came to mind, I suppose, with Aegon leaving in the way that he does. Do you think we should have gotten something about like, what about Helena, my wife? What about my daughter? You know, what about what's going to happen to them? Can we not get them out too? You know what? How is? I think that's fair. You know, yeah, I, I think, think that's that completely I completely reasonable. I maybe feel like, they, he I didn't believes really... Aemond would never kill them. Maybe. I think it um, probably should have been a conversation. Yeah. I, I feel like it, because yeah. it would be interesting for his character as well, for him to actually show care and concern about other people. And that might even inform his decision. Like, if we leave... Like, I, I really... I know I'm not, like, close with Helena. They haven't really done much. They don't have much of a relationship, really. Uh, as far as I'm aware, um, they they seem distant to one another. The idea that he there's a part of him that does care. She is the mother of his, you know, children, kid at this point. And, you know, does the loss of one, you know, of, of his son make him think, you know, I need to take care of my other one, especially considering he can't make anymore. Um, I, I think we should have got something there. I think we kind of missed out on an opportunity for him to voice his concerns about who he is leaving behind mm -hmm. i'm i'm still a fan i think it's it's banked enough goodwill and uh I, i'm just imagining like the next season uh, like a scene where somebody confronts allison about what she did going over to um the blacks and just being like what the fuck were you thinking and she's like, I don't know. I just, I Dude, don't, imagine a lapse in judgment. You know, boat like, arrives. Can, like it's salvageable. I think. Uh, her boat arrives. She starts to like with her cloak on, moves out of the dock, and then fucking Vega just lands, and uh, Aemon's like, "What the <laughs> fuck have you done?" <laughs> yeah, I know this yeah. looks bad. <laughs> I can explain. Yeah, and with a bit of writing, is it less sort of Pat's job? I think it can be saved. Yeah, I don't know that Allison can be saved. Well, there are ways. It's just it's not stuff that they would ever do. So probably and it's going to take a while. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah I, I, I agree that I'm still a fan. I will still be, especially if it ends at season four. No matter how bad season three is, I'll probably watch to the end now, just to yeah. see how they do everything. Um, but yeah. hopefully, yeah, season three is the one we all go. Holy shit! Season three was incredible. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, well, I mean, you know, on that note, if you've watched all of these, you'll know exactly how we feel about the whole thing. Hopefully you enjoyed our breakdown. Next time on EFAP, for you listening, will be the anniversary, in which me, Rags and Fringy, will have to prepare to stay awake for about 26 hours in a row, talking about... Uh, Luckily, we've had a lot of, of practice. Yeah, yes, but, yeah that, looking yeah. forward to it. So, uh, nice. get excited. See you there for that. Um, until then, I guess I'll just say goodbye for now. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, see everybody. everybody. We'll see you later. Have a good bye -bye. day. Bye -bye. Toodaloo. See ya.